Marshall. Welcome to the terrifying world of your own imagination. I would like to offer a few observations on the vagaries of the animal called man. Take the popular saying, seeing is believing. What idiot first said that? And why idiots repeat since? Do you believe in love? Tell me the color of it. Do you believe in truth, goodness, mercy? What shapes do they come in? No, my friends. Seeing is not believing. Only believing is believing. And we'll prove it to you in the story that follows. Our mystery drama, The Ghost at the Gate, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Elspeth Eric and stars Beatrice Strait. With how much ease believe we what we wish. An English playwright named Dryden wrote that in the year 1679. Brilliant man, Mr. Dryden. But wait, listen to this. Men freely believe that which they desire. Someone else seems to have had the same idea. And he wasn't a 17th century English playwright. He was a Roman emperor named Julius Caesar, proving once again that no man in any age has a monopoly on wisdom. Now, let's get on with our story. Come in, Dorothea. Your chocolate, Mrs. Emery. Oh, good. Uh, shall I light the fire in the fireplace? Yes, please. I think it's chilly enough for... Oh, Dorothea. Ma'am? You forgot the other cup again. I did. I told you to always bring two cups. Oh, it seems so silly. I'll decide what's silly. When there's just you to drink it. I've explained that to you, Dorothea, more than once. I like to drink two cups of chocolate before retiring. And I don't like that icky sediment in the bottom of the cup. Uh, I'll try, Mrs. Emery. Um, now, if that's all... Or, or do you want me to go downstairs and fetch up another cup? Oh, no, no. Go to bed. Oh. Good night, Mrs. Emery. Good night, Dorothea. All right now, darling. Chocolate's all poured. Fire's lighted. Charles. Everything's ready. Now, come on, darling, or the chocolate will get cold. Don't want any chocolate. Oh, Charles, you love chocolate. You always love chocolate. Tastes like mud. But it's very good chocolate. You know what good chocolate Dorothea makes. Now, come on, Charles, don't make me wait. You want me? Want you? Oh, Charles, how can you ever ask such a thing? Why, I go through the whole day thinking of you. All afternoon at the community chest, I think about you. Why, darling, it's... It's torture for me listening to those other women whose husbands are... are with them in their conventional way. I want to scream at them, but I have my Charles, you silly females. Every night he comes to my bedroom and he, he's tall and handsome and brilliant and romantic and adorable and manly and... And we sit and talk together and he... All right, Alice. That's enough. <sighs> there you are. Oh, Charles. Missed me? Oh, darling, the days are so terrible. I can't think of anything but this moment when we're together. But you know that, my dear. I tell you every single night. I need to hear it, Alice. We who have more or less left this world can't come back unless we are wanted by someone who is still here. Wanted a lot. Otherwise, we can't make the trip, as it were. We can't even purchase a ticket, so to speak, unless we have a destination that is vibrant with love and need and desire. But I love you and I need you. 
I desire you. You should know that, Charles. Well, it doesn't hurt to hear it. Hmm. Here's your chocolate. Try it. I don't want it. Oh, Charles. The longer we're away from this earth, Alice, the less we rely on our senses. The senses, in a manner of speaking, start to... to fade. Mashed potatoes begin to taste like cold cream. Coffee tastes like iodine. And this chocolate tastes like mud. They tell me this is quite normal. Charles, when you say they, they tell you this and they tell you that, you mean... I mean them, of course. All those. The ones up there? It isn't up there, Alice. And it isn't down there, either. Well, where is it? It's simply there. Meaning not here. Heavens, I thought you knew that. Are there a lot of... of them? Of course there are a lot of them. It's all so vast, so endless, and so damnably peaceful. I know what it is to be lonely, Charles. This big house, I couldn't bear to move out of it after you weren't here all the time, because I couldn't leave the place where you and I had spent so many happy years together. Why don't you ask someone to move in with you? Move in? Why, I, I never thought. Such a large house. You could have separate quarters. You wouldn't be forever bumping into each other. But who would want to move in? Who would I want to move in? Oh, some old good friend. Well, like who, Charles? Oh, someone like Connie, maybe. Connie Lawrence. Connie Lawrence? Well, I've certainly known her long enough. We were roommates at school. What well, do you think she'd want to? She'll jump at the chance, would be my guess. She still lives in that tiny one-room apartment. I, I know she's saving for her retirement. And with the pay school teachers get in this town. Charles, I'll call her tomorrow. She gets home from school at three. <laughs> Come in, Dorothea. Your breakfast, Mrs. Emery. Thank you. Um, you don't want two cups in the morning, do you? Oh, no. Mm. No. Coffee doesn't leave that icky stuff the way chocolate does. Actually, I think I won't have chocolate at night anymore, Dorothea. I feel like trying something else. But two cups, just the same. Don't forget. Yes, ma'am. Do don't go just yet, Dorothy. I want to talk to you about something. Sit down, won't you? Oh, y yes, ma'am. Dorothea, oh. do you find the work too hard in this big house? No, ma'am. Well, we used to have a houseman and an upstairs maid and a cook. Oh, I have no complaints, Mrs. Emery, if you don't. Oh, I don't. This is the only job I've ever had. I've worked here for 22 years. I was so fond of both you and, and Mr. Emery right from the start, and I still am of you, and... Well, goodness knows I practically worship this house. It's so beautiful. I love taking care of it, and I love living in it. Do you still have that little room on the third floor in the back? Oh, I love that little room, Mrs. Emery. I can look out and see the garden. I was thinking, why couldn't we give you all the other rooms as well? The rooms the other servants used to have. All of them? Well, why couldn't we knock out the partition between your room and what used to be the cook's room? I'd have... I'd have two windows. And make one of the other rooms into a really big dressing room. Oh. And maybe put in some kind of a kitchen for you with a hot plate and a refrigerator. Oh. Mrs. Emery, I... Never thought I... I never imagined in my wildest dreams. No, no. <laughs> it's all settled. Oh. I'm going to stay right here in bed all morning and make plans. I don't know. How to thank you, Mrs. Emery. <laughs> Don't try. It's my pleasure. I just hope I deserve all of... <laughs> oh, before I forget, Dorothea. Oh, yes. Last night, while I was drinking your lovely chocolate, an idea came to me. You and I are, are rattling around in this big house. Oh, we certainly are. And I was wondering, well, how would it be if we invited Miss Lawrence to stay with us? Miss Constance Lawrence? Do you remember her? 
Isn't she the one who teaches school? Used to come to dinner once in a while. And after she'd help Mr. Emery with the double cross stick? <laughs> That's Connie. Oh. I thought we could open up the two big rooms on this floor in the back. In that way, she and I would have separate quarters and not be, you know, bumping into each other all the time. Of course, I, I imagine she'd expect to take care of her own room. Oh, I wouldn't mind. What's two more rooms? You wouldn't mind cooking for her? Oh, what's one more person to cook for? Nothing. Oh. Well, then, it's all settled. My goodness. The house will be kind of lively again. Almost like before. Not quite, of course, but... Well, you know what I mean. I know what you mean, Dorothea. <laughs> it will be uh, more lively. <laughs> Will you? Then I'll scratch your head for you. Oh, dear. You're just going to have to wait. I'm sorry, Goldie. Hello? Connie, this is Alice Emery. Alice, how are you? Long time no see. <laughs> well, I don't get out a great deal. Maybe we could have dinner some evening. Would you like to come here? Well, I, I thought you might like to come here. Well, if you'd rather... Heaven knows your dinners are better than mine. Connie, I want you to come here for good. I mean to live. To live? To live with you? Why not? We've known each other practically all our lives, and I've got this huge house. I've got Dorothea to look after us. You could have your own quarters overlooking the garden. We live quite independently since I'm in the front, and you're at school till three, and by the time you get home, I'll be at the community chest. We'll just meet for dinner. Maybe have a little nip together first. Oh, Connie, say you will. Oh, Alice, I don't know. I, I've i lived here for so long. That tiny little place? High time you got out of it. But I'm used to it. And then there's Goldie. You know, my canary. Bring Goldie with you. We'll find a nice sunny window. Alice, it, it's all very tempting, but... I don't know. Think about having two big rooms and vegetables out of the garden and being waited on. And, Connie, think of the money you'll say. Well, yes, but all the same... You've just got to say yes, Connie. Take the afternoon to think about it and call me back. I will, Alice. I'll call you soon. Fine. Bye. Bye, Alice. Oh, dear. It all sounds so luxurious. Two rooms and fresh vegetables. And someone to cook for me. But I can't leave this little place. I can't give up my afternoons. Why, I couldn't live without my afternoons. I, I know this place is small and dark and furniture is dingy and the bathroom is old-fashioned. But we've never minded, have we, dearest? Have we? It's a very small place, Connie. But if I move into Alice's house, I might lose you forever. You might never come to visit me again, and all my lovely afternoons would be really over. You're not to worry, Connie. You mean we can go on as we always have? Only we'll have more room. Well, if you... Say so. Trust me, Connie. Oh, I do trust you, Charlie. Haven't I always trusted you? All these years. His flesh may be weak, but the spirit of Charles, or Charlie, is very, very willing. Also, very inventive. And very persuasive. Ah, well, there's nothing like the love of a good woman. Unless it's the love of two good women. We'll come back in a bit for Act Two. You've been... This is WR New York and RKO General Station.
Now we come back to our story. We seem to have uncovered a triangle here. Connie, Alice, and Charles. Or Charlie, as Connie calls him. And the apex of the triangle is naturally, if you'll pardon my chauvinism, the man. Listen now to the second act of The Ghost at the Gate. What a lovely dinner that was, Alice. <laughs> was it, Connie? It was the wine that made everything taste so good. Whatever gave you the idea of bringing home a bottle of wine? Alice, it's the first anniversary of me moving in here. Don't you realize? I've been here a month. Well, for heaven's sake. Why, it seems like a week. Or it seems like you've always lived here. I don't know which. It has worked <laughs> out, hasn't it? Has it ever worked out? I was so afraid it wouldn't. You know what? It's meeting just for dinner that's done it. Leading separate lives except for dinner. Connie, let's have wine every night. This wine. What kind is it? I mm. can't quite make out what the label <laughs> says. Oh, it's in French. Oh, so never mind. It's got a picture of a house on it. If it's French, it's a chateau. I didn't know that. You're very clever, Alice. <laughs> Save the label, and I'll order a case of it. Must be really nice to have money. I've always found it to be nice. I guess money is about the nicest thing in the world. Money isn't. Love is. Oh, yes. First comes love. Friends come second. Then money. How about friends who have money? <laughs> oh, Connie, you're very witty tonight. So are you, Alice. <laughs> witty and profound. Seriously, though, Connie. You have been happy here, haven't you? Oh, Alice, my beautiful room, the marvelous food. Having Dorothy to make my bed and clean up, it's heavenly. <laughs> You're stuck with me. Oh, I am so glad, Connie. You can't imagine how glad. Is there any more of that wine? More than half a bottle. Oh, good. Let's... Mrs. Emery. What? Oh, Dorothea, what is it? It's after nine o'clock, Mrs. Emery. You don't say. I was wondering, should I bring your clear consomme upstairs to you? What clear consomme? Well, Mrs. Emery, we talked about it last night. Remember when you decided to give up the chocolate, and then we tried apple juice and prune juice and lemonade, and last night you said clear consomme because it has a nice aroma? Well, I did say that, didn't I? Uh-huh. What time did you say it was? Quarter past nine. <gasps> My goodness. What's the matter, Alice? It's past time. Past my bedtime. You want the consomme? Oh, to heck with the consomme. I'll take the wine. You don't mind, do you, Connie? Why, no, Alice. Oh, let me have your glass, too, all right? Sure, Alice. I've got my glass, Connie. Forgive me for eating and running. Alice, it's your house. <laughs> I simply didn't realize the time. A quarter past nine. Heaven. She'd better not drink any more of that wine. She's not used to it. Neither am I. Only tonight we were celebrating my being here a month. Mm -hmm. Why did she want two glasses, Dorothea? Oh, she always wants two. Two cups, two bowls, two glasses. One of her little ways. But tonight she took my glass. Do you suppose she wants me to join her? I wouldn't know, Miss Lawrence. Maybe. Maybe she's always expected me to join her after dinner. Only she didn't want to suggest it. When I moved in here, we agreed that we'd lead absolutely independent lives, not get in each other's way. We've been very careful about that, going to our separate rooms after dinner. <laughs> Maybe all this time she was hoping I'd stop by her room on my way to my room, and I never noticed Dorothea. That must be it. I wouldn't really know. I never guessed. Oh, how self-centered, how insensitive. I'll never forgive myself. I'm going up there right now and apologize. Can I clear the table now? Do whatever you like. She's got to forgive me. That's all there is to it. Dear, sweet, generous Alice. She'll understand. She'll know I didn't mean to hurt her feelings. Alice, <laughs> may I come in? Come on, darling. Have some wine. Alice? Connie and I had it for dinner, and we just loved it. Try it, Charles. Charles? Mm, not at all bad. Nice bouquet. Charlie! Charlie! Where did you come from?
come from, Connie? You never told me. How could you, Charlie? Charlie? Just give me a moment and I'll explain everything. But I need a moment to think. Then I'll explain. <laughs> What did you think of Charlie's explanation? I've heard it all before. How he needs lots of love to make the trip from there to here. He always needed a lot of love, even when he was just here. Well, he got a lot. Did he really spend all those afternoons with you? I mean, before he left here and went there? Five afternoons a week. Alice, do you hate me? I should. I know, but do you? I guess I do when it comes right down to it. I'll move out. I'll move back to my one room. But I don't want you to move out. Oh, we were having such a good time. Remember how we were laughing and carrying on at dinner? I haven't laughed like that in years and years. Could have been the wine. There's half a bottle left. Should we? Let's. You don't think we'll turn into a couple of alcoholics, do you? Not on half a bottle of wine. Light white wine. <laughs> well... Here's to... To what? Here's to Charles. To Charlie. I feel as if I've just buried him. Said goodbye forever. Did he really come to see you five afternoons a week, Connie? At three o'clock. You see, my school and his bank let out at the same time. It was practically inevitable. Charlie was a no-good man. He still is. Only now he's a... a uh, a no-good ghost. Oh, Alice. <laughs> There's enough wine left for a glass apiece. Fill her up. Hold out your glass. All that guff about needing to be loved and wanted or he couldn't make the trip. Remember what we were saying at dinner, Connie, about love being the most important thing? I've always believed that. And friends being the second most important thing? Especially friends like you, Alice. And like you, Connie. I feel closer to you right now than I've ever felt to anybody. My mother, my father, my canary. We've been through a lot, Connie. Just in the last half hour. And yet we're still friends. Isn't that amazing? Truly remarkable. It must mean something. Something very profound. Like what? Like, well... Like there are times in a person's life when love isn't the most important thing. Friends are. A friend is. Yes. Stupid ghost. Silly, pompous ghost. You believe in ghosts? Certainly not. Neither do I. Never have. Except Charlie, of course. Why should Charlie be an exception? He is for you too, Alice. You know he is. Tell me something. Why do you believe in him? Because. Why? I want to. That's why I believe in him, too. Is that wrong? Not wrong, but you've got to stop, and I've got to stop. We can't have him visiting you in the back of the house from 3 to 6 and then coming to see me in the front of the house from 9 to 12. Now that we know, it wouldn't be nice. Well, we couldn't be friends anymore. Oh, Alice. But if we don't believe in him, if we don't, well, don't desire him, then he'll have to go back there and stay there. He won't be able to come here anymore. He can't make the trip. Connie, can you do it? Stop wanting him? Yes. Of course I can. Why, well, I'm having a wonderful time. I don't need him. Neither do I. We'll be better off without him. We'll be free, Connie. Liberated women. Let's drink to that. Right you are. Bottoms up. Courage lies in the bottom of a glass. Courage for the shy, the lonely, the frightened, the frustrated. And for the two elderly ladies determined to forget a ghost. We'll return shortly with Act Three. Alice and Connie are bravely resolved to forget the man both had loved 
so long. But what of him? Poor, lonely, unloved ghost. Doomed to live on forever in the there. Banished forever from the here. What of him? Connie. Connie. Speak to me, Connie. That's my sweet Goldie. That's my lovely bird. Happy to see me, sweetheart? Connie. I know you're here. I'm here, Charlie, but you're not. I am so. I don't believe in you anymore. You do, too. And I don't love you or want you, so there. Connie, you are being very cruel. I expect I am. If you don't believe me, why are you talking to me? Don't try to confuse things, Charlie. Answer my question. Why are you talking to me if you don't believe in me? Goldie, tell that ghost to go away. How did it go today, Connie? Oh, he was around. I could hear him. What did he want? The usual. Be loved, be wanted. I told him no more of that. You had a conversation with him? Not much of a one. You haven't stopped believing. Have you stopped, Alice? I think so. You haven't. If you'd stopped, you wouldn't say, I think so. You'd know. Oh, Connie, how can I know? Mrs. Emery? What is it, Dorothea? Do you want Cleo Consumé in your room tonight or what? Nothing. Not anything? Not a thing. Oh, well, all right. Um, I had it all ready, but... Uh... That ought to show him, don't you think, Connie? Alice. It's Charles. It's Charles, Alice. What delicious surprise do you have for me tonight? Orange crush? Pomegranate juice? Not a blessed thing, Charles. Ah, you spoke. I didn't mean to. But you did. How beautiful to hear your voice. Oh, don't tell me that old malarkey, Charles. Malarkey? I never thought I'd hear my wife use a word like that. I'm not your wife. I'm your widow. And I'm using a lot of words I never used before. Alice, say you love me still. I can't make the trip unless you love me. I loved you for 35 years. Alice, I'm facing eternity. What's 35 years? Maybe not much there where you are. But it's a long time here. Now I'm going to turn off the light and go to sleep. I was talking to him before I could stop myself. It was the same with me. But he couldn't complete the trip because I wouldn't say I loved him. Same here. And I really don't think I do love him, Connie. I think I just got into the habit. Me too. What does he want to hang around for? I can't imagine. Must be so beautiful there where he is. Why should he want to come here? He says it's very peaceful there. Sounds heavenly. Not much like here. Alice. That's why he keeps coming back. He can't stand the peacefulness. He isn't having any fun. I bet you're right. No worries, no troubles, no arguments, no <laughs> problems. He can't stand it. That's the way he was when he was here. That's why he took up with me. Why else would he want to have a clandestine affair in the afternoon with a middle-aged school teacher when he had a wonderful wife like you? He was bored. He wanted a little excitement. He still wants it funny. I always thought people changed when they left this terrible world. I guess they don't. I hope I change. I'd hate to go on the same way for, for eternity. Being petty and jealous and suspicious. Oh, no. Well, how can it be so peaceful there if everyone's the same as they were here? Maybe. Maybe the others don't stay the same. Maybe they accept all that eternal peace and enjoy it. In the meantime, Connie... Well, we're still here. 
we have a problem that must be dealt with. Let's face it, neither of us has stopped believing in Charles completely. Alice, I don't know if I'll ever be able to stop completely. Maybe there'll always be some little corner of my mind that goes on believing that Charlie is here. It's the same with me. And as long as we both have that last little shred of belief, he will be here. Wandering around the house making bleating noises. But we won't answer it. We've got to be strong. Use firm measures. Like what? Like... Like rejecting him. Utterly. How do we do that? I have two rooms in the front of the house. Two big rooms with a big bath between. Would you consider taking one of them? Why, I... That would be... What I call rejecting him utterly, he'd never try to visit one of us if the other one was there. Could I bring Goldie? Of course you can bring Goldie. I'll get a canary, too, of the opposite sex. You'll hear some real singing then, all right. (laughs) Let's skip dessert. Let's go upstairs now and look at the room, and you can decide what furniture you want to keep and which you want to get rid of. It's all terribly exciting. Oh, Alice, I don't want to be dead for a long time. There. The desk between the windows and the chair here. We'll take out the love seat. And that'll leave room for the bed. What do you think, Connie? I think it's perfect. Now... Alice. Listen to him. He sounds miserable. I expect he is. You really dye your hair, Connie? Do it myself. Want me to? I'll show you how. I wonder why I ever let myself go gray. You'd look lovely. Sort of a pale ash blonde. Pale ash blonde. (laughs) I like the sound of that. Connie. Connie. Where are you, my darling? Poor old thing. Don't you give in. Oh, I won't. I won't. Be strong. Oh, I will. I swear. Connie. Now, you said blue for the walls. Now, what shade of blue? Aquamarine, turquoise, robin's egg? Turquoise. Good. And we'll put white crisscross curtains at the windows. With turquoise chime backs. You're right. And we'll get a turquoise and white spread for the bed. Beautiful. Uh, could I possibly have a white rug? A white shag rug. Why not? Alice. Connie? Somebody? Do you mean to sit there and tell me you didn't even take one peek at your new room? I wanted to wait till you got home from community chairs. Well, right after dinner, we'll look at it together. What if the color is wrong? The painter showed me a sample. Pure turquoise. <laughs> we'll eat fast. I can't wait to see it. Dorothy had the bed moved in. Oh, Connie. I hope we'll get along as well as we've been getting along after you move in. We will. We will. And Charlie will go back there and settle down. He'll be much better off. He'll thank us. If I know Charles, he won't. (laughs) Well, if you don't know him, I don't know who does. Unless it's you. You know, you're right there. (laughs) (laughs) Connie. I had a thought. What if I went to the community chest in the morning instead of the afternoon? That way, when you get through school, we could do things like... Like go to the movies. Oh, Alice, for fun! And you know what else? Weekends, we could take a train into the city and see a play. Or a concert. Or go to a museum. Oh, Alice! All those things I've been wanting to do, only I didn't want to do them alone. And you know what else? You mean there's more? Well, you have that two months off in the summer. We could go to Europe. Europe? I'll pay, of course. Now, don't argue. I'm your rich friend, so I'll pay. Alice, say it again. We're doing the right thing by Charlie, aren't we? Charles must stop being a ghost and settle down. And be happy. He will be happy, won't he? Charles will be happy there in whatever way they are happy there. Just as we will be happy here. 
I dare say the ways are different, but to each his own. Isn't that the expression? Oh, Alice, you do have a way of making everything sound simple. It is simple. If you stare the facts in the face and don't waver. I hope we're not being selfish. We're being realistic, that's all. Sometimes realistic and selfish look like the same thing, but they're not. Finished your coffee? Uh huh. <laughs> then guess what we're going to do? Go look at my new room. Yes, only wait a minute. Dorothea! I simply can't wait to see it. Yes, Mrs. Emery. You know that case of French wine I ordered? Did it come? The one with the picture of the chateau on the label. It came last week. Well, will you uncork a bottle and bring it upstairs to my suite? To our suite? Oh, Alice. And two glasses? Yes, Mrs. Emery. Connie, you and I are going to drink to a brand new life. Three new lives. Yours, mine, and his. Come along. Come in, Dorothea. Oh, good. The wine's arrived. Just set it down here, Dorothea. Yes, ma'am. Dorothea, Miss Lawrence and I have decided to go to Europe for two months this summer. Oh, so you'll have a good long vacation instead of your usual two weeks. Full salary, of course. You're free to go where you like, or, or you can stay here. Oh, thank you, Mrs. Emery. Uh, I don't know where I'd go exactly. Well, suit yourself. Pour the wine, Connie. Will uh, that be all for this evening? That'll be all. Uh, then I'll say good night to you both. Good night. Sleep well, Dorothea. Thank you. Two whole months. They'll be gone two whole months. What'll I do with myself? Dorothea? Where would I go? Dorothea? What would I do if I stayed here in an empty house? Dorothea, can't you hear me? I'd be all by myself. No, you wouldn't. No, you wouldn't. If there were just somebody... There he is. There he is. If you'd only listen. Somebody like... Like him. There is me, Dorothea. Oh, Dorothea, hear oh, me. But he's gone. Believe in me. Never to return. Love me. Want me. And I loved him so. Dorothea... Listen. And I still do. Oh, I love him still. Dorothea, look at me. Why, Mr. Emery. I thought you'd never notice. Have you... Have you been here long? Not too long. I'm so surprised. I thought I'd never see you again. Ever. Well, now you do. But it's like a, a miracle had been performed. A lot of good hard work is more like it. I've never forgotten you. Really? I... Well, I know it was just that one weekend when Mrs. Emery went to her 25th college reunion, but I've never forgotten. That... <laughs> That was quite some time ago. I was younger then, of course. You haven't changed, Dorothea. Not an iota. Oh? Still fresh, plump, and, and adorable. Oh, you mean that? I've never met anything so much in my life. Or since. Dorothea, could you love me? Oh, but I... I do love you, Mr. Emery. You do? I've never loved anyone else. Not since that weekend. You came up to my room on the third floor, don't you remember? That tiny little room. Yes, I do remember. Oh. <laughs> um. You're going to be around for a while? For a long while, Dorothea. 
practically indefinitely. Will you be here this summer? This summer and this fall and all next winter and next year. For as long as you want me, Dorothea. Oh. Come on. Let's go up to the third floor. Mr. Emery, could I ask you something first? Anything, Dorothea. Anything. Uh, do you mind if I call you Chuck? Of course I don't mind. <laughs> then come on, Chuck. Follow me. I'm right behind you, Dottie. Right behind you. So, Charles continues his mad pursuit of life after death. And I, for one, wish him the best of luck. And the best of luck to Connie and Alice with their new hairdos and their new pants suits. Good luck to them all. Good luck to all of us. It's what we need the most. I'll be back shortly. Our cast included Beatrice Strait, Paula Truman, Joan Loring, and John Barragray. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Mutual presents The Mysterious Traveler. This is The Mysterious Traveler, inviting you to join me on another journey into the realm of the strange and the terrifying. I hope you will enjoy the trip, that it will thrill you a little and chill you a little. So settle back, get a good grip on your nerves, and be comfortable, if you can. For in a few moments, you're going to meet a ghost, the strangest phantom that you ever heard of. But first, I want you to be my guest on a little train ride. We're running at 60 miles an hour on open track in the dead of night. Now we thunder through a sleeping village. Then beyond it, we plunge into the waiting mouth of a tunnel. We race through the tunnel and into the open again. Over a trestle and on into the night. A little world of our own, rushing forward resistlessly, a symbol of power and speed and life. Yes, trains do have a life of their own, as you'll see in the unusual ghost story that I call... The Locomotive Ghost. My story starts some years ago in a hilly region of western Pennsylvania. It's almost midnight, and two men laden down with several handbags are moving cautiously over the rough ground beneath a railroad trestle. They come to a spot beneath one end of it, and there in the darkness, they stop and turn on a flashlight. All right, we can sit down and rest now. Are you sure this is the right spot? Of course I'm sure. This is the loading spur. It branches off at a mine entrance. Main line's over there, about 100 yards away. How, uh, how long do you think we'll have to wait? Five or ten minutes. These mine trains don't run in a minute the way they do out in the main line. Suppose uh, the money isn't on the mine train. They might have changed their plans. It'll be on it. Those miners are waiting for their pay, and the treasurer's bringing it himself. Plus bonus money and cash for operating the expenses. Big haul, my friend. $200,000. $200,000? That's a lot of dough, but... But what? You getting cold feet? No, no, of course not, but... Well, they'll be killed, won't they? The crew on the train? Forget it. I thought you were turning soft on me now after I spilled the whole plan to you. No, I'd... Joe, I'm not turning soft. Joe. What is it? I thought I heard a noise then. Over there. It's just your imagination. Oh, you're right. Somebody's coming. Keep the light steady. Got my gun handy. Who could it be? It's probably just a bum. He often sleep under his trestle. All right, you step where you are. Only me, boys. Just old Boomer. 
Who? Oh, Boomer, that's all. Looking for a place to bunk. Howdy, boys. It's okay, Tom. I heard of this guy. So you're old Boomer, huh? The one they call the king of the bums? Uh, not the king, son. Just the traveling this one of them all. Fifty years I've been riding the rods, and I guess I've covered a million miles of track. Mind if I sit down here? Got a kind of ache in my bones. Sit down if you want to. Uh, thanks, son. Say, uh, you fellas ain't bums. You're dressed too good. Never mind about us. Curiosity ain't healthy. <laughs> Old Boomer never fights with anybody. Live and let live's his motto. Listen, here comes number 25. It's mighty fine train, 25. Got a 16-wheel Mikado engine, can pull 20 cars at 80 on a level track. She's uh, 50 seconds late tonight. Do you know every train on the tracks? Uh, pretty near, son, pretty near. I ain't rode them all. I rode them all, I mean, from the Lackawanna to the Santa Fe. There ain't much about trains I don't know. Say, uh, you fellas wouldn't have a little nip handy to take the chill out of an old man's bones. No, we it? ain't got a little nip handy. Oh, sure, son. No harm in asking. <laughs> yeah. There's the 25 passing Minesville now. Ain't that whistle far off in the night a sweet, mournful sound, though? Yeah, it is kind of mournful. Sounds are far off and ghostly, don't it? Well, sometimes it is a ghost you hear, not a real train at all. What are you talking about? I'm just saying that sometimes when you hear a train whistling far off and mournful in the night, it ain't a real train at all. It's a ghost train. Ghost train? It's a lot of hooey. Uh, you just think so because you're young and don't know better. But old Boomer can tell you. There's ghost trains and plenty of them. They're the ghosts of trains that died in wrecks. Anything as live as a train is bound to have a ghost live on after All you. right, can the chatter. You're hurting my ears. Ah, let him talk, Joe. It helps pass the time. All right, but if you ask me, he's spotting a lot of bush water. Go on, Boomer. What were you saying about trains having ghosts? Well, I've seen them many a time. They're running the tracks with all the lights out, gone faster than the wind. Not a sound coming from them. I've seen the Heavenly Express, too, a couple times. What's the Heavenly Express? It's a special train, son. It's on the Earth to Heaven run. Travels a million miles a minute when it gets up speed. Takes a soldier railroad men from this world to the next. It always passes by when a wreck's gonna happen. That's enough talk. I'm sick of listening to you. All right, son. You don't believe me, but I know what I know. I can... Glory be. I hear it coming. I hear it coming now. Hear what coming? The Heavenly Express. It's coming down this track. Listen. I don't hear anything. There's nothing to hear. It's passing right by overhead. Now it's slower. It's going to stop. It's never stopped before. That, that means Rex's going to be here. Joe, he knows. That's it. That's what you hear for. You're going to wreck that mine train. Hear that, old man? That's a mine train turning into this spur. You're right, we're going to wreck it. No, you can't. You mustn't. But before we do, we got to take care of you. And this is how we're going to do it. <coughs> you shot him. I guess the Heavenly Express stopped for me, too. I sure hope so. But you fellas, it'll punish you. It'll follow you, sure as I'm laying here. Who oh, follow us? What are you talking about? The judgment special. It punishes fellas that wreck trains on purpose. It runs any place has tracks. And it follows them until it gets them, one way or another. Because murdering a train is like murdering a man. You gotta pay for it. And you'll pay for it. You think I'm crazy, but you'll see. You'll see. <laughs> Yeah, that shut him up. Crazy old coot. I wish you hadn't killed him, Joe. Don't be a sap. Couldn't let him live to tell what he knew, could I? No, no, of course not. Listen, we hear the mine train coming. We just got time to get ready now. Put the suitcase with the dynamite against the trestle here. That's it. Now, come on, help me unroll a wire. Yeah, yeah, sure, Joe. Anything you say. That's it. Keep coming. All right. We gotta get plenty far away. Hear the train now? Yeah, I hear it. I can see the headlight, too. Look how bright it is. Okay, this is far enough. Take me just a second to hitch up the detonator. There it is. Now we're all ready. It's on the trestle now. Almost halfway across. What's the matter? You sound shaky. Listen, Tom, you're in this now, and it's too late to back out, you hear? Yeah, I know. It's, it's almost across. 
All right, then I'll close the detonator. Now, there she goes. Three hours later, the two men, Joe Malone and Tom Henderson, were driving eastward through the night, far from the scene of the train wreck. Between them on the seat was a large handbag, and Joe Malone at the wheel patted it lovingly. 200,000 bucks. Ha! You realize that, Tom? We got 200,000 bucks riding here between us. Yeah. Yeah, I know. What's the matter? You don't sound very happy about it. Sure I am. It's just... Just what? Well, I can't help remembering the crash when the mine train went to the ravine. The way the whistle kept screaming, just like the locomotive was something alive that was being killed. Oh, for Pete's sake, the whistle valve got stuck when the engine crashed, that's all. Sure, I know that, only... Well, I just can't help remembering it. Joe, the crew were all killed, weren't they? I suppose they were. What do you care? You're as nervous as an old woman. I should never have rung you in on this job. I'm all right, really, I am, Joe. Listen, uh, what are you going to do with your 100000 I'm heading for the big town. Going to have one swell time. Going to buy new clothes, stay at the best hotel in town, and really cut loose. Meet me in New York, I'll show you a real time. Where are you going to stay? This is Miller's boarding house. It's over on the west side. You can find it in the phone book. Mm -hmm. I'm just staying there till I can buy some real classy duds. And I'm moving to Park Avenue. Always had a yen to live on Park Avenue. Now I'm going to see what it's like. Yeah, sounds all right. Maybe, uh... Joe, look out that train! What'd you do that for? Why'd you grab the brake? You stall us right here in the middle of a railroad crossing. Oh, I had to, Joe. The train on the track there in front of us, we almost ran into it. What are you talking about? There wasn't any train on that track. But there was, running without lights and not making a sound. You're crazy. I tell you, there wasn't anything in sight, not even a hand car. But I saw it, Joe. Never heard of a train running without lights. That proves you're crazy. Well, maybe it was an empty. But if I hadn't stopped the car, we'd have smashed into the side of it. Yeah. Make your mind to suck, you one. Now we're stalling the railroad track, and the car won't... Start. I'll get out and push. Joe, look. A headlight. Real train this time. Coming around the bend. It's about 200 yards off. Joe, it's going to hit us. we got to jump. Yeah, but this door won't open. It's stuck. Come on, out this side. Come on, I got the bag. Oh, my coat's caught in the car door. I'm stuck. Help me. I can't, Joe. Jump. Jump. Help me, Tom. Help. Help me. Help. Mister? Mister, you all right? Yeah. Yeah, I'm all right. But my uh, friend, he must have been killed. Yes, he sure was. It's a wonder you get away and look at your car. Uh, There's pieces of it spread a quarter mile up the track. Whatever made you stop right there on the crossing? Car stall. Who are you? I I'm the crossing watchman. Watchman? Why weren't you on duty? Why didn't you signal there was a train coming? Because I didn't know it, mister. That was the wrecking train taking doctors down to Mineville. It was unscheduled. Oh, I see. What about the other train, the one that went past going east just before the wrecking train hit us? Other train? Yeah. Well, no other train due through here till 6 a.m. this morning. But I saw it, I tell you, traveling without lights. No train ever travels without lights. It's again the law. Say, are you drunk? No, no, I'm not. Where are you going? Listen, I got a, a report to make on this. You got to fill out a form. I get it. I'm not interested. Get away from here. I'm going to New York. Late the next afternoon, Tom Henderson reached New York. Not knowing where else to go, he hunted in the phone book for Mrs. Miller's boarding house that Joe Malone had mentioned and went there. Mrs. Miller gave him a room on the top floor. And there he carefully locked in the closet the precious handbag that held $200,000. All of it his since Joe's unfortunate death. After that, Tom went out to see New York's nightclubs. But he got back after midnight, feeling considerably more cheerful. As he was about to unlock his door, Mrs. Miller appeared in the hall. Oh, Mr. Henderson. Oh, Oh, yeah, Mrs. Miller. I was waiting for you, Mr. Henderson. Huh? It's turned so cool that I lit the gas heater in your room. Well, 
Thanks a lot. I just wanted to warn you that you... What was that? What was what, Mr. Anderson? That, that whistle just now. What was it? A boat out in the river? Oh, that was a freight train, Mr. Anderson. Freight train? Here in the heart of New York? Well, yes. They come down the west side elevated tracks to the freight yard downtown. They run past just a few yards down the street. I didn't know that. I wouldn't have come here if I had. Oh, I'm sure they won't bother you, Mr. Henderson. Really, they won't. Well, good night. Good night. Oh, bad Lex. She's sure they won't bother me. It's too late to find someplace else where I'd leave here right now. I'll close the window. I'll keep the sound out. Anyway, suppose I can hear a train or two. But I'm can hearing them do me. I'm gonna go to sleep and forget it. Yeah, forget it. I've got 200,000 bucks in my whole life ahead of me. <laughs> Should let an old coot like that boomer worry me. Joe's getting killed by a train was just an accident. Could happen to anybody. Me? I'm alive. Tomorrow, I'm going to start enjoying it plenty. Son, we're leaving in one millionth of a second, and we got to be on time. Uh, Boomer, it's you. That's right, son. You got to wake up and get aboard. We're pulling out. Well, I'm at a railroad station someplace, but everything's so misty, I can't see much. No time for talking, son. Got to get aboard. Yeah, but I'm the only passenger, except for you and me, there isn't another soul in sight. And you're wearing a conductor's uniform. They promoted me. Now, come on, get aboard. I don't want to. I don't like trains. I don't want to go any place. Can't help it. This is a special trip just for you. And you got to be aboard. Have it. Come on now, up those steps. I... That's it. Now we're off right on time to the millionth of a second. Where, where are we going? What train is this? Oh, it's completely empty except for me and you. That's right, son. It's a thousand car train pulled by 30 engines. And you and me are the only ones aboard. Yeah, but where are we going? What, what train is this, anyway? It's the judgment special, son. And we're bound from this world to the next. No. No! Yeah, or any place there's tracks to judge up right outside your window and took your board. I don't want to die. I don't want to. You haven't any choice, son. You're on the judgment special, and we're hitting a million miles a minute now. What? Look out the window. There's the earth way down below us. See it? Yeah. But I don't want to leave it. I don't want to go. Look at the stars flash by. We're gone a million miles a minute, and it'll take us all eternity to get there. Yep. Here, I'll put the wind up so you can see better. Uh. There you are, son. There's the earth we left. That tiny little dot of light way up in the sky. No, I won't go with you. I won't. Hey, I won't. what are you doing? Get down. I you can't jump out that window. We're going a million miles a minute. I will jump. I'm not going with you. Come back. Come back. Come back. Wake up. Wake up, Mr. Henderson. Wake up. Wake up. Hey. What is it? Oh, what is it? Oh, Mr. Henderson, thank heaven you're still alive. I, I thought you were dead for sure. What, what happened? Well, you closed your window. I meant to warn you that with the gas heater on, you must leave it open. Well, you almost suffocated in your sleep. I... I almost suffocated? Yes. If I hadn't heard you trying to get your breath and hurried in and opened your window, you'd have been dead now, for sure. The rest of the night, Tom Henderson spent sitting on a bench in the nearest park, shivering at the nearness of his escape. The next day, he bought himself an expensive wardrobe, then he checked into the biggest hotel on Park Avenue. There, just before he retired, he, he took his sleeping tablet. Yeah, that fixed it. No dreams for me tonight. Ah, some layout. So this is what you can enjoy when you have money. 
And I'm going to enjoy it. I've been letting my nerves get the better of me. Not anymore. I feel better already. So out goes the light. I'm going to sleep like a millionaire. Yes, just like a millionaire. And so Tom fell asleep. But unfortunately, he did dream. And he knew he was dreaming, but he couldn't wake up. It was a very curious dream indeed. He dreamed that he got up and dressed, rode down in the elevator, that he walked out into Park Avenue, and there, down the street, he found a tiny door which he entered. It led down a flight of steep iron stairs to a dark tunnel far beneath the ground. There in the tunnel, a man was waiting for him. The man turned, and he saw it was his former pal, Joe Malone. Hello, Tom. Joe. Joe, it's you. Yeah. I've been waiting for you, Tom. But... But you're dead. I saw you killed. Maybe I'm dead. Maybe I'm not. You're dead. I know it. It's just a dream. I gotta wake up. Can't wake up. Don't you understand? You're never gonna wake up. I will. I will. Oh, Tom. Now, come along with me. I'm here to guide you. Where? Where are you taking me? Down this tunnel. See how it stretches out? On and on. Now, it keeps going down and down. No. Where do you think it goes to? I don't know. I don't, I don't want to know. Come on, now, Tom. I can't wait all night. No, I won't go. I'm going to wake up. You can't, Tom. The night I was killed, you saw the judgment special. Now you can never get away from it. It's not true. This is... It's the dream. I'm safe in my own bed in the hotel. And you refuse to come with me? Yes, I do. I refuse. Listen, Tom. Listen to what? I don't hear anything. Listen. It's closer now. No. You hear that? That's the judgment special, Tom. Coming through this tunnel. Train. It's a train coming. And where are you going to go? You're in a tunnel, Tom. And no way out. It's, it's just a dream. It can't hurt me. It's coming closer, Tom. It's coming closer. No, it's only a dream. I gotta wake up. Wake up. Wake up. Wake up. Wake up. Wake up, mister. Oh. Oh. Thank heavens I'm awake. I'd say not any too soon either. But... I... Who are you? So dark and... Carrying a lantern. Who am I, mister? I'm a track walker. Track walker? What do you mean? I mean that I inspect the track here under Park Avenue. What? How did I get here? Why, mister, a minute ago I found you walking in your sleep, your eyes tight closed down this tunnel right under Park Avenue. Park Avenue? If I hadn't met you, you never would open your eyes again, because number 10 is due along here in three minutes. Then... Then it wasn't a dream. I... I really am in a railroad tunnel. Yes, I am. I'll say you are. How you got here, I don't know, unless you came down one of the inspection doors from the street. But, brother, if this walking in your sleep is something you do often, take my advice and see a doctor. But Tom didn't go to a doctor, for he knew what a doctor would say. That it was his nerves, his guilty conscience. Now Tom felt he had to get away, far away to a place where there were no trains to haunt him. At dawn, he bought a ticket on the first plane leaving for Canada. That afternoon, he found himself in a tiny town deep in the heart of Canada. There, he hired a French-Canadian guide to take him by canoe far into the woods, away from any trace of civilization. Late that night, they arrived at the cabin where the guide lived with his wife. Tom unpacked his suitcase and joined the guide and his wife on the porch. For the first time since the wrecking of the mine train, Tom felt at peace. Oh, this is something like it. It is peaceful, is it not, monsieur? Yeah. Ah, monsieur's nerves are better already. Yes, this is what I need. Uh, how far is it to the nearest railroad? Oh, it is 80 miles, monsieur. 80 miles. Old Boomer said it traveled anywhere there were tracks. 80 miles ought to be enough. Pardon? I do not understand. Oh, never mind. Uh, I've got to get some sleep now. Of course. Good night, monsieur. Good night, monsieur. What was that? Uh, what was what, monsieur? That... That whistle, then. It sounded like a train whistle. Impossible. It must have been an owl. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, sorry, I bothered you. Good night. 
Tom entered his room and went to bed, but he could not sleep. He tossed and turned and at last got up and dressed. Oh, the moon is bright. I'll take a little walk. i got to calm myself down. There's nothing to worry about now, not a thing. Out here in the wilds, I'm safe. Perfectly safe. Tom left the cabin and entered the woods. They pressed thick around him. But an open passageway through the trees attracted Tom. He started down it, the moonlight illuminating his way. He paused and made a startling discovery. Why, I'm walking on old railroad ties. And there are tracks here, all rusted and loose. But the guide said there wasn't a railroad closer than 80 miles. He lied to me. He tricked me. A train. There's a train coming. It's coming toward me. There's a headlight. I gotta run. Run. Run! Marie! Marie! Qu'est-ce que c'est que ça, Pierre? The nervous one. He's not in the cabin. He has wandered off into the woods. Oh, that is strange. We must go after him. Hurry before he does himself an injury. It's still behind me, still following me. I, I can't, I can't run anymore. I can't, I can't go any further. I gotta stop, I gotta stop. The judgment special, son. It runs any place there's tracks and it follows you till it gets you. Because murder in a train is like murdering a man. You've got to pay for it. You think I'm crazy, but you'll see. Here it comes, son. No! No! He cannot be far now, Marie. See his footprints. Ah, he was running for half a mile. He would do himself harm running so hard in his darkness. Look, Pierre. Voila. Yes, it is the nervous one. We have found him. He's lying face down. Wait, I will turn him over. Pierre, he lies so still. Has he done himself an injury? No, Marie. There is not a mark on him. Yet his face, it is twisted with fear. Pierre. Is he... is he dead? Yes, Marie, he is dead. Oh. His heart, he killed himself by running, no doubt. But what was it he ran away from? There is nothing dangerous in these woods. <laughs> This is the mysterious traveler again. Poor Tom. The tracks he found himself on led to an abandoned logging camp. They hadn't been used in 20 years, and no train could possibly have run on them. Uh, except a ghost train. But of course, none of us believes in ghosts, so we just have to accept the coroner's verdict, which was heart failure induced by overexertion. Just the same, if you ever see a train running without lights and going faster than the wind, don't be too sure it's only your imagination. And next time you hear a distant, mournful whistle in the night, you... Oh, all this talk about trains is making you nervous and you have to get off here. I'm sorry. But I'm sure we'll meet again. Shall we say next week? at the same time. You have just heard The Mysterious Traveler, a series of dramas of the strange and terrifying. 
In today's cast were Maurice Tarplin, James McCallion, Joe Julian, Bryna Rayburn, and Cameron Andrews. Original music was played by Charles Paul. Mysterious Traveler is written, produced, and directed by Bob Arthur and David Cogan. Listen next week to a tale titled... The Man the Insects Hated. Another strange and shivery tale of the mysterious traveler. The Mysterious Traveler has come to you from our New York studios. Carl Caruso speaking. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. I'm E.G. Marshall. Welcome to our world of mystery and the macabre. Sit back and lend us your fears. Have you ever seen a ghost? It is an experience of such horror as to turn your blood to ice. Oh, I know, I know, there are those who scoff, but they have never met a ghost. Our mystery drama, The Ghost Driver, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by George Lothar and stars Augusta Dabney and Mason Adams. It is sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser, and by the Kellogg Company, makers of Kellogg's Special K cereal. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Do ghosts exist? Mel Stout doesn't think so. But his wife, Liz, feels differently. If it had been up to Liz, they'd never have bought Gormley Lodge on top of Manitou Mountain in Colorado. Why? Because according to a local legend, the former owners, the Putnams, had been sent crashing to their death by a ghost driver who came at them head on. Now, in the living room of the lodge... Liz, I've had it up to here with that brother of yours. Oh, now, Mel. I mean, he promised to help finish painting his living room before the Duncans arrived tonight, and where is he? Mel. I'll tell you where he is. He is out on the slope skiing, enjoying himself as usual. Well, d- do you just be reasonable now? If we didn't have Rory, where would we get a ski instructor, I'd like to know? We certainly can't afford to hire one any more than we could afford to have this place painted. Oh, I'm sorry. It's just that I've, I've got so darn much on my mind... Liz, I, I just hope that I haven't made the mistake of my life and yours. We'll make a go of the lodge. We're off to a pretty good start. The Duncans arrive tonight, and they're booked for a full week. And the Todds and the Morgans arrive next week. Yeah, and after that? Well, darling, our newspaper ads ought to get us more customers. Just ask yourself, darling, what would you rather be doing now? Painting the living room of your own ski lodge with paying guests arriving tonight? Or slaving away at your old accounting job in Aspen? Well, at least that brought a check in every week. Oh, Mel, you've wanted to be your own boss for years. And so we bought this old mansion on top of Manitou Mountain to start our own ski lodge. The old Gormley Mansion. And we're going to keep at it until we make a success of it. (laughs) Liz, you're marvelous. Oh, there's somebody at the front door. I'll get it. Oh. Oh, Mrs. Gormley. I'm coming to pay you a visit, Miss Stout. My first formal visit. Well, that's very good of you, Mrs. Gormley. Uh, well, won't you come in? All right, Jason. You heard the lady. Wheel me in. Yes, Mother. You know my son, Jason? You've met? Yes. Yes, briefly. Mel? The Gormleys have come to pay a visit. I see you, Mrs. Gormley. Jason, I hope you don't mind if I finish this painting. Oh, go right ahead. I'd give you a hand, old as I am, but my arthritis keeps me in this wheelchair. Jason, why don't you... No, thanks. I couldn't think of asking a fine arts painter to do... Fine arts? You hear that, Jason? Mr. Stout complimented you. Call the mountain scenes you paint fine art. Well, they are. Why, I saw some of them in the ski shop in town. They're very good. 
Do you sell many? A few. Oh, just enough to cover the cost of the paint and canvas. Oh, yes, and a quart of whiskey now and then. Mother, please. Well, now, they, if they don't hear it from me, Jason, they'll hear it from others. Well, it's a drink now and then. Now and then. Tell the Stouts how you play Russian roulette with that old revolver of your father's when you're drunk. Stop it, Mother, stop well, it. Perhaps you'd like some coffee, Mrs. Gormley, or, or tea. It won't take a minute. No, 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 thank you. We won't be here that long. Now, I've come to do for you what I did for the Putnams. Them that bought my house out from under me three years ago. Out from under you? Mrs. Gormley, are you saying that, that we have done that? Forced you out of your house? Well, haven't you? Oh, it's not your fault. Jason's father left us destitute. Left me destitute, I should say. With a son too lazy to support his old mother. So I had to sell this beautiful place. Mother, the Stouts aren't interested in all this past history. Well, they'd better be if they value their lives. Value our lives? Well, Mr. Halliday didn't tell you. Of course. Tell us what? About how the Putnams met their death. Why, yes. The real estate man told us about the accident. That was no accident. No more than my husband's death was an accident. He died in the same way? His car crashed off the bridge into the gorge? Right. 800 feet down into the gorge. To the rocks 800 feet below. But no accident. Suicide. The Putnams didn't commit suicide. Not them. My husband, Jason Sr., raving drunk and suicidal. But theirs was no accident either, the Putnams. He drove them off that bridge. Who? My husband. Now, wait a minute, Mrs. Gormley. If your husband was dead... Hi. I am back. Oh, sure. Naturally, Rory. Now, the painting job is nearly done. Oh, now, don't get up tight, Mel. I, I just didn't remember it till I was out on the slopes. Hi, Mrs. Gormley. Jason. Uh, paying a little social call? It's anything but social. Mrs. Gormley, are you saying that your husband, even though he was dead, somehow killed the Putnam? Liz, come on now. All right, I'll tell you. After my husband's death, when I realized I'd been left penniless, that I'd have to sell this place, I fell into a state of depression. When the Putnams bought Gormley Lodge... Well, they were going to use it as a winter home, not turn it into a ski resort like you... When they bought it, and I had to move into the little guest house, I was so sad I thought I'd die. For days and days I sat and wept, and and then, in one night, my husband come to me. Your husband? You dreamed? It was no dream. Oh, it was my husband. His ghost. Oh, for the love. Rory, Rory. He stood at the foot of my bed. And he begged my forgiveness for leaving me a pauper and breaking my heart. And he said, Jessica, I promise you'll live in Gormley House again. And then he, he vanished. The very next night, the Putnams crashed through the bridge over Gormley Gorge. Well, accidents do happen. It was no accident. Now, the real estate man didn't tell you the whole story. Mrs. Putnam lived long enough to tell just what had happened. Well, you can ask the sheriff. The Putnams didn't go off the bridge by accident. They were driven off it. Forced to swing them off it by an oncoming car. A car driven by a skeleton. Good heavens. That's what I wanted to tell you. And now you know. Good day. Well, what kind of a put-on is this? She's trying to scare us out of here. I'm trying to save your lives. You're trying to get back into this house. That's what you're doing. Just the way you moved back after the Putnams got killed and lived here a full three years until now. Well, I have some respect, respect. for that. Respect? No way. She may be old, but she's as shrewd as they come. She frightens you off, then moves back in again and stays until some other sucker comes I along. I warn you, Just you're... let us know when your husband's ghost shows up again. It did. What? Last night. Oh, man, this is the neatest ripoff oh, I've Shut ever... up, Roy. Will you... Your husband's ghost last night? Yes. And he used the same words. Jessica, I promise you'll live in Gormley Lodge again. Oh, I beg you, listen to me. The Putnams wouldn't and went to their death. Oh, Mrs. Gormley, you're really out of sight. You, know... you 
so smart. You're so sure of yourself. You think he isn't watching and listening, my husband? Do you think he doesn't know how you insulted me? And you think he'll not repay you? Oh, yes. If people are to die this time, too, you will be the first. Now, be warned. Jason, wheel me back. Be warned. Rory, you shouldn't have talked to Mrs. Gormley like that. You didn't spring for that crazy story, did you? I don't know. I wonder. What, Liz? Mel, call the sheriff. Find out if Mrs. Gormley's telling the truth. Oh, come on, Liz. I look like a fool. Anyhow, I've got to finish this paint job. What? Liz, you're not... I must find out. Suit yourself. You always do. Sheriff Harper speaking. Oh, Sheriff. Uh, this is Elizabeth Stout calling. We're the new owners of Gormley House. Oh, oh, yes. What can I do for you, Mrs. Stout? Well, we just had a visit from Mrs. Gormley. Oh. What do you mean, oh? Oh, nothing, Mrs. Stout, only <laughs> she can be a little hard to take. I'm getting on in years. Yes, well, what I wanted to ask you, of course you remember the accident to the Putnam three years ago, crashing off the bridge over Gormley Gorge. Yes, yes, I remember. Well, according to Mrs. Gormley, Mrs. Putnam lived long enough to tell you what had caused the accident. Is that so? And what did she tell you? Well, now, Mrs. Stout, she was near death. Maybe out of her head with pain and shock. What did she tell you, Sheriff? Did she tell you that they had been forced to swerve off the bridge because of another car that came straight at them? A car with a skeleton driving it? Well, as I said, she was out of her head. Did she? Thank you. Goodbye. So? Mrs. Gormley told the truth. Oh, the putting a woman was dying. Anybody in that condition is liable to say anything. I suppose. Now, look, just, just, just get off it, Liz. We put our life savings, every cent we've got in this place, and I'm not leaving, ghost or no ghost. Well, speaking of leaving, I'd better get on down into Manitou and pick up the Duncans at the airport. Well, it's a bit early, isn't it? Or have you got some cute chick in town that you'd like to spend an hour or so with? <laughs> Mel, you put me away. Don't give me any ideas, Rory. Well, it's a bit early, isn't it? Or have you got some cute chick in town that you'd like to spend an hour or so with? <laughs> Mel, you put me away. Don't give me any ideas, Rory. <laughs> This is some road, Rory. You drive it often? In the dark, I mean? A few times, Mr. Duncan. Well, it's frightfully steep and curvy. Now, don't push the panic button, Mrs. Duncan. I'll get you to the top of Manitou Mountain safe enough. You'll be enjoying a hot toddy in front of the fireplace at Gormley Lodge before you know it. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe you better slow down a little. Ah, oh, it's okay. That was just a patch of loose shale. You much of a skier, Mr. Duncan? Oh, I do okay. My wife will need some lessons, though. I uh, take it Gormley Lodge has a pro. Oh, the best. Me. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, fine, fine. Uh, say, this road is steep and curvy. Must be pretty spectacular. Views, I mean, in the daytime. It's spectacular enough right now, what I can see in the headlights. We've got some views, all right. Here's one. It's real cool. From the bridge over Gormley Gorge. Steep? 800 feet straight down. Mm. Mm. Yeah, it's too bad there isn't a moon tonight. I'd stop on the bridge and let you have a look. What's that sound? We're crossing the bridge now. A wooden bridge over Gormley Gorge. About 500 feet across. Hey, what's the lights of a car coming fast? That damn fool is coming straight at us. Get over! <laughs> a skeleton driving that car. Hey, we're going off the bridge! <laughs> I'll be back shortly with Act Two, if you have the nerve to return. 
that is. Hello, Fox. It seems like only yesterday that I was a little girl tasting porridge. You know, this one's too hot. This one's too cold. And now I conduct taste tests on diet drinks. And there's one I must tell you about. Sugar-free Diet 7-Up. It has a fresh, natural, delicious taste. It drives my taster meter crazy. Sugar-free Diet 7-Up. <gasps> this one's just right. Hey, ma'am, what's for dinner? Hey, ma'am, what you got? How about a no-cook dinner for a change? Serve a delicious spread of sliced meats, cheeses, salads, and crisp rolls from ShopRite's appetizer counter. You'll love the freshness, the fine quality, and the pleasing variety. This week's best buys are ShopRite freshly sliced chicken roll, half pound, 69 cents. Imported Switzerland Swiss cheese, half pound, 89 cents. ShopRite liverwurst, 99 cents a pound. Fresh macaroni salad, 39 cents a pound. So relax. Pick up a ready-to-eat dinner at the ShopRite appetizer counter. She loves the family. She wants the best. She does all that she can do. She lets ShopRite do the rest. Hey, Ma, what's for dinner? ShopRite has the answer. Hello, Amco. My automatic transmission just got done. Automatic-ing. I was wondering, do you service Chevrolets? Do we service those sensational Chevrolets? Ma'am, Amco has serviced over 3 million automatic transmissions of all kinds. Ah. Nearly 900,000 Chevrolets alone. Ooh. Do we service Chevrolets? George, pitch pipe, please. Chevy Nova and Impala and the Bel Air and Camaro and the Chevy too. Yep, we know them. Every Chevrolet automatic make and model on the road today, from the oldest Biscayne to a bright, spanky Caprice. Uh, by the way, what sort of Chevy did you say you had? A Chevy Mustang. Well, no matter. Nobody knows your automatic transmission better than Amco. Double A. MCO. There are over 500 Amco centers coast to coast. Consult your yellow pages for the Amco center nearest you. Double A. MCO. Amco. This is WOR New York, an RKO General Station. Terror, unless you have experienced it, is only a word. I could employ all the art at my command, my voice, the words I choose, to convey to you the full impact of terror. Yet, I know I should fail even as Michael Duncan fails now in telling his story to Sheriff Harper on the bridge over Gormley Gorge the next morning. Terror? You say you experience terror? What would you experience, Sheriff? Delight? Mr. Duncan, I'm only trying to get at what happened here last night. Excuse me, Sheriff. Yes, Mr. Stout, what is it? <sighs> Will it be much longer before they get the, the bodies up? Hard to say. Why? I'd like to get back to the lodge. My wife is alone, and you can imagine her condition after hearing of her brother's death. Say nothing of how it happened. Sure, sure. You go ahead. I'll let you know when you're needed to identify the bodies. I'm sorry about your brother-in-law, Mr. Stout. And the publicity. Publicity? And yeah, this is the second time the ghost driver has struck. Ghost driver? And the news has got out. I hear they're sending reporters over from Aspen. That's great. That's just what I need. That'll end my ski resort business for good. Not that it ever got started. Uh, wait a few minutes and I'll ride back up with you. Nothing I can do either till they recover Jill's body. Oh, yes, there is, Mr. Duncan. You can give me a full account. Now, look, Sheriff, I've told you all I know. We were driving across this bridge when we saw this other car coming straight at us. Stout's brother-in-law was driving. He swerved to avoid the oncoming car and went through the guardrail. In the split second between swerving and going through the rail, I leapt clear and saved myself. I wish I could say the same for that boy and and Jill, my wife. About the skeleton at the wheel of the other car. Well, why do you keep harping on that? Because it's something to harp on. If you saw a skeleton driving that car... I didn't. You said... I know what I said, but... Well, I've got to be wrong. I couldn't have seen what I thought I did. Why not? Because I don't believe in skeletons driving cars. I don't believe in ghosts. Now, take it easy, Mr. Duncan. 
All I'm after is a complete report. The fact. All you're after is the publicity you're going to get out of this. Put you on the map, won't it, Sheriff? Why, you might even get a job in one of the big Colorado ski resorts like Aspen or Vail. That'll be enough, Mr. Duncan. You can go. I'll phone the lodge when I need you. Mrs. Gormley. Well, invite me in, Miss Stout. Oh, yes, of, of course. Uh, yes, I'm... Well, I'm surprised to see that you're not in a wheelchair. Oh, it depends on how bad my arthritis kicks up. Sometimes I can walk with a cane, like now. I see. Is your husband home? No. He's down at the bridge with Mr. Duncan. Oh, the fellow whose wife got killed, huh? Yes. Well, I'm sorry about that. Sorry about your brother, too. Even though he asked for Mrs. it. Mrs. Gormley, I, I, I... Your I brother's just can't talk dead about because it. he wouldn't listen. He wouldn't heed my warning. Now you listen, child. You heed my warning. Make your husband listen and take warning, too. You leave this place. Leave it today. Don't think I wouldn't. We wouldn't if we could. But we can't. Oh, our savings are tied up at Gormley oh, Lodge. listen to me, listen. Now, my dead husband came to me again last night. And he promised me again I'd return to this house. You love this old house, don't you? Well, it was my life. You're a woman. You understand how that is. Yes. I came here a bride 40 years ago. Jason, senior, that is. He was just starting his career as a painter. Jason, my son, was born here. There was another child, a little girl. She died here. No, this house isn't made of wood and stone. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Oh. Oh, I think they've come back. Yes. My husband and Mr. Duncan are back. Well, I'll go then. Oh, well, Mrs. Gormley, I'm going to put some coffee on. You stay. Have a cup. No. I can't bear to go on looking at people who I know are going to die. What's this? Die? Who, who, who's going to die now? You are, Mr. Stout. You and your wife. If you don't heed my warning and leave... As soon as possible. Now, what's all this, Stout? Who is this woman? Jessica Gormley used to own this place. Oh, the woman you told me about. The one who claims her husband's ghost visits her. I don't just claim it. It's true. Who are you? My name's Michael Duncan. Ah, oh, yes, yes. The one whose wife went to her death in the gorge last night. Well, you take my advice, too. You leave here. Leave as fast as you can. How about a drink, Stout? Oh, so you two won't listen. The ghost driver killed your wife last night, and yet you won't listen. Well, let me warn you once and for all. You... What was that? A, a shot. It was a gunshot. Jason! Oh, it's happened. He's killed him, sorry. Oh. She's fallen. Liz, help her up and keep her here. Duncan, you come with me. <laughs> Yeah, Mr. Stout, what do you want? Oh, you're okay, Jason. We heard a gunshot. What other? Well, we've heard of you and your little games, like Russian roulette, and we thought that you... That I'd shot myself? No such luck. Come in if you want to. Oh, the, uh, the gunshot we heard. I fired it. Deliberately. You fired that shot deliberately? You ask a lot of questions. For someone I haven't even met. It's Mike Duncan. He and his wife are to be my first guests. It was his wife who got killed last night. Oh. I'm sorry. How did you escape? Flung myself from the car just before it went through the guardrail. Well, you better keep an eye out for the old man's ghost. He'll be after you. Uh, Mr. Gormley, I don't believe in ghosts. Now, why did you fire that revolver? What business is it? A... All right. I'll tell you. You'll think it's nutty. I'm sure. I've been playing Russian roulette with this gun for years. Ever since my father died. And I always win. Or lose. 
depending on how you look at it? And how do you look at it, Jason? I give it to you straight, Mr. Stout. I want to lose. For years now, I picked up the gun like this. Oh, no, not every day. Maybe once a week, once every other week. Whenever the mood comes on me, and I put it to my temple, like this. Wait a minute. <laughs> Don't worry. Gun's empty. I haven't put in a fresh bullet yet. You see, the reason I deliberately fired that bullet I had in this gun was to find out if the thing was a dud. It wasn't. Too bad. May I shake your hand, Mr. Duncan? You're the first man I've ever met who says what he thinks. You want to kill yourself? Go ahead. <laughs> I like you. You do speak your mind. And now, gentlemen, if you'll excuse me, I've got to get back to this painting of mine. By the way, what do you think of it? Pretty lurid, isn't it? <laughs> That's just the right word for it, Mr. Stout. See? There's the car swerving and crashing through the bridge. The oncoming ghost car with the skeleton at the wheel. All in flaming color. I knock out one an hour. I slap a frame on it and I sell it in Manitou for 20 bucks. So excuse me, will you? Business is going to pick up. Thanks to last night. And I want to be ready to supply the demand. <laughs> It's been a rough 24 hours, Miss Stout. It's a nice chair. Just right for sitting in front of a fire. <laughs> Cost you plenty, I'll bet. Yes, plenty. But that isn't what I'm thinking about. You're thinking about your brother and my wife lying in their coffins at the undertakers in Manitou. Yes, and also that even a small village like Manitou has an undertaker. Birth, death, taxes... The only sureties in life, Mrs. Stout. Liz. Mike. I, uh, I like your husband. Me too. He told me about everything. About what getting this ski resort means to you. Your life savings invested, all that. All down the drain, I'm afraid. The publicity? What else? Every reservation's canceled. Well, all except one. But that'll come in, too. It has, Liz. Yes? There it is. Please cancel my reservation for next week, Frank Norton. As a family of four, telegram phoned in from Aspen. Anybody got a sponge? A sponge? So I can throw it in. I'm through, Mike. Do you always give up this easy? What do you mean, easy? Just that. Do you always fade when the going gets tough? Well, this is the time to start fighting. Does it make good sense to let all this go down the drain because somebody's playing a trick on you? A murderous trick? Do you think it's a trick? What else could it be? A skeleton driving a ghost car? What else but a trick? Well, what else? You were in that car last night. You saw. And it was a skeleton behind the wheel of the oncoming car. You told the sheriff that. You can still say that... That it was a trick, yes. What kind of trick? Damn it, Mike, you admit you saw a skeleton driving a car, but you can still call it a trick? Yeah, see, I see you don't answer. Now look, Mel, I'm a practical man, a businessman. You think being a businessman is simple? Oh, no. I've had troubles that would make yours look like, like nothing. Today you won't find anybody more successful than me. But I've been bankrupt twice. Yes, and paid off every cent. How? Well... Not by running away the way you want to, but by standing up and fighting. And that's what you've got to do right now. How? You tell me how and I'll do it. Look, we'll, we'll do it together. I've got a stake in this too, you know. My wife is dead. Murdered. Yes, murdered. Not by a ghost, but by a trick. And if it's the last thing I do, I'm going to find out who played that trick and make him pay. And you don't think it's a ghost. Do you? Answer me. Do you believe in ghosts? Did you believe before you came here and ran into this mess you're in? Well, no, I didn't. Then why start believing now? <laughs> Ghost's my foot. Mel, this is a trick. Somebody wants to stop you from turning Gormley Lodge into a ski resort. And if you ask me, it's the Gormleys. One or the other or both is behind all this. 
Or that sheriff down in Manitou. The sheriff? Oh, Mike, you don't really think that the sheriff... I don't know what to think, Liz. All I know is that somebody's behind this. And those are the three likeliest suspects. Now, look, I'm, I'm no Sherlock Holmes, but I've got a brain. And I've got guts. And, and, well, my wife is dead, my, my Jill. Well, I, I'm just going to find out who killed her, that's all. The tougher they are. You like a drink, Mike? No, 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 thanks. I'll be okay. Especially when I nail that murderer. What, what have you got in mind? Well, it'll be dark in about an hour. We take the car, Mel, you and me. We take the car, and we drive up and down that road, all night if necessary, to meet up with this so-called ghost driver. And when and if we meet up with him. Yes. If and when you meet up with him, what? We don't turn aside. We don't swerve out of his path and off the bridge. We drive straight at him and keep driving at him. If he's a ghost in a ghost car... We'll drive through him. And if he isn't? If he isn't? <laughs> well, if he isn't, it'll be one hell of a crash. You. You out there listening. What would you do? If you were Mel Stout, would you accept Mike Duncan's challenge? I'll be back shortly with Act Three. Ever see a beer drinker pour his beer real easy down the side of the glass? Maybe you do it yourself. If so, the Budweiser Brewmaster thinks you're missing something, especially if you're a Budweiser drinker. You see, Bud is brewed, so it will kick up a healthy head of foam. Exclusive beechwood aging and natural carbonation make it a lively brew. Well, anyway, pouring Bud plunk down the middle of the glass helps bring out the best in that clean white Budweiser foam and real beer aroma. It also helps you get the full benefit of a taste, smoothness, and drinkability you'll find in no other beer at any price. Remember, brewing beer right does make a difference. Next time, pour that Budweiser right down the middle and see for yourself. Anheuser-Busch, St. Louis. If you thought you couldn't afford to fly to California this summer, TWA has some good news for you. You can. Thanks to TWA's demand schedule service, you can fly to California for only $125. Just make your reservations 90 days before you want to go and put down a $20 deposit for each way. For all the details, call your travel agent. TWA's demand schedule service. Now you can afford to fly to California. driving the twisting, precipitous mountain road that leads to Gormley Lodge. One, Mike Duncan, believes that the ghost driver they hope to meet is nothing but a trick. Mel Stout, his life savings, every penny at stake, has had no choice but to go along. Mike, I'm bushed. Let's make this the last trip. Uh-uh. We're going to drive up and down this road till dawn. Yes, and night after night if we have to. Until we meet up with our so-called ghost driver. This is the sixth time we've been up and down this mountain road. Okay. Pull over. I'll drive. Get out your side. I'll slip behind the wheel. Yeah. Hey. The car coming up behind us. Red light light. That must be the sheriff. There's yeah, the sheriff, all right. And this is Stout. Oh, and you, Mr. Duncan. What are you doing here, Sheriff? Well, that's what I want to ask you. I got a report from Mountain View House across the valley there that they were seeing headlights going up and down this road. 
Guess I don't have to tell you everybody around here is on edge after what happened last night. Now, what are you up to? We're not up to anything, Sheriff. We're driving this road in hopes of meeting up with whoever or whatever killed my wife and Mr. Stout's brother-in-law. And get yourselves killed in the bargain? Oh, no. You drive on up to Gormley Lodge, and when you get there, stay there. You make that sound like an order, Sheriff. That's what it is, Mr. Stout. Well, I, I guess we better do like he says, Mike. I don't think so. Oh, you don't? No, I don't. This is a public road. We've got a right to be on it. Unless we're doing something that breaks the law, and we're not. You're a kind of troublemaker, Mr. Duncan, aren't you? Sheriff, I never go looking for trouble. But I know how to handle it when it comes my way. Now, either you arrest us for breaking some law or other, in which case you'd better be prepared to back it up or I'll sue the town of Manitou and you for false arrest, or get off our backs. I'm not on your backs. I'm trying to save your lives. Take my advice Advice, and... huh? I thought it was an order. All right, wise guy. Have it your way. Go ahead and get killed and... And be damned to you. All right. Let's go, Mel. You can sure sound tough, Mike. Well, no small town sheriff pushes me around. Well, he's only trying to do his job. Maybe. And maybe not. What do you mean? I don't know. But that's what we're going to find out. Tonight, tomorrow night, or whenever. Oh, there's the bridge ahead. Yeah, maybe you better slow down. No. If it's a ghost, we'll go through it. If it isn't... Mike, headlights coming toward us. Now, look, don't lose your nerve. Coming closer. We're going to crash if you don't... Mike! Driving that car, it's roaring! Your brother-in-law, my God! Mike! But, Mel, Mike, I can't believe it. Can't believe it myself, Liz. Not only what we saw, but getting out of it with our lives. The fates were with us, Mel. I, I lost my nerve. I have to admit that. I just couldn't keep driving straight at that... that awful thing coming toward us. I, I couldn't help myself. I, I swerved at the last second. Well, thank God we hit that stanchion instead of going off the bridge. But Rory driving the other car, it's impossible. Rory's dead. We're burying him tomorrow. Rory's dead, that's for sure. But it was Rory driving that car, that's for sure, too. Then, then ghosts do exist? Mel? Yes, huh? After the funeral tomorrow, let's get out of here. Let's go away from this place as fast as we can. And go where? Oh, back to Aspen, of course. Liz, we're broke. We haven't enough dough left for a motel room. Where would we stay? How would we live? Uh, Mel, I, I, I didn't know things were that bad for you. Putting this place back in shape cost me just about every penny I had. Well, look, uh, would a loan help? You, you'd be willing to... Oh, sure. I like you two, and, well, the way things turned out, we've gotten to know each other real fast. Practically friends. So... Well, if you can use a loan... That's generous of you, Mike. Oh, it, is, it is generous of you, Mike, and I appreciate it, but... No, thanks. What'll you do? Do what you said I ought to do. Fight this thing. Liz? Mike? If you ever come east, be sure to look me up. We will, Mike. Yes, of course. You, you won't change your mind about the loan? Can't. We'd only be putting off what's bound to happen. Unless... Unless what? Unless I can find the answer to what goes on here. There's something bothering me. Something I feel that I saw somewhere, but didn't pay much attention to at the time. Well, what about it, this, this something? It's just something that's bothering me, is all. Something that just could give me the answer to all of this. Hmm. Well... Good luck. You deserve it. Oh, there's the taxi that's going to take me to the airport. Goodbye, Liz. Goodbye, Mike. Bye-bye, Mike, Bye -bye. and thanks. Well, we'd... We'd better get on back, Liz. Liz, you coming? Yes. Mel, you better know it now. No matter what you intend to do, 
I won't be staying. Mel, we've got to face the facts. Buying this place was a big mistake. I admit it now. But there's no sense in crying over spilt milk. What's done is done. So, darling, let's just turn our backs on it, walk away from it, and start again. Start what again? The treadmill of office work? The dreary day-to-day monotony of auditing accounts, toting up figures. I can't bear to go back to that kind of life. I have got to make a go of this. I don't have any other choice. But is it worth your life? Ghost or no ghost, Mel, it's killed four people. It would have been six if you and Mike Duncan hadn't been lucky enough to hit that stanchion. And it will be six if you insist on driving that road again tonight. Six? How, how, how do you make it Six. You don't think I'm going to let you do it alone, do you? But at the funeral, you said that... You said that, that you weren't even going to stay. Because I hoped that would change your mind. But it hasn't. So, you see... I have no choice either. It's just like last night with Mike. From the top of the mountain, down to Manitou, then back up again and again, and no sign of him. But he did show, finally. And Mike lost his nerve, swerved aside at the last second. Let's hope I don't lose mine. Will it matter? What do you mean? Well, if you lose your nerve, we'll go off the bridge. If you don't, and the ghost car isn't a ghost car, we'll be killed in a crash. If there is a crash, but there won't be. You seem awfully sure of that. I am. Remember at the cemetery I told Mike there was something I had seen but hadn't paid any attention to? Yes. And that if I could only remember what it was, I'd have the answer to all of this? Yes. Well, it's come to me. Driving up and down the mountain tonight, it suddenly came to me. See, it wasn't something I'd seen. It was something I'd heard and paid no attention to. Something I knew but didn't realize what it meant. And if I'm right, Liz, if I'm right... What is it? What did you remember? We're on the bridge now. Let me concentrate on driving. Mel? Mel! Mel, there it is. The ghost car is coming straight for us. Yes. And behind the wheel driving it, it's Rory. Oh, my God, it's Rory. Oh, we buried Rory. But then it's his ghost, Mel. Get your hands off the wheel. Don't try to turn the wheel. We're going to crash. Mel, Mel, Mel. This time he swerved and he went off the bridge, just as I knew he would. How? How did you know? Later, Liz. Right now, we better get up to the lodge and phone the sheriff. Oh. Oh. Come in, Mrs. Gormley. Mel? Mrs. Gormley's here. Please, won't you sit down? Yeah, thank you. Hello, Mrs. Gormley. I'm sorry about last night. I'm not. Mrs. Gormley, Jason was your son. Oh, he was the torment of my life. Every day I lived. Of course, I'm sorry he's dead, but... uh, I can only be glad it's over for me. Did you know that your son was the ghost driver? I suspected... But I was never sure. You see, it was Jason who wanted to go on living here in this house far more than I did. Oh, you can understand. He was born here. He grew up here. Started his painting career here in a fine, big studio upstairs. Tragic. Just tragic. Even more tragic if it hadn't been for you. How did you come to know? What made you realize that my son was the ghost driver? A gunshot. A gunshot? The shot he fired to see whether the bullet he used for playing Russian roulette was live or not. Well, I don't, I don't follow you. You see, something kept bugging me, Mrs. Gormley, but I, I couldn't nail it down because I kept thinking it was something that I'd seen. But then suddenly I realized it wasn't something I'd seen, but something I'd heard. That gunshot. I I still don't know. It it, it got me to thinking about Jason playing Russian roulette, playing with life and death. And that got me to thinking a step further. 
sure Russian roulette. Only a fool or a would-be suicide would play it. But the fact remains that the odds are in his favor. Every time Jason spun the barrel of that gun and pulled the trigger, the chances were five to one against firing the bullet. Oh, but, but what was the connection between that and, and the ghost driver? Driving a car straight at another car is just another form of Russian roulette. Ah, oh, yes, I see. Well, Sheriff Harper came to see me, and he said Jason was wearing a mask. Mm. A paper mache mask of your brother's face. Yes, and it wasn't a very good likeness of my brother, but it didn't have to be. It looked enough like him to fool you when you saw it under those awful conditions. The night and the headlights and, and the car coming straight at you. Fear did the rest. There must be another mask, the skeleton face. Oh, there is. We, we, we searched the studio and we found it, Sheriff Harper and me. Yeah, well, it's all over. Jason's at peace at last. God knows I soon shall be. Well, good day. Funny, though. What, Mrs. Gormley? Well, we've searched and we've searched... But we couldn't find a mask of my husband's face. What made you think there was one? Well, you see, when I heard about the masks, I thought it must have been Jason who came and stood at the foot of my bed. Not my husband's ghost. But if it wasn't Jason, who was it? What was it? <laughs> An interesting question. What was it indeed? I'll be back shortly. Hi, Ms. Goldilocks here. Professionally taste-testing diet drinks can be very difficult, but I've just had to bear with it. Then I found sugar-free diet 7-Up. It doesn't taste like other diet drinks. It's fresh, light, natural, delicious. Sugar-free diet 7-Up tastes so good that I've taste-tested it hundreds of times. And each time I've given it my seal of approval. Yes, this one's just right. Introducing the greatest taste to come out of your toaster since Samuel Bath Thomas baked his original English muffins in 1880. Thomas's new onion English muffins. Little bits of real onion blended into Thomas's original English muffin recipe create a tangy taste that makes everything fantastic, like burgers and cream cheese and cold cuts. Even butter tastes better. Thomas's new onion English muffins. The greatest new taste since 1880. Thomas's promises. Hey, Pat, how tall do you think she is? 300 feet if she's an inch, Luigi, and a fine lady she is. The year 1886. While most New Yorkers were enjoying their first look at the Statue of Liberty, a few were enjoying their first taste of Thomas's bread and discovering it was every bit as delicious as Thomas's English muffins. Today, there's still never been a lady to equal the lady, or a bread to equal Thomas's protein, whole wheat, and white bread. Thomas's promises. Here's news from Queen Elizabeth II. Now you can sail to Europe on Queen Elizabeth II and fly home free. I'll repeat that. Sail to Europe on Queen Elizabeth II and fly back to New York free. She reaches Europe in five luxurious days. You have ample time for touring because you fly back. Meals and entertainment on board are included. A whole new crowd of people are discovering Queen Elizabeth II because she's affordable. And she's fun. She has nine bars, four swimming pools, three nightclubs, a discotheque, a gymnasium, a sauna, a casino, and three of the finest restaurants in the world. Sail first class grades A to H and fly home free. Sail tourists grades L to Q and S to U and fly home half fare. Flights are British Airways economy. You can stay in Europe up to 16 days. Call your travel agent or Cunard at 212-983-2510. Sail to Europe on Queen Elizabeth II and fly home free. Great ships of British registry since 1840. Our cast included Augusta Dabney, Mason Adams, Mary Jane Higby, Norman Rose, Nick Pryor, and Leon Janney. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by New Sugar-Free Diet 7-Up. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. 
Until next time, pleasant dreams. The preceding mystery theater program is for... G. Marshall. This is a story of something lost and never found again. A sad story. A strange story. But in no sense a warning. For certainly, no one of us listening could ever be caught up in such a set of circumstances. Or could we? How sure are any of us of our destiny? Our mystery drama, The Ghostly Rival was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Will McKenzie. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Listerine Lozenges. I'll be back shortly with Act One. The crumpled remnants of the car are now a dying sheet of flame. The bright oranges of the fire smeared and dulled by the black smoke as rescue crews work. The man, mercifully thrown clear of the raging flames, his fall broken by the thick underbrush, lies still and limp as the ambulance crew pick him up and carry him to the waiting ambulance. It takes off immediately, and soon, within the city limits, the familiar whoop-whoop of warning clears the road in front of it. It strikes a note of doom to all who hear it. Then... Suddenly, there is the muted quiet of the hospital. Take him straight to emergency. Yes, Dr. Yes. Superficial burns, yes. possibly internal injuries, but yes. main diagnosis is he was bitten by a black widow spider. Yes, Dr. Ah, whoever's on duty can handle the surface stuff. Alert the neuro resident, whoever's on the psych side for the rest. Can do, Dr. Peters. Did you sign him in? Yeah, here are the papers. There's a woman with him, wife, I guess. She got caught in the car and burned to a crisp. Oh, uh, his name is Cartwright. I guess kid glove treatment, he's one of them. We treat them all the same. That's a spirit, baby. (laughs) Just the same, his family and in-laws did build a wing for dear old Central Hospital. All right, I'll see you in the snake pit later. Dr. Peters? Hmm? Oh, yes, Dr. Mathias. Has she put in a call for me? Yes, doctor, I got an accident case. No sweat, minor contusions and burns, but there are complications. Involving a psychiatrist? This one may involve half the staff. First off, the guy was apparently bitten by a black widow spider. What? How do you know? He was conscious when we brought him in. Told us himself. He got thrown clear of the car. He was the lucky one. Oh, there's someone else with him? Uh, Yes, doctor. His wife totaled with the car. Oh, how awful. They hit the guy pretty hard. Although he wasn't all that with it when we brought him in, because... Well, because apparently his wife was going to have a baby. Oh, how hard can you get hit? Uh, Tell me, uh, how bad is the spider bite? Well, that's kind of out of my backyard, but according to Doc Stearns in toxicology, there isn't much to do but wait and see. Mm, Well, as I remember, it's seldom fatal, but it uh, takes a long time for the poison to attack the system and the... Pain is excruciating, if and when it does. Now, this poor guy's ready to flip his lid. I mean, he goes through the guardrail 200 feet into the valley, kills his wife, an unborn child, and turns up without a scratch. Yes, except the spider bite. Yeah, that. Well, what's that next to losing your wife, your kid, and maybe your future? (sighs) You're not asking me, Dr. Peters. You're telling me. And that is my job to discover and to heal, if I can. Good day, Mr. Cartwright. Well, what's your uh, specialty? If you're a doctor, I am. I'm a psychiatrist. Oh. Well, that's different. No, no, not really. Just another phase of medicine. I hope not. I mean, I hope enough different. I've been wanting to ask for someone like you. 
I've got to talk to someone who might possibly understand. Mm. Understanding, I can promise you, absolutely. But, well, at least I listen well. The best I can ask for. No one will believe me. I am trapped as thoroughly as that horrible thing in the bottle I let escape. But I have to keep hoping that somehow I can find escape, too. Well, let's see if we uh, can't begin by making a start at it, at least. How open is your mind? Well, I don't know. It's uh, pretty open, I should hope. You know who I am. Well, you were admitted to the hospital as uh, Thomas Cartwright III. That's who I appear to be. Have you ever heard of a Terry Connolly who is buried in the graveyard behind St. Stephen's and whose headstone reads, Born 429-51, died 816-73? Well, should I have? Yes. Because that's who I really am. <sighs> How do I answer that? I mean, you consider yourself already dead? Condemned. Why? Because I sold my soul. Oh, that's rather a wild statement. You mean like, uh, like Dr. Faustus uh, to the devil? I mean like that. Oh, and I hope by all means you're going to tell me about it. You still think I'm Thomas Cartwright III? Well, to all intents and purposes, plus your uh, public identity and all the private contents of your wallet, and also your wife's identification, of course you are. I couldn't possibly be Terence Conley, could I? No, well, I don't even know him. Then may I introduce myself? Uh, not my outward appearance, but what lives within the outer shell? Suppose I accept that claim. Can you prove it? Can you listen to a sort of complex story? You have the floor. Okay. Let's start it this way. You're looking right at me. Now, I'll even give you a better opportunity. I, uh, no. I, I really don't <clears throat> think you should get out of bed. No, I'll, I'll get right back in. Now, I'm standing. How do I look? Oh, young man in his early 20s. A little bit overweight, uh, brown eyes, uh, dark brown hair, slightly receding, and uh, some evidence of dissipation. Height about uh, 5'10", is it enough? It'll do. Two years ago, I had blue eyes and sun-bleached hair. I was 6 feet 1, 185, all muscle. Here, I'll show you. In my wallet is... Yes, this, this was the last snapshot I ever had taken. Laura took it. You see? Hmm. Well, this would be the Terry Connolly that you mentioned, hmm? That's right. With a surfboard. A hobby? My life. That was at Makaha, the internationals. It was where I met Laura, and the first change in my life happened. You fell in love? Uh, you wouldn't think it to look at her, but she can hang ten with any surf cat. Only by her it was just a sport, for kicks, not a way of life. Now, that shook me. I suddenly woke up to the fact that I was nothing better than a surf bum. Oh, well, so you gave up surfing? Not exactly. I came back to L.A. Laura's from here. Well, from Santa Barbara. And since we wanted to get married, I had to find something to do to make a living. There was this kid I knew. We'd surfed at a hundred beaches ever since we were in junior high. Only he'd busted up a leg pretty bad on a flip out at Monterey. He had a little stake, so we opened a kind of surfboard rental shop. You know, with skin diving gear, other stuff, snorkels and all. And I went in with him, giving surfboard lessons on the side. It wasn't bad, but you couldn't make much. You know how rich Laura's family was. So, uh, she came up with a better idea. I don't know, Laura. I, I, I just don't know if I could go that route. Oh, don't get all uptight on me. It's only money. Yours, not mine. Ours, darling. Once we're married. I don't want to live off you. Now, that isn't the question. <laughs> I want you to live with me. And I also want to be supported in some ways near the style to which I am accustomed. <laughs> You're not going to be able to do that being a half-baked beach boy. Oh, thanks for the way you size me up. Oh, there's no big problem, Terry. Let's be practical. You got your college degree mm -hmm. and decided to take a year off because you wanted to prove there wasn't a wave that swept in on any shore you couldn't master. But you said yourself that the spud got all busted up. You'd bought it. You want to be a doctor. Okay. 
You've had pre-med? You just go on using my dough, and when you get to be a rich orthopedist, I'll make you pay and pay and pay. I, 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 I don't know if I can cut it after being a dropout. You can cut anything you want to, Terry. What about your father? Well, I've been breaking him down bit by bit. He's not all that tough. <laughs> and and how about my rival, Mr. Flabbelly Moneybags? Tom Cartwright. That isn't fair, Terry. He's, he's just very different from you. He sure is. Several million bucks worth. Family money. He didn't earn it the way you're going to. Oh, Terry. What? I love you. You're what I want. Your father will never buy it. I told you I've been working on him. I've even got this far. <laughs> You're invited to dinner this Friday to meet him. You mean so he can look me over? Well, that's fair enough, isn't it? Sure. If you were my daughter, I'd make damn well sure I got a good look at anything chasing you. That's good one, young fellow. No. I'll have to remember it to liven up one of our board meetings. Oh. <laughs> uh, well, you can put the brandy and two glasses on the table, George. And, uh, Laura? Yes, Daddy? Uh, why don't we have coffee out in the solarium? There's still plenty of light to admire the view. All right, I'll have George set us up there. All right, now, uh, you go along superintendent, will you, dear? Mm-hmm. I think Terry and I have a couple words to exchange. Okay, Dad, mm. but you won't be long, will you? Oh, no. I'm the only lady for the gentleman to join. Oh, no, no, no time at all. Well... <clears throat> Do I have some brandy, Terry? Oh, I'm not much of a drinker, sir. How much? Beg pardon, sir? <laughs> well, you heard me. How much to what? To get out of my daughter's life. Leave her alone. By the kind of man I think she should. Someone with plenty of money. Well, it should be one of the requirements. The one that you don't have. I've got a better one. She loves me. I don't know. Out of sight, out of mind. Now, how much, Mr. Beach Boy... To take your bedroll and go follow the waves instead of the most precious possession I have. How about a nickel? I don't understand you. Ah, it's obvious how cheap you consider me. I thought I'd just keep the price in line. <laughs> okay. I'll score you one for guts anyway. But it won't help you. I know who I want Laura to marry, and so does she, and that's the way it will turn out. You may be in for a very unpleasant surprise. Uh, I doubt it. I offered you money to get out of your own free will. And it'll probably cost me less to have you removed, if that's the way you want us. You've got to be kidding. I don't make jokes. Let me put it quite simply, Beach Boy. If you don't bow out gracefully, I will make certain arrangements to have you, uh... Well, if you'll excuse the expression, rubbed out. I'll give you 24 hours to think it over. <laughs> John Sherman Blake, chairman of more boards than we have time to list. Inherited money and accrued money, position, power. The man who holds all the cards and who, in the long tradition of robber barons, never hesitates to use any lever to secure his ends. But murder? Even second hand? Is that how Terry Connolly reached such an early grave? I'll return shortly with Act Two. For a moment, as though exhausted, the pale young man in the hospital bed has shut his eyes, leaning back against the pillows. Dr. Matthias, the psychiatrist, eyes him carefully and then speaks quietly. Perhaps, Mr. Cartwright, we should let you rest for a little while before you continue. Rest, doctor? I haven't known any rest since... Oh, since the, uh, the night you were telling me about? Yes. I didn't go out to the solarium to have coffee. With Mr. Blake's ultimatum facing me, I, I went straight for my old beat-up car and took off. I had to think, clear my mind. Best place for me to do that is riding a wave. So, I headed for the beach. I always keep my gear on the back of my bus. The nearest beach was old Deep Six. Unless you had an attack of the crazies, Nobody rode the junk that came in there. 
rocky bottom, narrow reefs on both sides, and a crisscross that really chopped up the rides. Well, that suited me just fine. I wanted to risk my neck. It might be the answer. I took a heavy board because the wind was high, paddled myself out over the breakers, and waited for the big one. I saw a hummer coming. I waited. Then I raced to stay ahead of the crest. She broke pretty. Then it happened. A rip current broke her wide open. She collapsed on me, driving my board the Lord knows how high in the air and grinding me down and under, rolling and tumbling until I hit my head and went out like the light above me over the sea, under which I was buried. down in the rough sand above the tide's edge. It was almost dark. Beside my head lay a dark green bottle washed up by the waves. And from it, the voice I heard. Or did I really hear it? Was it just some sounding in my half-conscious head? It seemed to be coming muffled from the bottle. Who are you? Oh, I am not a little. What I can expect is you see me with another matter. You're... You're inside the bottle? Yes. Yeah. Crap, I have no power. Food, my power is limited. When I see them, I have to watch. Power, honor, fame, knowledge, weakness. On what condition? I ask none. Are you sure? Or are we just kicking around the old Faust dream? Your freedom for mine. I said there were no conditions. Open this bottle and let me out. And I'll grant you whatever one wish you desire. Okay. You got it. It's only a dream. How... There is no way I can dig this cork out. Okay. Scrooch up in the bottom and look out for flying glass. Here goes. The moment the bottle broke, a great hairy black spider with a red hourglass mark on its belly burst from the sharded remains of the neck. For a moment... It teetered on its long, jointed, multiple legs. And then... A second transformation took place. <laughs> Almost as though it had exploded, the spider blew up into a giant of a man with a bald head bristling dark blue from shaving and a body covered with tangled black hair. Dressed, conventionally enough, in blue jeans, just like I wear normally. I am your servant, sir. Who are you? I am whoever you want me to be. But that is of little importance for the moment. You kept your part of the bargain. Now, I keep mine. Ask anything you want of me. One request. No strings. Choose. All right. I'm too tired and chopped up to debate the point. You ask me what I want, I'll make it within reason. More wealth than the father of the girl I want to make my own. Enough more so that he cannot keep us apart. Granted, you've made your choice. <laughs> the 
feeling of having been asleep for a long time when I woke up. Without remembering why, I had this idea I should be hurting all over. But it wasn't like that. I felt like I was floating on a cloud. The bed, if it was a bed, didn't support me. I, I just sort of hovered in space by myself. I didn't want to open my eyes. I didn't want to come back to reality. This was too plush, too out of this world. Very slowly, I opened my eyes. Good morning, sir. Would you like to breakfast or bathe first? Who are you? Oh, dear. Mr. Cartwright had a big party last night. I've got a headache, like someone hit me with a sandbag. That's right. You have a bruise on your forehead. Do you want ice? No. I... I just want to know where I am. At home. In your own bed. That's crazy. I don't feel that way. I don't belong here. Now you do. Huh? You made one request to be richer, richer than the father of the girl. Now you are. Wait a minute. My first question was right. Who are you? Ah, we met last night. You made a request. It has been granted. A few hours ago, it was recorded in the book that Thomas Cartwright III died of a sudden, massive, unexpected heart attack. At the same time, a young man whose main interest was surfing was the victim of a drowning accident on a nearby beach. Your body lies there among the debris of the tide. In this bed is the body of Tom Cartwright, miraculously recovered from a vascular and cardiac accident. And within the shell of the body, within its cocoon, not Tom, but Terry, lives on. And thus, I kept my promise. How can I be what I'm not? Who is to know the difference? Oh, to begin with, I never saw this Cartwright guy. Rise, Master, and look at yourself in the dressing room mirror, or even the full-length glass, here, on the closet door. I don't think I want to look. Sooner or later. Better now, when we're alone. I'm on my feet. <clears throat> oh, Lord. Everything has changed. Is that really me? That is what you asked to be. Richer than the father of the girl you wished to own. But I didn't ask to be someone else. I don't even know the man. How can I take his place? Uh, let me arrange that, Master. But you can't be with me every moment. Don't I have a business? Uh, uh, go to work? Most fortunately, you are now on vacation. Most of it you plan to spend on your boat. You have few social engagements, except, of course, tonight. Tonight? Yes. Tonight, you are dining with Mr. Sherman Blake and his daughter. I was ripped apart at the thought. To sit at dinner again with Laura and her father. This time, a... What? What would you call me? A half-man or, or a double imposter? How could I carry it off? And yet I knew I couldn't refuse the invitation. Laura, I know it's not an easy evening, but uh, life must go on. Uh, George, I think some more wine. No, not for me, thanks. I'll skip it, too. Oh, dear me. Well... What can I say? The least, the better, Daddy. As you wish. A terrible accident. Yes, it was so wasteful a fine young man. Why would he take a chance as he did in that uh, riptide with uh, such a broken surf? Maybe you could answer that, Daddy. Me? When you shooed me out to set up coffee, what did you say to Terry? You counted him off. You made it impossible for him to even think we could ever be... <laughs> Excuse me, I've got... <laughs> I'm, uh... I'm sorry about that time. Oh, nothing to be sorry about. I understand. You do? Yes, sir. With your permission, sir, I'd like to talk to Laura alone. Uh, well, yes, by all means. I uh, hope you can bring her back to her senses. Uh, you know you have my blessing. 
Yes, sir. I know. Why don't you leave me alone? Laura, please. Don't you even have one small speck of sensitivity in that mean, rotten little soul of yours? I only wanted to tell you something. There's nothing you can tell me that I want to hear. I'm just trying to explain oh, that... Sure. I, I... Before I met Terry, you explained again and again that you were not what you seemed, a conceited, pawing slob who reached for any woman as though it was his divine right. But what I'm trying to say is that I'm not like oh, that anymore. Don't make me laugh. We've been down this route before, Tom. There's, there's no way... Now that I've known what a real man can be, if you could ever turn me on. I... I wouldn't dream of trying now. I'm sorry, Laura. Except, I wish I could tell you how sorry I am about what happened to your Terry. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Though it doesn't even sound like you're... I wish I could believe it. You can. I'm not quite the heel you make me out to be. I may have been once, but not anymore. Now I'll leave you alone. I just wish... Wish uh, what? Well, I just wish I could... I could comfort you some way. Well, I don't see how. Thank you for wanting to, Tom. <laughs> it's so funny, but... But all night, since you came to dinner... There does seem to be something different about you. I, I don't know what or why. Because I have changed, Laura. Give me a chance to prove that. With time, I think you'll find I'm not the hopeless case you've written me off as. I had found out two things. The first, that Terry Conley was dead. The other, that I, or Terry, had given up his life for nothing. I went roaring home in my newly acquired Ferrari to face Aki, or whoever he was, with a new decision. I want to go back. I don't want the money or this flabby, jaded body. So sorry. It's not possible. One wish only, and that has been granted. But I didn't know I'd have to give up my life for it. Please, allow me to point out, you still live. Only outward identity has changed. It's the same thing. As long as I seem to be Tom Cartwright, the girl I want and love won't look at me. Won't have anything to do with me. Patience, Master. You will see. All will turn out right. It is written, you will be married. Now, I must leave. If you need me again, go to the sea and find the bottle again. <laughs> Oriental's head, a great jagged streak of fire exploded and disappeared. I realized that I had not been talking with Aki, but with what? A minor demon. Or the devil himself. What did it matter? He had brought me to where I was. And where was that? Was I dead? Was I alive? For a moment, the pale, tortured young man in the hospital bed stops his story to shut his eyes as if against the wave of excruciating pain. The psychiatrist, listening to him, is tempted to react compassionately, but for the moment he waits. The pain may be less physical than mental. And the harrowing story is not yet ended. I'll return shortly with Act Three. You've worked hard to get where you are, and now would be a very good time to give yourself a little pat on the back in the form of Buick Electra, a car filled with room, luxury, comfort, the perfect place for you and your free spirit to get together. Buick Electra. Think of it as recognition for a job well done. America discovers Mailgram. 
All over the country, people are discovering the speed and impact of Mailgram. Here's what airline stewardess April Rivkin told us. April, how did Mailgram help you? Well, one day they were going to lay off no people, and the next day it was 300 people. Literally, this is the way it went. They were just sort of hedging the issue. And I kept thinking, well, somebody must know. So I sent a mailgram to the chairman of the board. Now that's a direct approach. What happened? I was amazed how my mailgram got through. And a few days later, somebody called me and said, the chairman of the board got your mailgram and asked me to respond to it. And I thought, well, I'm off the hook. I've been talking with April Rivkin. She's one of millions of people who are discovering that mailgrams get through to people and get results. It's easy to send a mailgram. Just call Western Union's toll-free 800 number anytime, day or night. Mailgram, impact of a telegram at a fraction of the cost. Oh, do I love my legs. I do, I do. Do I love my legs pantyhose. Legs pantyhose have memory yarn. Memory yarn stretches out and remembers to stretch back. That's the memory in legs memory yarn. I can walk, I can jump, I can bend to touch my toes. Stretch to stand on tiptoes. Legs never bad. My legs pantyhose have a fit you can't forget, a stretch you won't believe. Comfort beautiful. That's the memory in legs memory yarn. Oh, do I love my legs. I do, I do. You'll love legs pantyhose, too. And if for any reason you don't, we'll refund your money or send you a replacement, whichever you prefer. That's the you'll love our legs guarantee. Oh, I love my legs, I do. of pain, whether caused by the spider bite or some deeper echo from the soul, has passed. But the young man in the bed still lies with his eyes closed. The nurse coming into the room is quickly pantomimed to silence by the psychiatrist. She stops with the tray containing the hypodermic and the phial of morphine. Quietly, Dr. Matthias goes to her. Dr. Peters ordered a hypo for him, Dr. Matthias. Well, I don't think he needs it yet. Now, if it becomes necessary, I'll give it to him. Yes, doctor. Mr. Cartwright? Yes. Are you all right? Yes. Do you have any pain? <laughs> pain? Oh. I'll never be without it. I can give you a needle if you want. No. No. No drug will reach the pain that really haunts me. I... I want to finish my story. Yes. Very well. Uh, let's continue. It was her father who dragged me back into the whole mess. He came to see me at my house, and he didn't mince words. Ah, you can't leave me hanging like this. I have a deadline to meet. Yes, I know. Well, are you coming in with me, or aren't you? I haven't made up my mind yet. Oh, good Lord, man, you can't put me off. I'm in the edge of the precipice. I foolishly overextended. I, I have no cash flow, and if the banks ever get wind of that, the whole thing would collapse like a house of cards. And how much is it you want to borrow? It's got to be a couple of million, at least. Now, we have been over this before. And the security. We... We've discussed that before, too. You mean Laura? Yes. Except that she happens to be a security that you can't deliver. That's where you're wrong. I have only to tell her the truth about my my business problems, and she, she would sac... I mean, she would agree to marry you. A lamb to the slaughter. What would you say? Doesn't matter. All right, Sherman. Well, perhaps I should say, Dad, you've got a deal. Laura, for whatever you need, up to what I've got. You'll never regret this, son. And so, you were married? Yes, not quite two years ago. Uh, it was a bad marriage? No. No, not for the most of it. At the beginning, for the best part of the first year, it was... Uh, Uneasy and difficult. But slowly, slowly things began to change. I wanted to tell Laura the truth, what really had happened. But how could I? She would have thought me absolutely mad, out of my skull. Then, as the months passed, I began to see it looked as though I'd never have to. I remember one night, after a party, going to bed. How many? 
many people do you suppose were at that party tonight? Hmm. I don't know. A couple of hundred, maybe. And how many men? <laughs> you think I count them? No, no, I'm serious, darling. Darling? That's what I said. Oh. Ah, uh, men. Uh, I don't know. I guess when Stanton throws a ball, there are more men than dames. What's the difference? I just wanted to tell you something. No matter how many there were, I'd have taken my man over any guy there. Laura. Yes. That's the way it's gotten to be with me now. That was the beginning of our whole new relationship. At first, I basked in it, gloried in it, ate it up. And then? Yes, Mr. Cartwright. And then? And then another crazy thing was happening inside. Can you imagine a man being jealous of himself? I was two people in one body, both of whom loved the same woman. One was dead, except his soul lived on inside this body. Who was it Laura really loved? Me, Terry, the scatterbrain, the live-for-the-moment guy? Or Tom, the percentage man, the, the cool cat with the morals of one, and a built-in gift for destruction? Is that what you tried to solve? That's what I had to solve. Because... Because? Because so very soon after Laura and I had found each other, she became pregnant. Whose child had been created? Mine? I mean, Terry's? Or Tom's? I mauled over. I agonized over what the future held. And at last, I had to decide. I, I had to make some attempt to find out. But how can we? You know, we're only human. We can't foretell the future. I could. I remembered what the spirit had told me. To seek him, go to the sea. Again it was late in the day, and again it was old deep six. Beyond the surf, I waited for the way. I was king, invincible, hanging ten. Suddenly, before I could move back, the wave broke upon me. The wild cross lift snatched my board and threw it sky high, and I was ground down under the mad, swirling, breaking water below. I came to again, lying on the tide's edge, just as I had done so many months ago. Why did you stop, Tommy? The child. The child. What of the child? I suddenly realized what a fool I was. You asked nothing from me for what I wanted. But what about my children? What did you imagine? The world on its favorite place without any regret. But you promised it was not the old Dr. Faust's gag. Naturally. We possess these change. Your soul had no interest for me. <laughs> Only your offshoot. Your children from here on and on and into time. As long as they shall live. <laughs> That's the answer to everything. Why I came back ready to strangle the woman I loved so she could never bear a child that would foster the dynasty of the devil. But you didn't strangle her. No, because when I got home, Laura was half out of her wits. She had found that a black spider with an hourglass shape on its belly had been weaving or spinning a web over the crib we had waiting in the nursery to receive our baby when it was born. Well, then what happened? I started to push aside the web, but it clung to me. And as I tried to brush it off, suddenly, the spider was clinging to my wrist. And I could feel its bite, sharp and penetrating. And I could hear a voice in my ear. You cannot win, my friend. I gave you freedom. But in return, you sold to me your children. And your children's children to the end of time. You accepted that? Never. Never. I took Laura with me to the car. The excuse for our wild ride, that I had to get to the hospital to get an antitoxin for the bite of the Black Widow. Take it easy, darling. I can't. You don't understand. I love you so. I don't understand what upsets you. There's no way to explain. 
explain. It's just that the devil rides our face. Hold, hold tight. And remember, I love you. This is the best way out. So, you remember. You know that Laura is... Uh... He's dead. Why not me? What was I saved for? That's uh, a question that can't be answered. Oh, yes. I see now. It's all clear. You. What? In another form. The Antichrist. The enemy. I can do nothing else. But Mr. Kai, I can I kill you! Why no, 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 me? I want to help you! you. Okay. Let him, let him. okay. I don't need any medicine for me to handle this. <laughs> That's an unusual case, only because of the, uh, the violence involved. There's not much to say about it, Dr. Peters. Uh, except I'd like to try to understand it. <laughs> that would take volumes. A classic world of delusions. Everything? Hmm? There's very little missing. There was love broken off. There was a child that might have been born. There was a man already beyond the norm of society who thought he was doing the right thing in destroying himself, his wife, and, uh... His unborn child. And we just write him off, Doctor? No, 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 no. We write no one off. We probe as much as we can. We try to resolve what we can. There are still cases beyond all our knowledge. And someday, someday, we may solve them. <laughs> Don't look to me for any answers. This is the story of what happened. Or appeared to. I know no other way than to leave it at that. Unless someone can tell me more than I can understand. I'll be back shortly. Bargain shoppers of America, you've waited long enough. Now you'd better move fast, because it looks like prices on appliances will be going up again soon. Before they do, get to your Whirlpool dealers, where you'll find some of the hottest deals in town. How about that new dishwasher you've been promising yourself? Take $74 off the old fair trade price tag on a new deluxe Whirlpool quality dishwasher. In the market for a quality refrigerator, save $60 on Whirlpool's beautiful big side-by-side 19-footer. Or save $43 on the Whirlpool 12-footer that's American-made and only 24 inches wide. Wait, there's more. You save $70 on a Whirlpool quality compact washer and dryer pair, and they can both fit in only 24 inches of space. Here's what we're saying. Whatever your bargain shopping for in the way of quality appliances, now's the time to see your Whirlpool dealer. He's got the deal to turn you on. Prices are optional with Whirlpool dealers and savings are based on previously higher fair trade prices. Cobb. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Tonight's Mystery Theater was also brought to you in part by ShopRite Supermarkets. The preceding program was furnished by CBS Radio.
I'm E.G. Marshall. Sit down. Anywhere you like. I have a small confession to make. I am crazy about ghosts. And I cannot for the life of me comprehend why anyone should be afraid of them. What, after all, what do ghosts do? They haunt, that's all. To haunt means to visit, to frequent. In short, to hang around. What's so scary about that? A hopeful lover hangs around a lot. If an inspiring lover or a wistful compatriot can hang around without inspiring fear, why not an anxious ghost? Is it... Is it really you, Paul? Yes, Melba. It is I. Oh, oh, Paul. Don't cry, Melba. I can't... I can't help it. All right, dearest. Go ahead and cry. Paul. Paul, tell me something. What? Are you happy? Where... Where you are? I'm really sorry you asked me that, Melba. Our mystery drama, Ghost Talk, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Elspeth Eric and stars Lenka Peterson and Elliot Reed. Yes, ghosts haunt places. Traditionally, they haunt large, decrepit mansions with long halls, extensive staircases, and musty attics. But these big old edifices have all disappeared from our landscape, and it is more than likely that the ghost of today has to restrict himself to one-bedroom apartments with bath, kitchenette, and dining area. Poor ghosts. Will he give up haunting altogether, or will he do what we have done? Adjust. Melba? You have my number? Yes, Leonard. Both at home and at the office. If there's anything I can do, Melba, anything at all... I'll call you. Bless you, my dear. Oh, Paul. Where are you? Where? It's me. They've all gone. Leonard Whipple was the last to leave. I'm all alone. No, I'm not crying. I'm trying to be brave and calm and, and remember everything you told me. Leonard said to call him if I needed anything, but I'm, what does that mean? I need my husband. I need Paul. Oh, no, Irene, I couldn't go to the movies. No. I'll just sit here and think about Paul. All the beautiful memories. Twenty-two years of beautiful memories. You know, Irene, I keep thinking all the time of what you said to me after the funeral. You said Paul will never be really dead as long as he's remembered. I keep saying that over and over. Paul isn't really dead as long as he's remembered. I want to thank you, Irene, for that beautiful thought. It means everything to me. Oh, Melba. Melba. How goes it, Paul? Oh, hello, it's Bruce, isn't it? I'm new here. I haven't got everybody straight yet. <laughs> you never will. It doesn't matter. Yes, I am Bruce. Mind if I join you? I wish you would. You had a particularly beatific expression on your face just now as I was floating by. Uh, I was thinking of my wife. My wife, Melba. Yeah, why? Why? Well, actually, because she was thinking of me. Remembering our wedding day, I was touched. 
You're really very new here, aren't you? Oh, yes, very. At the start, everybody is either touched that they're remembered, apprehensive that they won't be, or furious that they're not. Melba feels that no one is really dead as long as he's remembered. Is that what you want to be? Not really dead? It sounds nice. Well, it isn't. I don't know how you can say that. Because I happen to know. From bitter personal experience. My sainted mother remembered me every day of her life after I died. Till the day she died and joined me here. Since her arrival, I'm happy to say, we've exchanged precisely six words. A while back, she had the grace to apologize. I'm sorry, son, I didn't understand. Those were the six words. Sorry for what? For remembering me. What was she supposed to do? Forget, for goodness sakes. I wouldn't expect her to forget immediately, of course. That would be unreasonable. But as soon as possible, put me out of her mind. My life on earth was over. I'm sure she meant well, your mother. After you're here a while, you'll realize that everybody doesn't mean well. And quite often does a lot of harm. But your mother loved you. Then why not leave me alone to enjoy myself? Why wake up in the middle of the night to remember how handsome I looked the day I graduated from dental college? So inconsiderate. Why was it inconsiderate? Because, my dear fellow, if she kept it up long enough, I'd have to stop whatever I was doing and go visit her. Visit her? How could you do that? How? Well, the way it's always done. As a ghost, of course. Irene? It's me. Oh, all right, I guess. Leonard was here. We sent out for Chinese food. He left about an hour ago. Oh, I'm just sitting here and remembering. I got out the old picture album to show Leonard. <laughs> I don't think Leonard cares too much for travel. I wasn't sorry when he left. Looking at the snapshots and remembering the beautiful life I had with Paul, it seemed to bring him closer. Oh, I mean it, Irene. A couple of times, I I felt as though he was right here in the room with me. Honestly. Bruce! Oh, Bruce. That you, Paul? I had a terrible time finding you. Well, now you have. I asked everybody where you were and nobody knew, and then Salome said, oh, he's probably out strolling among the stars. That's his favorite pastime. But I had no idea how many stars there are. You still haven't any idea. Actually, neither have I, and I've been here heaven knows how long. So far, this is my favorite galaxy. But, of course, I haven't seen them all. Has anyone, do you think? Oh, I suppose he has. He must have seen everything since the beginning of time. And before that? Ah, yes. What made you come looking for me? Something special? Bruce, I can't get a moment to myself on account of Melba. Your wife. You know what she did. She got out an old snapshot album and started looking over all the pictures we took on our vacations, birthdays, Christmases. Typical. They all do it. The worst part is she showed all these pictures to a friend of mine, of hers, ours, Leonard Whipple. He couldn't have cared less. She's really hanging on to you, isn't she? It's very nice of her and all that, but it's... It's terribly exciting for me being here. Everything's so completely different. There she goes again, hear her? Paul, dear. Dear Paul. Hear that? Vaguely. She just keeps after me and keeps after me. Well, what about this Leonard Whipple? Well, he's a very nice guy, but he's not going to hang around much longer if she makes him look at pictures of our honeymoon and the Grand Canyon. Mm. You couldn't just ignore her, I suppose. Well, she's my wife, and I love her. I mean, she was my wife, and I did love her. But now, things are different. I'd say so. (gasps) Well, for goodness sake, look there. If it isn't him... Him? You mean it? Really? Him? I haven't seen him in eons. I never have. Uh, Sir? Sir, please? Hmm? No. Yes, yes, it's Bruce. Yes. Am I right? Yes, sir. And this is Paul. He's new. I know. Hello, Paul. I... I'm really thrilled to meet you, sir. The galaxy is looking well, don't you think? I love this galaxy, sir. You set it out so neatly. Hmm... 
There's one star I've been concerned about. I think it's beginning to twinkle out. Uh, Sir, as long as we were so fortunate as to run into you like this, could we have your advice about something? You know I dislike giving advice. It's for me, sir. I don't know what to do about my wife. Is she here? Oh, no. She's with the living. On Earth. Oh. And she's grieving. Well, that's to be expected. She'll stop after a while. She doesn't show any signs of stopping. I I was wondering if I shouldn't, you know, appear to her. Bruce says it's a simple procedure. Well, you could do that, of course. I never thought very highly of that ghost business, so theatrical. But if it'll make her feel better? I suppose we do owe a measure of responsibility to the living. You think I could go back for a short visit? You're free to do as you like. If I were to tell you what to do, you wouldn't be free anymore, would you? Well, if you just tell me what you think. No, I really can't do that. That would be tantamount to telling you what to do because of me being who I am. You see, you think I have all the answers. Everybody thinks so. Well, I don't. There are countless things I haven't found answers to. (laughs) However... Like everyone else, I keep trying. Now, uh, I really have to go to see if that poor star is feeling any pain. You'll both excuse me? He wasn't much help. Well, that's his way. Oh, dear. Oh, there she goes again. Dear Paul. Bruce, I'm going to turn ghost and visitor. At least you've made a decision. How do I go about it? Well, there are no hard and fast rules. Actually, not many of us do it. It's, it. it's considered kind of freaky. Freaky? Look how many of us there are and how few of them. If we all took to ghost walking, we'd have them outnumbered trillions to one. I don't care. I want to do it. I just need to know how. Well, you can do it in the old-fashioned way. Clanking chains, winds whistling through the trees, moon behind black clouds and all that... I don't think Melba would go for that. Well, then there's the crying, sobbing type of ghost. Inconsolable weeping. Since I don't feel particularly inconsolable... Well, then there's the ghost that flits through the halls, appearing and disappearing. Now you see it, now you don't. No, we don't have a hall, just a rather small foyer. Mm. Uh, Can't I just appear in some simple, straightforward way? Just say, here I am, dear. You wouldn't want to start with one weird, uncanny shriek. I wouldn't know how. Or a sardonic laugh? Well, what would I be laughing at? Oh, life, death, anything in between. Well, if you don't want to do any of those things, things which he calls theatrical, then just appear. That's more my style, I think. But wrap a bit of vapor around you. After all, they need something to identify you by. And don't stay too long. And above all, don't let it depress you. Why should it depress me? Mm-hmm. You'll find out, my friend... You'll find out. It never occurred to me that a visitation by a ghost could be depressing. Take now that well-known ghost of Hamlet's father, speaking spookily from the battlements at Elsinore. Of course, he didn't sound happy. How could he when his own brother had just killed him and promptly married his widow? He sounded angry, yes. Vengeful, yes. But depressed, no. And certainly not depressing. I'll return shortly with Act Two. Our moribund hero, Paul, has decided to return to Earth as a ghost and haunt the three-room apartment where he once lived with his wife, Melba. He has simply draped what remains of him in a shred of celestial vapor. And now, as he gazes through the living room window of what used to be his own tenth-floor apartment, he can scarcely be distinguished from the melting moonlight that floods the room inside. Nothing's changed. She hasn't changed a thing. Let's take our coffee into the living room, Leonard. Good idea. I think I picked the wrong time. Bring in that plate of cookies, will you? Right. Not those same old oatmeal things. I've always been crazy about oatmeal cookies. 
They were Paul's favorites. Set them down there. Mm-hmm. Cream in your coffee? Sugar? Uh, black, please. No sugar. That's the way Paul took his. His after-dinner coffee in the morning, cream and sugar, yes, but after dinner, nothing. Is that so? And milk in his tea. You don't say. That's the English way, you know, milk and tea. I didn't know Paul was English. He wasn't. Oh, I see. Oh, way back, five, six generations, he was English, but... I, myself, was born in Wales. Is that so? Oh, well, that's near England. Richard Burton is Welsh, you know. For goodness sakes! Why, didn't you know that? The last movie Paul and I saw together had Richard Burton in it. I I wanted to show you something fascinating. Paul's World War II uniform. I've saved it all these years. Uh, no, I don't... Uh, not tonight. And his captain's bars. Some other time. I, I've really got to be moving on. Oh, if you really have to. Such a beautiful night. I think I'll walk home. Yes, a beautiful night. Oh, just look at the moonlight streaming through that window. Care to walk a ways with me in the moonlight? Oh, no, I don't think so, Leonard. I have a lot of things to do here. Yeah, well, if there's anything you need, you have my number. Yes. At home and at the office. Good night, Melba. Thanks for dinner. Thank you for bringing all that fried chicken. Oh, it it was nothing, really. Good night. Good night, Leonard. Oh, Paul. Dear Paul. I need you, Paul. Melba. Oh, I need you so. I'm right here. What was that? I said, I'm here. Paul? Yes. Me. Paul. But... But... Where? By the window, dear. I can't see you. I'll step inside. That'll be better. Oh, I see... I, I see something. You see me. I dare say I've changed somewhat. Paul! Can that be you? It is. I. Really? You? Well... Fairly, really. Everything considered, as real as I can get. Oh, I... I can't believe it. Believe it, Melba. Oh, Paul. How are you? Oh, never mind about me. How are you? Oh, I'm all right. Really? All right? Everything considered. Everything considered, I'm better than all right. Paul, tell me. Are you happy? Happy? I must know. Are you happy? I'm sorry you asked me that question. Why should you be sorry? Happy just isn't a word we use. Why not? Because it... It doesn't mean much once you've died. Oh, Paul, you're not saying you're unhappy. No, I'm not saying that. Then what are you saying? Look, Melba, I didn't really come here to talk about me. What about you? Well, naturally, I'm not happy. Why not? Without you? What about Leonard Whipple? Oh, him. What's the matter with Leonard? Well, nothing's the matter with him. He's just not you. Well, I'm not me either. Not the way I was before I... Oh, but I remember you the way you were. And as long as I remember... Melba, honey... I don't even remember me the way I was. You don't? Not very well. You remember me, don't you? Sort of. Sort of? Well, you were my wife. I'm still your wife. Not exactly. There'll never be anyone for me but you. Never, I swear it. Please, Melba. We are man and wife forever, for eternity. And now that I know you can return to me, not in the flesh perhaps, but even like this... It's strange. It's weird, but it's enough for me. I can live on as your wife and on and on till I join you. Melba, you don't know what you're saying. Oh, I knew you could never really die as long as I remembered you. And you see, here you are, living on. Hello, 
Irene, me. Guess what? You'll never guess. Paul was here. Yes. Yes, yes. Right here in this living room. All right, then his ghost, whatever. Well, he looked different. Yes, yeah, sort of steamy. Kind of like a, a street light on a foggy night. But I knew it was Paul, all right. His voice and the things he said and the way he called me Melba, dear. Well, he didn't say too much. I, I asked him, was he happy? Because naturally I wanted to know, but he wouldn't say. He wouldn't say he wasn't unhappy either. Isn't that weird? He wanted to know about me. Am I happy? <laughs> Isn't that sweet? And he asked about Leonard Whipple. Imagine him knowing I've been seeing Leonard off and on. Of course, I told him Leonard doesn't mean a thing to me, that there could never be anyone else for me. I said, Paul, we are man and wife for eternity. I said, you can never truly die, Paul, as long as I remember you. And then, you know what, Irene? There was this big, great, big noise, a, a crash sort of... No, not like thunder, more like, like music, like a chord out of Beethoven or somebody. And all of a sudden, he was gone. But he'll be back. Like you said, no one is really dead as long as he's remembered. Sir. Oh, oh sir. May I speak with you? Hmm? No. Oh, it's uh, Paul, isn't it? Uh, sir, uh, could I have just a moment of your time? I have all the time in the world. I have all the time there is. But I don't quite know how much time there is, but I do know I have all of it. Uh, does that star look all right to you? Well, I, I wouldn't know. I, I don't quite know how a star is supposed to look. Please, sir, may, Oh, may I... yes, 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 of course. You want to talk to me. Uh, what about? I... I've been back to the Earth. My wife kept calling me. You said we owed some responsibility to the living, did so I... Did I say that? Yes, sir, you did. Hmm... I wonder if I was right about that. These earth trips can be very upsetting. Mine was. My wife wanted to know, am I happy? They're all so preoccupied with happiness, aren't they? I didn't know what to say to her. I, I couldn't answer her. This woman I'd been married to for half my life, I couldn't talk to her. It was as though we were living in two different worlds. Well? Oh, 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 yes, I, I see what you mean. Still, shouldn't I have been able to answer her? Well, what could you have said? Well, that... That happy is a word that doesn't mean anything anymore. Happy is nothing without unhappy. The way pleasure is nothing without pain. The way health is nothing without illness. Euphoria is nothing without depression. Oh, you know what I mean, sir. I do know, yes. It's ridiculous to say I'm happy when I'm never unhappy. What I am is... What you are is... What? What I am is... Free. Yes. I'm free. I'm Paul, and I'm free. And I'm free to be Paul. No more, no less than me. Me, Paul. Sir, why couldn't I be free like that before? Oh, dear, I ask myself that same question all the time. The only answer is that I miscalculated somewhere. And I did give those people the power to think, to reason, to figure out the sensible way to do things. Oh, why don't they use what I gave them? Why leave everything up to me? Theirs isn't the only planet in the universe, you know. I do have other things to look after, but the way they call out to me, they, they want me to do everything. But it's, it's, it's not right. It really is not right. No, sir. I'm sorry, sir. Well, what's done is done. They'll just have to muddle through the best way they can. Uh, now, about your wife. Uh, Melba, is it? Yes, sir. Mm. Tell you what. Why don't you talk to Bruce about it? You two seem to get along so well. Yes, yes. Talk to Bruce. Now, excuse me, will you? Um, I really do have to go take a look at that 
poor star. Bruce, he just wasn't any help at all. Now you listen, Paul. Suppose you had invented the greatest machine imaginable. One that would do, uh, oh, practically anything you can think of. How would you like it if somebody came running to you every time a bolt got loose and asked you to tighten it? But, Bruce, Mel says she's going to go on remembering me forever. We'll be man and wife forever till she joins me here and then we'll still be man and wife. Maybe once she gets here, she'll change her mind. But she's only 42. She'll be remembering me for years and years and calling for me and I'll have to put on that vapor stuff and haunt the apartment. And, and Bruce, it's so hard to carry on a conversation with her now. Didn't used to be, but now... You, you couldn't just ignore her. I love her, Bruce. Do you? Well, I did. For a very long time, right up to the moment I died. My last words were, I love you, Melba. At least, that's what I meant to say. I know I had it in my mind to say that, but I'm not positive I ever got around to saying it. Anyway, I can't just just brush her off. My, my. You do have a conscience, don't you? Well, I hope so. It's a very fine thing to have, of course, but... Sometimes. Look, there's only one thing you can do. What? Get married. G married? To, to... To Melba? No, not to Melba, you idiot. How could you marry Melba? She's there and you're here. Some marriage that would be. But then, who... Whom would I marry? Oh, heavens to Betsy, Paul. The place is full of women. Have you ever seen Helen? Helen who? Helen of Troy, they call her. Actually, I've never met her myself, but from what they tell me... Marriages are made in heaven, so it's been said. There are those who consider this a profoundly true observation, while others think it one of the silliest statements ever made. I myself have no opinion, at least none that I care to express here. But no one, so far as I know, has ever claimed that people actually get married in heaven. Melba was a wonderful wife to Paul. But as his widow, she leaves something to be desired. Two things. She won't stop desiring him, and she won't leave him alone. In his desperation, Paul has gone to his kindred spirit, Bruce, for help. The only advice Bruce could offer was for Paul to marry again. Not his earthly wife, Melba, but one of the heavenly creatures who, like Paul, expect to live on forever in whatever place it is they live on forever in. You've definitely burned yourself out, little one. Oh, too bad. Sir? Oh, sir. Now, look, Paul. This dear little star has burned itself out. Well, I knew it wouldn't be long. Uh, sir, I did what you told me to. I talked to Bruce about my problem, and you know what he said? He said, get married. It married? He says the only way to make Melba forget me is for me to get married to someone else. Someone here. Where else? What do you think of the idea? Why do you keep asking me what I think? Can't you ever think for yourself? Well, I just thought... That... No, no, you didn't. You came running to me like all the others. I'm getting tired of it. Well, if you could give me a little advice... I uh... gave you a little advice. I said, talk to Bruce. You talked to Bruce, and he told you what he thought you should do. Now, either do it or don't do it. Is it all right? Is uh, what all right? To get married. Here. Paul, the essence of this place is perfect freedom to do as you choose. It might work out, it might not. But that's true of everything, isn't it? It's certainly true of everything I do. Do many people get married here? Well, I don't know. I do know they don't come running to me to ask, is it all right? Bruce mentioned someone called Helen. Helen of Troy? 
Are you asking me to pick a wife for you? Now, what else do you want me to do? Tie your shoelaces? Help you with your arithmetic? Don't you people ever grow up? I'm sorry, sir. I don't care about your being sorry. That's too easy. I care about your achieving some measure of maturity. A bit of independence, a little simple sense. Is that asking too much? Tell me, is that really asking too much? Oh, sir, I... Sometimes I feel like giving up on the whole human race. You're, you're not going to cry, are you, sir? Why not? Who has better reason to cry than I have? Nobody, I guess. Uh. <sighs> However, we must all carry on, mustn't we? Never give up. That's my motto. Because if I gave up... Uh, don't oh, say it, sir. Please, don't say it. No. No, I won't say it. I wouldn't be so cruel, no matter how provoked. Now, Paul, I really must go to tend to that poor little star who, believe me, needs my help more than you do. Irene, it's me. Oh, just sitting around... Leonard asked me to go to that new steak place with him, but I said no. I didn't feel like it, that's why. Don't be silly. I like Leonard. He's a very nice man, but... Well, there's a beautiful moon out tonight. and I thought maybe... Oh, for heaven's sakes, what's that? Well, there was a terrible clanking noise just now. It scared me to death. Oh, how could it be the radiator? The heat's not turned on yet. Is there a storm coming up or something? Is that, that whistling sound, can't you hear it? Like a, like a terrible wind. Or maybe a hurricane. <laughs> what do you mean you don't hear anything? <gasps> what, there goes the moon. It must be a hurricane. I mean, the moonlight just stopped shining. How can it be shining where you are and not here? Oh, now it's shining here, too. <laughs> Irene, oh, are you there? Oh, are you crying about something? Oh, I thought you were. But no, no reason, I just thought I heard... Well, I heard somebody crying. The more than crying, really sobbing. Oh, oh my goodness. Something just ran through the room. How do I know what? It disappeared into the kitchen. <laughs> Irene, there's something here in the kitchen. It's, it's laughing, terrible laughing. It couldn't be Paul. Because, because it couldn't be. Paul doesn't behave that way. He just comes to the window and says, Here I am, Melba, dear. It couldn't be Paul. Here I am, Melba, dear. <gasps> he just said it. Here I am, Melba, dear. Melba, I'm here. Irene, I'm going to hang up. I've got to find out if it's Paul. And if it is Paul, I've got to know why he's behaving so peculiarly. No, no, don't come over. You, you might scare him away. I mean, after all, I'm used to these things and you're not. Bye, Irene. Hello, Melba. Paul, is it you? No, it's not Paul. <gasps> oh, don't be frightened. I'm Bruce. Bruce? Who? I don't know any Bruce. I'm Paul's new friend. His best friend, actually. But why are you here? Why isn't Paul here? He couldn't make it tonight. Why not? Nothing's happened to him, has it? What could happen? Well, nothing, I suppose. Everything's already happened. Precisely. Well, then why isn't he here? I've thought about him and thought about him every single day and every time I woke up during the night. I've been over every moment of every day of every year we had together. That's just it. And I'm just about to start over at the beginning. Uh, I wouldn't do that if I were you. Why not? He's not really dead as long as I remember him. He's not really alive either, is he? Well, no, but... Melba, you're wearing him out with all this remembering. Wearing him out? Yeah, back and forth, back and forth. It's very tiring, Melba. You mean he'd rather just stay where he is? I think so. Oh, nobody wants to be dead and forgotten. Wait till it's your turn. I certainly don't want to be. Wait, you'll find out. Nobody wants to be dead and forgotten. That's because they haven't tried it yet. You mean... 
to tell me that Paul wants to be forgotten? By me? If you think you could manage it. Forget 22 beautiful years? Oh, I, I couldn't. I, I couldn't possibly. What about having 22 more beautiful years with somebody else? Like who? Well, I've heard nice things about a certain Leonard Whipple. Leonard Whipple? I've heard he's very devoted to you. But Leonard's not Paul. I mean, Leonard could never be Paul. But he could be Leonard, couldn't he? If you'd let him. Well, Paul is the only man for me. Always was, always will be, and that is that. Oh, Melba, Melba. Why do you say, oh, Melba, Melba, like that? Because you forced me to tell you something I really have no right to tell you. What? What is it? Hardly anybody knows about it. Just me. And Paul, of course. What is it? I shouldn't repeat it. No. My lips are sealed. It's too private. Does it concern Paul? Is it about Paul? You won't mention it to a living soul? I won't mention it to anybody. What is it? Paul. Paul is getting married again. Paul? Is getting married again? Yes. Who to? I think her name is Helen. Is she pretty? I've never met her, but I hear she's very pretty. Young? I believe so. Oh, how could he? How could he? That's life, Melba. Life? Paul's not alive. No, oh, but you are, Melba. Yes, I am. Make the most of it. That's my advice to you. Thank you, Bruce, for telling me what you've told me. I really appreciate it. You're quite welcome. I don't suppose Paul would ever have told me himself. Oh, eventually he would have. Maybe. Maybe not. Well, if you see him, tell him I hope he's very happy with his Helen. I'll tell him. Nice to have met you, Melba. It's very nice to have met you, too, Bruce. I... Are you still sitting down or standing up? I can't quite tell. Does it really matter? Well, I'd just like to... I don't know, shake your hand or something. <laughs> Not necessary. Not necessary at all. I... I could see you to the door. No, let's just part this way. A fond adieu to you, Melba. A fond... Oh. He's gone. He just disappeared. Well, that's the way with ghosts. Oh. Who needs ghosts, anyway? With all their comings and goings. And the way they talk. Who can understand them? Hello? Irene? Irene, you are absolutely not going to believe what I'm about to tell you. You simply will not believe it. <laughs> Bruce, where have you been? I've been looking all over for you. Even Salome didn't know where you were. Where were you? I went to see your wife. Melba? What for? To tell her you were getting married. Bruce, you had no right to do that. Here, we do as we choose. He told you that. How did she take it? Shocked, of course. Hurt. What you'd expect. You told me you were going to tell her. I knew you wouldn't let me. I wouldn't have. For one very good reason. It's not true. What's not true? That I'm getting married. You changed your mind? Not exactly. I asked Helen. Yes? She said absolutely not. She says she's not the marrying type. But you didn't stop right there, did you? There are others. I asked Catherine. Uh, uh, I can't pronounce her last name. She used to be an empress in Russia. She laughed, fit to kill. And so did Amy and Louise and Marie. Even Salome laughed at me. Are you upset? Well, nobody likes to be laughed at. Yes, I'm upset. But on the other hand, I'm relieved, too. Bruce, I really don't want to get married. I never thought you did. Everything's so nice here, so free and sort of uninhibited. So peaceful. Leonard, it's Melba. 
You don't mind my calling you at your office, do you? Oh, that's good. How was the new steak place? You didn't go? On account of me, you didn't go? Oh, well, I must say, Leonard... Oh, I, I spent the evening doing various things. Things that really needed to be done. Like, I got all Paul's clothes together and packed them in boxes. Tomorrow, I'll send them to some deserving charity. <laughs> Listen, Leonard... I was thinking, as long as you didn't go to that steak place, why don't you come over here tonight and I'll cook you the best steak you ever tasted. And hash brown potatoes. Would you like that? Oh, good. Well, come early and we'll have a martini first. Well, good for Melba. Good for Leonard. And good for Bruce. And for Paul, too. Good for everybody who faces up to a problem and solves it the best way possible. The solution may not be a perfect one. Solutions seldom are. But at the very least, they are an attempt to use the sense we were born with. And that's all God asks of any of us. I'll be back shortly. You do realize, don't you, that the story I've just brought you was all pure fantasy. I don't know any more than you do what happens to us once we have resigned this terrestrial life, and you know as little as I do. Unless, of course, you are a ghost. Oh, if you are, I wish you'd get in touch with me. I have gobs and gobs of things I'm dying to ask you, like, uh, like, uh, well, well, for one thing, are you happy? Our cast included Lenka Peterson, Elliot Reed, Robert Dryden, and Gordon Gould. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Theater. In Cornwall, they say that to look upon the ghost train means death. If you know Cornwall, then you will know the legend of the phantom train. I remember vividly a winter night three years ago. I was going from London to Truro with Elsie, my wife. I remember the train pulling into that lonely, desolate little station on the moors. It was raining hard as we got out, walked along the platform and came to the waiting room. Okay, okay, thank you, Hello, Come on up here, right here. Hello, okay. Just the kind of place you would bring me to. Bring you? Oh, I like that. It's cold, wet, and disagreeable. It's disagreeable right enough. And a lot you care. Well, perhaps I'm used to it. Thank you. Well, hang it all. It's not my fault, is it? It's that young fool's fault, losing his beastly hat and then pulling the blasted communication cord. But with him, we should have caught the connection all right. There were four other people at Falvale Station that night. They'd all missed the connection for Truro. There was a couple on honeymoon. I remember the girl vividly. She was very pretty. Never mind, darling. But I do mind, Peggy. This is our wedding night, isn't it? Yes. We don't want to hang about here. They wonder what's happened at the hotel if we don't turn up. I hope they won't think you funked it and changed your mind. I'm hungry and you're tired, and we both want to get to our hotel. Then there was Miss Bourne. She was about 50, and a spinster. Oh, the birds. I beg your pardon. This is the waiting room, I suppose. I be. I beg your pardon, both of you. Oh, uh, not, not at all. What a horrible smell of smoke. <coughs> the other passenger was Teddy Deakin. He looked as if he'd escaped from a, a P.G. Woodhouse novel. Yes, he, he talked that way, too. Oh, good, a fight. Now, uh, seconds out of the ring, round one. Tingling. Uh, be silent, sir. Uh, oh, sorry. Then there was Saul. 
the local station master and general factotum. He was a harsh, bearded Cornishman. I asked him if there was any place where we could stay the night. There be no houses round here. There be a farm about five miles on the road. But surely you live somewhere. I bicycle to Truro. Truro? Well, ladies and gentlemen, it looks as if we should have to stay here till morning. Where's that silly fool that stopped our train? There be another gentleman outside. Let's hope he stops there. He ought to be summoned or something. Why couldn't he leave the communication cord alone? Yes, my opinion is, sir. Come in, it's drier. Stupid oh, fool. No, no, I don't know if he's his fault. I say, I think, here, what, what, what a topping place. Well, here we all are, then. I say, what, what were you doing? Having an argument? No, we were all perfectly unanimous on the subject under discussion. Oh, remarkable. Yes. Oh, it's fashion. Young man, you have no sense of responsibility. I don't care, you're not peeved with me, are you? I am. Your lack of concern is monstrous, considering you are the direct cause of this most unpleasant situation. My good woman. I am not a good woman. I, I, I mean, please do not address me with such unwarranted familiarity. Oh, sorry, but I don't care, you must be fair. How can I help my hat blowing off? Losing your hat was no excuse for pulling the communication cord. Well, it was a jolly nice hat. I, I only bought it last week. Besides, I always wanted to pull a communication cord. Yes, well, you chose a fine time to do it. Here we are, and here we've got to stay. Beg pardon, sir, but you can't stay here. What the devil do you mean? There's not been no traffic on the line. Everything shuts up for the night. Signal boxes, station and all. And I'm off home. You're what? Before I go, I has to lock all this year up. But you can't lock up. Them's my orders, and i got to obey them. Oh, don't be so damned silly. Where, where, where else can we go? You know, there ain't no affair of mine. All I knows is that orders is orders. You might go to the farm. Do you expect these ladies to walk five miles along a country road on a night like this? You can't stop here. Who's going to stop us? I be. What are you going to do? Throw us out? Well, I suppose I shall have to. All right, well, you better start on me. Well, now, look here, sir. Don't you lay hands on me. No, I'm not going to. I thought you were going to lay your hands on me. Well, we're going to stay, so you better make the best of it. We'll see that you don't get into any trouble. Here. Take this. Well, sir, I don't know. Now, everything's all right, isn't it? Well, sir, I don't know. I suppose I haven't got no choice. That's better. Now, let's see what we can do to make these ladies comfortable. This is a pretty lousy fire. There'll be a fire here in the ticket office. I don't know if that'd be any better. Let's go and see, Peggy. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, I'm coming, too. Uh, come along, madam. Well, what do you think of this, Elsie? Not much. You should be in your element, though. I don't follow you. Doesn't it give you a splendid chance to domineer everyone? Already you've threatened to fight the station master and lost your temper. You must be enjoying yourself. Look, Elsie, must we go on quarrelling like this? Can't we just forget it? I can't forget what you said to me this morning, if that's what you mean. It's no use going over it all again. We don't get on and we never shall. Directly we get away from here, I shall go back to London. You must arrange for a separation. But it seems such a pity. Did you suggest a separation or did I? No, I did, but... Very well, though. Well, I was in a temper at the time. We were both in a temper. I beg your pardon, but I never lose my temper. Oh, oh what's the use of arguing? Elsie, for the last time, let's forget it. No, Dick, I've made up my mind. I'm going into the other room. Oh, I beg your pardon. Not at all. Well, this is a bit of a mess, isn't it? We shall have to put it up with it until the morning. It's not so bad for you. You've been mad at some time. Yes. Yes, that makes things easier. Yes, I suppose it does. We... we were only mad at today. Only, for heaven's sake, don't tell the others. <laughs> no, 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 of course not. It's a wonderful thing to be mad at, isn't it? To have someone to stand by you in every difficulty. Well, you will find that out for yourself. Here I am, dear. Did you manage to get a wash? Yes, I found a piece of soap and a towel after all. Peggy, this is Mr... Winthrop, Richard Winthrop. Oh, how do you do? How do you do? Oh, please don't let me drive you away. No, not at all. I, there's something I, I, I must say to my wife. Seems a nice chap. Yes. Darling, I'm sorry about all this. It can't be helped, darling. I know, but to start our honeymoon like this... If we were always going to be together, it wouldn't be so bad. If only you could come with me. I'm willing to. You know that. No, I, I couldn't even raise the passage money. Oh, don't worry, darling. Everything will sort itself out. Darling. Mm. All change, all oh. change. Oh, sorry. Don't mention it. We're beginning to get quite used to you. Oh, good. Somebody likes me. I was never at a worse managed station in my life. I shall most certainly write to the company. I do wish you would, ma'am. I've written scores of times about the conditions here. What's the trouble? Well, the rain's coming in through the roof in there. 
We've had to clear out. I'm hungry. Oh, yes. Is there anything edible here? Eh? Is there anything edible here? Not a drop, sir. Except water, and one hardly counts that. Good gracious, I don't know what my poor parrot will think of it. He's sleeping beautifully. <laughs> pretty Polly, pretty Polly. I think we'd better draw up the forms to the fire and make ourselves comfortable as we can. Yeah, good idea. <clears throat> hello, hello, what's this on the floor? By Joe, it's confetti. Oh, jolly good, jolly good. Now, uh, which one of you is it? Uh, you, madam? Certainly not. Well, seeing as though you all settled to stay here, I'll be off home. Look here, I wish you'd stay. We, we, we might want something. But me stay at Falvale Station all night. Well, that was the idea. See here. Haven't you never heard tell about this year's station? No. Never even knew it was here. Well, what about it? It's haunted, miss. Haunted? Yes. Oh, gracious. By two bits of stuff. Oh, station haunted. Oh, jolly good, jolly good. Ha, ha. You may laugh, sir. Uh, oh, may I think we're about Ha, ha, yes. Maybe you'll laugh the other side of your face before morning. Not for a five pound note would I stay in this station. Tonight of all nights. Yes, but you're not afraid to stay with us, are you? I don't know. You've never heard tell on it. No. What is this story? You might tell us what to expect before you go. Yes. Come on, yes. What's yes. the mystery? Yes. Very well, then. I'll, I'll do it. Although I warn you, it ain't no pretty story, and I'd rather be going home. It's like this year. Twenty years ago, this very night, a man by the name of Ted Holmes used to be in charge of this year's station. Did you notice a bridge just down below? Yes, I did. That'd be a bridge over the River Ross. It'd be a swing bridge. It used to be worked by a lever out here on this very platform. In them days, quite big boats did come up the river after the China clay. Them don't come now. Well, 20 years ago this very night, there were a party of people went to a bean feast up to Truro, and they chartered a special going to take them back over St. Bland's down the line. That was the only night train as ever ran on these lines. It must have been 11 o'clock when they phones down from Truro to shut the bridge as the special would soon be starting off. Ted answers that we will and shut the bridge that moment. And them were the last words he would ever heard to speak. What happened? As I was saying, Ted answers that we will go out and shut the bridge that moment, just at 11 o'clock. He goes to the door, and there it was that illness comes to him, and he falls down there on the platform, just outside that very door, Dan. Well, that made the worst of it, not near the worst it made. As I was saying, just at 11 o'clock, Ted Holmes falls down dead. And after it were all over, outside that very door, they finds him, the lamp still burning in his hand. On comes the train down the valley to Fairlick, everyone being anxious to get home. On she comes at 60 mile an hour, I reckon. Poor Ben Isaacs were driving. And it did seem as though, when he were just about the station here, something did warn him. What were the powers above alone, no. But he claps on his brakes, and the train goes up tearing through the station here, all the brakes on, the whistle screaming, and then... Crash. Were there many killed? Six killed outright, and two died afterwards. With some miracle, poor Ben Isaacs was thrown clear. He climbs up out of the water and comes back here to this station, his mind clean gone. And they say he walked the platform here for hours, waving a red lamp and singing Rock of Ages. Next morning he died. It was a merciful release. Six bodies they brought up out of the mud and laid out here in this very room. What a horrible story. Oh, well, I warned it wasn't no pretty tale he was making me tell. Yes, but... Where does the haunting come in? Oh, maybe I said enough. The ladies be getting scared. Oh, not a bit. It was horrible, no doubt, but I don't see how it can frighten us. Please go on. Ever since that night, this station has been haunted. Who oh, by? Ted Holmes? More than that, some nights the signal bell rings and a train comes a screaming and a tearing through the station here with all the brakes on and the whistles are blowing. Nonsense. Tis God's truth, I'm telling you, sir. I expected some freight train that started this yarn. I tell you, there ain't no trains run down these metals, not from ten at night till seven in the morning. Hmm. You don't believe me, sir. You Cornish are superstitious, you know. Folks in these parts run like mad they hear a train in the night. They do say to look upon the ghost train do mean death. Oh, that's rubbish. Bite a bit, sir. Bite a bit. 
Two months ago, a tramp breaks into this your waiting room one night, and next morning they find him here dead. Oh, I, I think it's all marvelous. I, I like the whole thing. I, I've never heard anything so funny in all my life. Funny? Yeah, well, you don't expect us to believe in you. I do, sir. Well, then you're, you're bigger loud than I am. And I, I, I thought I was a big one. Uh, you know, that, that reminds me of a story I heard once about a, a haunted police station, or, or, or fire station, or, well, uh, some sort of station in London. Or, or was it Manchester? Oh, no, no, I, I, I believe it was Liverpool, yes. Well, uh, there, 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 was a, there was a man there, and, and one day he saw an old lady, all, all dressed up in black satin, uh, 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 sitting on a, a, a seat. Uh, and then she disappeared. He, he went round the corner, and, and there she was again. And he, and he said something to her, and he said, uh, I, uh, oh, well, I, I can't remember what he said, but, but I know it's terribly funny. I think it's the funniest thing I've ever heard. Yes. So you will make game of me, sir. Oh, I, I should, uh, don't get angry, old boy. But look here, really, man to man, you know, it's rather a tall story. I, I have never heard anything like it. This is the last time I shall ever travel on this line. I have never heard anything so mismanaged. Isn't there any proper system of signalling? It's only a single track, ma'am. And back when the accident happened, the line was only just open. Things is different now, and the swing bridge is never open. Well, here, what's that uh, lever on the platform for, then? That works the points of the siding which runs up the hill to the old tin mine. Only a matter of hundred yards. Well, Station Master, your story's been very entertaining. I'm sorry I can't believe it all, but... Look! Oh, really? oh. What's the matter? I thought I saw someone looking in through the window. I'll go and see. I'll come with you. Your imagination, I expect. No, I saw it quite distinctly. This is really a most unpleasant station. Oh, there's no one about. Not a sign. Oh. Well, one of the old boy's ghosts, perhaps. Shut up, you fool. Sorry. Must have been your imagination, Peggy. Well, that's the worst of ghost stories, Mrs. Murdoch. They're apt to make the best of us jumpy. Look, can't you get us some coal, Station Master? This fire's the limit. Sorry, sir, but there's very little coal left. I'll see what there is. It's really dreadfully damp and cold. I'm sure my poor parrot will take a chill. Well, here, cheer up, people. It might be worse. This is all very well for you, young man. You have landed us in this most unpleasant situation. And instead of expressing regret, all you can do is to make fun of us. I will not stay in the same room with you. Oh! Oh! What's the matter, Miss Bourne? Oh, I'm sure I saw something move in there. Oh, dear. There's nothing there. There's only a sack of potatoes on the floor. And I hate potatoes. Oh, dear. Dear me. Oh, it's all right. Really, it is. Well, I'm going. And look here, I it's say... No good, sir. Not a bit of good. I won't stay here no longer. Not for a hundred pound, I won't. I know too much about this station. Can't you see you're frightening the ladies? It's been my fault, sir. I warned you when you first came that Falvale Station was no pleasant place to pass the night. If you take some my advice, you'll set out for the farm even now. We'll be back here at seven to see you out of the train. And you take my advice, keep in here. And if you do hear a train in the night, for God's sake, don't go running out to look at them. Look here, stop talking like an old woman. If you believe in your ghost train, well and good. We don't. Understand? Right. Good night, Joe. Good night. Good night. Uh, a pleasant ride. And I hope you probably will get soaked. Thank you, sir. Good night to you, sir. Well, he's a cheery old soul. Well, now we must make arrangements for the night. The ladies are better sleeping here. It's drier than the ticket office. I'm sure I shall never sleep anywhere. Come on, give me a hand with this table. Somebody may be able to sleep on this. Blast. We never told that chap to bring us any food when he comes back. He may think of it. I doubt it. Yes, so do I. He's a very unobliging man. I shall report him to the company. Oh, what's that? Just a minute. Come on, Winthrop. Oh, God. It's the station master. Is he ill? There's blood on his face. Oh, dear, oh, dear. He can't be. <gasps> what is it? Look, look. What? The lamp in his hand. Well? Don't you remember? Outside the door, the lamp still burning in his hand. <gasps> Charles, what's the time? It's eleven o'clock. What have you done with him? Well, I brought it in mixed with potatoes and the ticket off. Shut up, you fool. Now, ladies, this is a nasty business, I know. And it's given us a bit of a shock. But we must try not to take things too seriously. Can't we go away somewhere? Now, there's nothing to be afraid of now. We've put that poor fellow in the other room and locked the door. Now, let's try and forget all about it. 
forget, oh dear. Well, we must be sensible. After all, people do die suddenly sometimes, and we have the consolation of knowing that he was spared any pain. Then you don't think his death had anything to do with the story he told? My dear lady, you can dismiss it from your mind. Life's full of coincidences. Oh, it was a rather strange one, wasn't it? It's just what he said happened, and every detail. Shut up, you idiot. Yeah, well, that's all we're all refined, though, but I, I'm entitled to my opinion, the same as anybody else. You aren't entitled to frighten people. Well, there's no such idea in my head. I, I was only thinking of a story I heard once of some people who spent the night in a haunted mill, and, and just as the clock was striking midnight, the... Uh, oh, came all right, that's enough. Yeah, well, don't get chirty about it. After all, I, I don't believe in ghosts myself. But still, on the other hand, I, those people who spent the night in the haunted mill, uh, they, they were simply horrible, and they... Shut came, up! Oh, very well, I, I, I shan't tell you my story at all now. I feel perfectly sure there's some terrible supernatural force at work. Oh, nonsense. That's what you said before. And yet look what happened. Pure coincidence. It's no good worrying about it, Miss Bourne. Then there was the face at the window. Oh, that might have been my imagination. But it might not. I'm perfectly sure I saw something move in the other room. Oh, dear, oh, dear. What shall we do? We must pull ourselves together. That's what we must do. Yes, of course. Suppose that train should come. What should we do? What train? Why, the ghost train that he spoke of. Why, do you hear, if, if the ghost train does come, I suggest we stop it and try and get a lift. Yes. What's up? I could have sworn I heard a step outside. It isn't like you to be jumpy, Peggy. I'm absolutely certain, Charles. Well, we'll soon settle that. No one about. Oh, do shut the door. I'm sure something will get in at us. Oh, dear, oh, dear, why ever did I leave my poor sister? Oh, oh come oh. now, Miss Bourne. There's nothing to be frightened about. Oh, there's no really. danger, Miss Bourne. You're all right. Oh, I feel so ill. I'm sure I'm going to faint. Oh, oh, dear, Miss Bourne. Bourne. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I, I just had a brainwave. Uh, oh, what is it? I, I, I've got a, a flask of brandy. Brandy, the very thing. Now, come along, Miss Bourne. Here, have some of this. Oh, dear, no. I'm a strict teetotaler. Oh, but this is different, Miss Bourne. You should have a little, just as a medicine. No, no, certainly not. What would the vicar say? He'd say that you behave very sensibly. Do you really think so? Absolutely certain. Then just the spot. <laughs> That's right. Uh, uh, dear me, it's hardly as nasty as I had imagined. Come along, have a little more. Do you think I ought? Oh, yes, certainly. But just a sip. <laughs> <laughs> I say, mm -hmm. well, couldn't we all do a crossword puzzle? Oh, shut, shut up. up. Okay, you've got rather a down on me, haven't you? Not at all. Ah, oh, well, are you feeling better now, Miss Bourne? I think I do feel a little better. Good, I thought that would revive you. Here's your flask back. I say, good Lord. What's up now? Well, look at my flask. It's empty. Well? Well, it's full just now. Full to the brim. <laughs> oh, well, it won't do her any harm. Well, it won't do me any good. Wonderful medicine. Do you know, it's a strange thing. But in spite of all these terrible happenings, I'm beginning to feel quite happy. <laughs> oh, Lord. I say, is she? Miss Bourne, wouldn't you like to lie down? Lie down? Why? We thought perhaps you'd be more comfortable. Extraordinary good medicine. Shall most certainly recommend it to the vicar. <laughs> Made me feel quite sleepy. Just the thing for the vicar. He suffers dreadfully from insolence. Now, come along, Miss Bourne. Come along. You can't sit on the floor. And why not? But because it's too hard for you. How do you know? Now, come along, Miss Bourne. No, no, I won't. And why not? Uh, because I want to be queen of the bay. Come along. Come along. Come along. Come along. Come along. Come along. Now, you get. Now, you get. you lie down on that table? But why on the table? I have beautiful beds in every room in my house. Beautiful beds with knobs on. And I have a roll of carpet that goes right down the way up the stairs until you come to the bathroom landing. And there you meet linoleum. Come along, Mrs. Bourne. Miss Bourne, if you please. I'm a spinster. I'm sorry. And so am I. But let me tell you, my bonny blue-eyed boy, that I was not neglected in my youth. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, take my uh, arm, Miss Bourne. Bourne. Oh. 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 Better now, Elsie? I wasn't aware that I was ill. Well, I mean, just now. Well? When we found that fellow dead, I... Well, I, I was anxious about you. You seem quite hysterical. I lost my head for a moment. That was all. 
It's rather funny about Miss Bourne getting scrippy so quickly. Well, she emptied the flask. She's gone to sleep. She probably won't wake up until it's light. Well, it's damned hard luck on me. I, I didn't reckon on her knocking back the whole issue. Wait a bit. I just thought of something. Well? There must be a telephone here somewhere connecting with the other stations. Oh, no good. They're all shut up. I've, I've been trying for the last ten minutes. Of course, they would be. I forgot that. Who the devil? Oh, tell me. Has it come? I beg your pardon. Has it come? I'm afraid I don't quite follow you. But you know, you must know. I'm afraid we don't. Now, what you... I want you to help me. Will you help me? Well, of course, but what exactly is the matter? Hide me from them. Hide me, please. But, but hide you from whom? From them. Yes, but, but who are they? You must help me. Don't let them take me back. I can't go back. I can't. There they are. Oh, what shall I do? They'll find me. They'll take me back again. They'll help me. It's all right. We won't let anyone hurt you. They'd let me hide. In there. No, no, not in there. Well, where can I go? Julia. Julia. They're coming, I tell you. Oh, it's all right. It's not all right. Here, get behind the door. Hello? Who the devil are you people? Yes, that's what I was going to ask you. We've come here on a very urgent matter. And we're here purely by the force of circumstance. Oh? I suppose you're surprised to find us here at this time of the night. Very. We're most certainly not here by choice. We lost a connection and had to wait here until the next train. But there isn't any next train. Exactly. You know what this place is. Who is Waldo? This is Fell Vale Station. Yes. Well, and now perhaps you'll give us some explanation of your, your own somewhat unexpected entrance. Oh, yes, yes. My name's Price. This is Dr. Sterling. We're looking for my sister. Your sister? Yes. Have you seen a young lady about here? We have every reason to believe that she would come to this place. I see, then she's run away from you. In a way, yes. Have you seen her? Why should she run away? Why should she come here? That is not a matter that I wish to discuss with strangers. Very well. In that case, I'm afraid we can't help you. She's here somewhere, Price, I know that. Look in the other room. Oh, very well. Stop! You can't go in there. Oh, and why not, sir? Because... because... there's something we must explain. Ah, so she is in there. No. I'm sorry, but I don't believe you. You're doing a very foolish thing to interfere in this matter. She's not there. I give you my word. It's not good enough. Yeah, I mean to get to the bottom of this. Look behind that door, Sterling. Hello. Ah, so there you are, Julia. It's no good. I can't come back. You know I can't. Well, come along, Julia. Let's get out of here while the rain holds. No, up. no, I can't. Now, be sensible, oh, Julia. What's the use of talking? I must stay here. I can't help myself. That's enough of this. It's no good. Don't touch me. Go away! But damn it all! Easy, Price. Leave her to me. Well, if she won't come, we must take her. Excuse me, but this lady has put herself under our protection. Now, who the devil asked you to interfere? Kindly keep out of this. You're not going to take her away against her will. Mind your own business. You'd better explain to them, Price. It's no good trying to ride roughshod in this matter. Now, come, Julia. Let's sit down by the fire. Very well. Now then, listen to me, please. You people have heard the story about this place, I suppose? We've well, heard the ghost story. All about this station being haunted, if that's the one you mean. Yes. Now, please don't let my sister worry you. She's, um, well, she suffers from, well, uh, delusions at times. What do you mean, she's... No, 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 hardly that. It's all this ghost train business. She was near the station one night several years ago, and, well, she thought she saw the train. I did see it. You know I saw it. I did see it. There, there, Julia. You see, she's Cornish and believes in ghosts. She always has done, ever since she was a kiddie. I sometimes feel there's something psychic about her. Anyway, she thought she saw this ghost train, and it was a great shock to her. So great a shock that it, uh, well, it upset her permanently. She's perfectly well most of the time, but some nights she has this idea that the ghost train will run, and it has a morbid fascination for her. She feels that she must see it again. Now, this is one of her bad nights. Now, I uh, hope you understand. It will come tonight. I know it will. Oh, nonsense, Julia. It's not nonsense. I know it. I feel it. I'm never wrong. That night the tramp died. I felt it then. There you are, you see. Now, don't let it alarm you. How did you get to know this story? Oh, old Saul Hodgkin. Where is he, by the way? Something rather strange has happened here tonight. Something, well, rather unpleasant. We should like you to know about it. Well? Well, the old boy here didn't want us to stay the night. He didn't think it was safe. There, you see. He felt it, too. Yes, he told us the whole story, and then he said he was, he was going home. And he wouldn't stay here? No. I don't blame him. I wouldn't stay here if I could help it. Good, then. Come along, then. But I can't help it. You know I can't. It, it draws me. I, I've got to see it again. I don't want to see it, but I've got to see it. It, it makes me see it. Oh, never mind about that now. Uh, you were saying, sir? He said he was going home. He took his cycle lamp, lit it, and went off. Then we heard a noise, and when we opened the door, he fell inside dead. What? Good God. I knew it. What did I tell you? Now perhaps you believe me. You think there's some 
supernatural force at work. Yes. Why, that's where they found poor Ted Holmes, uh, lying inside uh, the door. Uh, Teddy, Julian. I'm a doctor, ladies and gentlemen. Now, now, where is this poor chap? Let me see him. Well, we carried him into the ticket office. All right, I'll go and examine him. You see, it was a nasty business and gave us a shock. Yes, of course. Well, now, come along, Julia. It's time to be off. No, no, I must stay here. The train won't let me go. But there's a lot of difference between the coincidence of two men falling dead and, and a phantom train. But the death of Ted Holmes was the beginning of it all, 20 years ago tonight. Yeah, I say, what's the joke? Joke? <laughs> It's on us, all right. Although, under the circumstances, it's rather out of place. Where do we laugh? I don't follow you. Didn't you tell us that Saul Hodgkin dropped dead? Yes, we carry him into the ticket office, and why? <laughs> he isn't there now. Not there. I don't appreciate this joke, gentlemen, especially considering Julia's state of health. But we all saw him. I've got it. I've got it. Well, what's the matter? Don't you see it? See what? It was dead home. Well, what the deuce are you driving at? Oh, I'm going, Julia. I'm hanged if I'm going to mess about here all night. Good night, all. Where's he gone? He's gone home. Now, you have a little rest, and then we'll all go. No, no. I, I'm going to stay here. Very well, Julia, just as you like. Oh, it isn't as I like it. It's because I've got to. The place terrifies me. This room's full of eyes. They all stare at me. Stare and stare and stare. Don't look at me like that. You think I'm mad, but I'm not mad. Room is full of evil. Yes, Julia, yes. Now, why not come away from it? Why do you keep saying that? Why are you so cruel? You know I'd come if I could. Why won't any of you help me? We want to help you. No. No, you're just as bad. You're as afraid of the place as I am, but you won't admit it. You blame me. Everything is all right, Julia. I'll stay with you. If this thing happens, you won't say I'm mad anymore, will you? Of course not. Everything considered, I really think it would be better for you people to follow Mr. Price's example and clear out. It's only about five miles to the farm and five and a half to Mr. Price's house. I think it would be better to risk a wedding than, well, to bring on any further unpleasant experiences. Murdoch, what do you think, Pegs? Just as you like. I'm not afraid when I'm with you. How about you, Elsie? I think it would be better to go. I'm not nervous, of course, but this room is very uncomfortable. Very well, we'll go. Yeah, but I think uh, just one fleeting moment. Well, uh, uh, how about Miss Bourne? By Jove, yes. Who's there? Uh, this lady is uh, is one of our party. Isn't she well? Well, hardly. She couldn't walk five miles at the best of times. What's the matter with her? Well, it's like this, Doctor. She became rather faint, and uh, we persuaded her into taking a little brandy. She put away the lot at one fell swoop, and <laughs> well, now she's passed out. It, it puts us in rather a quandary. Then leave the lady with us. Yes, look, I've I a very good idea. I have. Uh, uh, listen, uh, now, it, it's raining again, and I'm not going to walk five miles to the rotten rain for any goes. Uh, I'll, I'll stay here as well and help you look after Miss Bourne. I, 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 I think she rather likes me. At least she ought to after swilling all my brandy. Uh, no, you go with the others. Oh, no, no, not a bit of it. No, no, I... Well, I think we'd better all stay. What do you say, Elsie? I'm not afraid. All right, that's settled then. We stay. In my opinion, you're very unwise. Oh, not at all. I, I think this, this fair is, is jolly sporty. Very well, if you've made up your mind. Yeah, oh, well, by the way, that, that reminds me of, of, of all those people who know, spent the night in the haunted mill. Uh, they hadn't been in the place for more than half an hour, and they suddenly heard a Yes, most... yes. What uh, did well, they hear? Uh, they, they heard a most extraordinary... Uh, look here, once and for all, we don't want to hear that story. Well, it's quite a clean story. Oh. It would be much better to take the ladies away. They say that when it comes, you hear the signal bell ringing dismally, frightfully. I wonder if the bell will ring tonight. Perhaps. I was thinking, this is the room where they brought all those dead people. Now, 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 steady, Julia. Look, look, don't you see it? There, by the ticket office. What? Look, there's Ted Holmes again, coming out of the office. The lamp in his hand, don't you see him? He's crossing to the door. Look, he's opening the door. He's going out onto the platform. Good Lord. It's all right, it's only the wind. Oh, this is very queer. Now, huh? come along, Julia. Let's go into the other room. If you open that door, you'll find him there again. Come on. Dick, shall we go to? Well, I suppose we may as well. Oh, I'm frightened. Darling, I'd have given anything in the world to have spared you a night like this. It's not your fault, darling. I wonder if that poor girl was right. I say, well, uh, okay, I, I, I want to speak to you two. I, I, I want to warn you about something. Uh, well, the queer thing is that I, uh, I don't know. 
Uh, but but I, I feel it's my duty to warn them. But what about? Well, I, I've got a sort of presentiment, a, a kind of nasty feeling, you know. I, I, I feel we, we haven't got over the worst of this yet. Nothing like being optimistic. Oh, yes, I know. I, I'm, I'm trying to be, but, but I, I feel pretty sure the worst is to come. Now, I want you to promise me something, will you? That depends. Yes, I, I want you to promise me that if anything unpleasant happens, you'll be guided by me. By you? Yes. Oh, uh, do look surprised. I, I'm not such a fool as I look. I didn't think you could be. Yeah. Oh, yes. Well, as a matter of fact, I, I think I'm, I'm rather a cute sort of fellow, I am. Uh, I, I, I want you to back me up. What are you going to do? Ah. Oh, that's a funny part. I haven't the slightest idea. This is no time for trying to be funny. Oh, no, I'm not. I, I'm deadly serious. Now, now, give me your hand. Why? Well, I, I want you... I want you to keep this. Now, don't show it to anybody. Put it in your pocket. Now, do you understand? No, I don't. No, of course not. No, neither do I. Oh, very funny, isn't it? Yes. Uh, here, I, here, what's that? Here, here. Oh, what was that? That poor girl moaning in the other room. Oh, Bill, it's come. It's all right, Julia. It's all over now. Oh, all right hasn't even started. I don't want to frighten you people, but I know what's going to happen. And it's going to happen soon, just as it all happened before. The whistle, the scream of bricks, the shriek of the whistle, louder, 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 so loud that the noise nearly kills one. It's awful. Awful, and I have to see it again. And if I see it again, I may die. Then come away. No, no, it won't let me. It keeps me here. Why don't you all go away and leave me? Because we're not frightened. Then that makes it all more dangerous. Why won't you take my advice? You think I'm mad, but I'm not mad. When the train comes... The train can't come. Oh, and it came that night, thundering down the valley, and then the brakes jammed on, jarring, tearing. If the train comes, I'll believe the yard. The tearing of the brakes, grinding and rasping, the shriek of the whistle, the dead man lying on the platform, and the roar getting louder and louder, and then into the river below, crash. Don't you hear it? Why don't you go? There's still time. We can't go now. Then for God's sake, stop your ears. Don't look at it. Oh, the train won't come. It's not possible. Now will you believe me? The signal bell. It always rings. What's the time? One minute to twelve. What was that? Hey? I thought I heard a whistle. It's coming. It's coming. No, it's your imagination, I expect. No, no, I'm sure I heard a whistle. Well, let's go and see. No, no, stop. By God, she's right. What? The train, don't you hear it? Yes, yes, I knew it. It's coming. It's Coming! Steady, darling. Thundering down the valley. It's coming. On, on, on. I'm going to see it. By Joe's door stuck. Yes, it's bolted or fastened somehow. This one's locked too. God, we're shut in. Oh, listen to it. Listen to it. I've got to see it. I must see it. I must. Hold her, someone. Let me go. Look Let out. me go. Oh, I'm going to see it. How is she, Doctor? Mm, it's difficult to say. Ah, flux, eh? Yes, I don't mind owning it. You're sure she's not dead? Oh, no, she's not dead. Her heartbeat is faint and yet pretty steady. Okay, haven't you got one of those, uh, uh, what you call them, uh, uh, you know what I mean, uh, those listening in things? Stethoscope, you mean? Yes, that's it. I've none of my instruments with me, but that's the devil of it all. And you don't know what's the matter with the Doctor? I don't. She's had these strange turns before, but they've never ended like this. I can't understand it. The train did come right enough. We can't get away from that. And then there's Miss Price. What sent her off like that? Well, don't you remember? She said she saw it. She said, I saw the driver and he was... And then she fell. Of course, that bears out the story of the ghost train. Everyone who sees it dies. Yeah, but my dear, who thinks she's not there? Not yet. Then you think? You can't tell. She's very ill. Oh, it's all terrible. You won't leave me, Dick. I should die if you went away. I won't leave you, Elsie. Don't be afraid. You be a fool, Dick. Such a fool. Never mind that now. But I do mind, darling. I mind terribly. It's jolly queer about this lady. If she hadn't been taken ill, she'd have told us something about the train. Yes, uh, she, she was telling us, and it seems as if this train doesn't like being looked at. Oh, no good puzzling about this business, ladies and gentlemen. We're up against something too big for us. You really think that... I see no other explanation. When I came here tonight, I thought the legend about this place just a silly local yarn. One must take the facts into consideration, though, and they can't be explained away. If it was old Saul you found outside the door, how did his body get out of the ticket office? There's no window but the skylight. If only she told us something before she fell. I say, look, she's coming round. By Jove, you're right. <laughs> better? Hello. Oh, that's splendid. She's better. 
Yes, I think so. What am I doing here? It's all right. You fainted or something. You're better now. Oh, my head. I don't seem to be able to remember anything. Oh, yes, I do. It was the train. I thought it would come tonight. Oh, I, uh, I have these bad turns sometimes. I'm, I'm sorry, but I can see now how silly I've been. I ought to have known there was nothing in this ghost business. What do you mean, nothing in this ghost business? I ought not to have given away and frightened you. The train won't come. But the train did come. Please don't try to frighten me. What do you mean? Now, this is the important point, Julia. Who was the driver? The driver? Yes. I don't know. What was it you saw? Oh, can't you see I'm not well? I, I think it's cruel of you to make a fool of me like this. It's cruel, cruel. You know I'm highly strung and nervous and that you do this to me. No one's trying to make a fool of you. There's no joke. Then the train did come. Yes. And none of you saw it? Only you. The doors were fastened. We couldn't get out. That's, that's, uh, that's why we can't get out now. Yeah, I think this is jolly thrilling. Oh, it's mm. awful. What can we do? What can we do? We must all get away from here if we can. If only we'd gone with Price. Well, I wish to goodness we had. Oh, listen, listen. There's someone outside. By Jove, so there is. Wait a minute. What's up? Have you forgotten the rest of the story? I, I, I don't quite get you. What do you think that is out there? Someone who opened the beastly door, I hope. Suppose it's Ben Isaacs. Yes, by Jove, but uh, who the devil's he? Haven't you heard the rest of the story? How Ben Isaacs, the driver, went mad? Listen. Who's there? Come in. Don't let it in. Don't let it. We must get to the bottom of this. I'll settle it. I'll break the door down. No, 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 don't let it in, don't! Oh, all right. It's gone, whatever it is. Thank God for that. If it had been a man, he would have answered. How many times did he knock? Six. Oh. Well? I've just remembered something. There were six knockings at the door. And the old station master said there were six people killed. Yes. Six dead bodies they brought up from the mud and laid out in this very room. Julia. I don't think that's got anything to do with it. We've no proof of it. We've no proof of anything, for that matter. That's true enough. It is Ben Isaacs out there. Yes, yes, yes. This is awful. What can we do? I can't stand it. I can't. Steady, I can't. Steady, Elsie. I can't stand any more of it. I can't I tell you. It's stopped now. Yes, he's gone away. Suppose he got in. What can we do? Come along, Elsie. Try and pull yourself together. Whatever it is, it can't hurt us. Ah! He's trying to get in. Something must be done or these women will go mad. Yes, I agree. I don't care. Now, shut up. You'll only make things worse. Well, there's nothing to get excited about. Oh, no? What do you suggest? Do you feel well enough to walk, Julia? Yes, I think so. I'll, I'll do anything if I need to get away. Then you'll go now? Yes. Then let's get out of here as soon as possible. Where can we go? Anywhere. But what about Miss Paul? Well, we must rouse her up. At the worst, we can carry her. Yeah, but I say my, my dear thinks you've forgotten something. Eh? Hey? What's that? Oh, we're fastened in, aren't we? Oh, we, we jolly well can't get out. And if we break down the door, we shall let that chap in outside. Yes, don't open the door, whatever you do. Now, look here. If it's a man outside, it's quite safe. We're oh, four to one. Oh, Dick. If it's not a man... Oh, Dick! Well, if it's not a man, no locked door will keep it out. Do you follow me? Yes, I suppose you're right. Right. Let's have another try. They're fast still, both of them. We'll break this one down. Wait! There it is again! We can't go out there! We can't! We shall have to face it. It's madness if we stay here. Something's the matter with the lights. Put off! They're going out! No! 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 Some devil's work here! Let's go! Let's go! Dick! Dick, where are you? I can't see you, Joan. I'm here, darling. <laughs> Something touched me. Something cold. Are you all right? I think so. Ah, oh, Peggy, thank goodness. Someone switched them on again. Look, the doors are open. Oh, Come along, let's clear out. Wait a minute. No, no, we won't wait a moment. We must go quickly, we must. Now, look here, I want, I want you all to listen to me and take my advice. You're a fine fellow to give advice on anything, aren't you? Yeah, in this case, I am, old chap. Well, what is it? Now, let's all stay here. Stay here? Good Lord, don't listen to the fool. Stay here, indeed? Yes, why not? Well, because we're in great danger. We're up against some devilish thing, and if we, if we stay, God knows what may happen to us. It was different when the doors were fastened. We had no choice in the matter then. Now it's up to us to take the opportunity and bolt. Right, you all go. I'll stay here with Miss Paul. She'll, she'll, she'll be quite all right. She won't wake up till the morning. That brand new mine was free war. But aren't you afraid? My dear lady, I'm nearly scared to follow. Enough of this. You're coming. On the contrary, my dear sir, I'm not. Oh, why not? Because I happen to be a silly, obstinate ass. And when a silly, obstinate ass makes up his silly, obstinate mind, he usually gets his silly, obstinate way. Now, you follow me? Once and for all, you're not going to stay here alone. Ah, you surprise me. What are you going to do about it? Take you by force, if necessary. I don't care. Steady on, Doctor. 
I suppose the fellow has a right to please himself, however great a fool he is. Thank you, God. Out with it, plain to the point. Why have you made up your mind to stay here? Pure custom. One thing. And what else? Idle curiosity. About what? I want to see what happens next. Do you mean to say you risk your life for a reason like that? Oh, quite. Oh, the chap's gone mad. It's our duty to take him away with us. Wait a bit, Doctor. There's more on this than meets the eye. I believe he knows something. Yes, I'm jolly going to wait here and see that train come back. What train? The train that went through an hour ago. It won't come back. Oh, how do you know? This train has a supernatural origin. Has it? Do you doubt it, then? Oh, well, to be perfectly candid, I do. Anyway, I'm going to wait and see. What fools there are. If we waste any more time, it may be too late. God, it is too late. It's Ben Isaacs. Look, blood. Ghost or no ghost, I winged him, and that's it. What have you done? You'll soon see. Listen, the train again. Oh. It's coming back. Oh, yes, yes. It's coming back, all right. But don't worry, I've got this in hand. I've laid one ghost already, and now I'm going to switch that ghost train onto the siding. Stop! Stop! Get back! Up with the hand! Where are you, Murdoch? Here. Remember what I told you? Where's that revolver I gave you? I've got it. Then watch this light until I come back. I've done it. We've got her onto the siding. Look here! It's no good. The game's up. You mean that we've been had? Yes. Then there's no ghost train. That train is as real as the Plymouth Express. I tell you... Get back! But what's their game? We're not sure yet, but we'll soon know. Ah, here we are. What? Why, as our old friend saw. Yes. And he got you with that sham dead trick of his, didn't he? You got them all, Jackson? Yes, sir, I think so. I thought it was you I winged. Hurt too much? You put a bullet through my arm, damn you. Keep your mouth shut. Never fear. But hadn't the doctor better see to his arm? Doctor? What doctor? Dr. Sterling. He's no more a doctor than you are. Didn't you see the way he took Miss Price's pulse with his thumb? Who the devil are you? That's Detective Inspector Morrison of Scotland Yard. Well, I'm damned. Get the train all right, Jackson? Yes, sir. What was he carrying? Just as you bought, sir. Machine guns. Ah. Machine guns? Yes. Gun runners. The train outside is full of machine guns. Thanks for your help, Murdoch. You can prove nothing. Can't I, though? I wasn't sure until tonight, but I made up my mind to get to the bottom of this, especially after you killed Heath. Oh, who's Heath? The tramp they found dead. He was my best assistant. You can tell us all about that. I didn't do it. I didn't do it. No one can prove it. It's their father a bit of it. Wish to God I never touched their dirty money. Shut up. It's all very well for you. You haven't got no wife and children. Twenty-five pound they pay me to run that train from their works to the old granite jetty and bring back their guns and such like. You got the guns all right, Jackson? Yes, sir. Then take them away. Right, sir. Come on, you. I don't see it quite even now. Oh, it's all perfectly clear, Mrs. Winthrop. These people started this clay works here in an out-of-the-way spot to make it a distributing centre for the arms they've smuggled into this country. In the end, I took up the case. I said to Heath to investigate, and he was killed, poor chap. Murdered in this very room. Then is the whole story of the accident made up? Oh, no. The, the accident did happen. And there is a strong local superstition about the ghost train. Most likely that gave them their idea. The great thing was they didn't want anyone in this room tonight because the guns might have been spotted on the train. I see. You mean to say that, that every bit of it was, was a put-up job? Uh, yes, that's what happened uh, tonight. Uh, when Saul found he couldn't get rid of me, he went off to Price's house and told them we were here. Price's house is only, uh, well, a half a mile away, not five. It was all a put-up job, faint and everything. Then why didn't Saul send us off to Price's? Well, good gracious, they, they, they didn't want us uh, there any more than here. This was their busy night. I'm sure you're wrong about one thing. This poor girl is as innocent as I am. Yes, I'm not so sure about her yet. Oh, she's been the dupe of these dreadful men. Yes, yes, you do believe that, don't you? Uh, Jackson, have you got that paper with the names of the gang on? No, sir, it's not on any of them. Have you got it? How did you get out when the doors were locked? You forgot that our mutual friend Saul had a secret way out of this room. I found it. Here, what are you chewing? The paper you're after. She swallowed it. Now go after it. You'll have to dive pretty deep. All gone. All right, take her away, Jackson. Nighty night, kids. Come along, miss. I shall care, we've, uh, we've still got one little trouble left. Miss Bourne. She's waking up. Hello, Miss Bourne. Better? My head aches terribly. <laughs> well, there's a car waiting for all of us. You'll soon be safe in Truro. 
Oh, I'm so glad nothing exciting has happened. Oh, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. From ancient days to the present, mankind has believed in ghosts. Some claim to have seen them, heard them, and even touched them. There never was any question about the terror of such an experience, real or imaginary. Even today, we read in our newspapers about apparitions and spirit messages which have no reasonable explanation. It was such an experience at a lonely inn in Maine that terrified a man of exact science named Professor George Weymouth. You saw what there? A hundred yards offshore. An inverted funnel of water like a shroud, a winding sheet, the garment of the dead. Oh, come now, Colonel Pingree, a shroud? Just the wind whipping a wave crest into an inverted cone. You look as if you'd seen an apparition. Don't tell me you believe in that kind of thing. You said your name was Weymouth. Weymouth? Yes. That could explain it. Our mystery drama... The Five Ghostly Indians was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Roy Windsor and stars Robert Dryden and Court Benson. It is sponsored in part by Anheuser Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser, and Sinoff, the Sinus Medicines. I'll be back shortly with Act One. As we approach our country's bicentennial, we think proudly of 1776 and our independence. But what about the first people to live in America, the Indians? Long before we became independent, we had taken away their independence. Someone wrote, the Pilgrim Fathers landed on the shores of America and fell upon their knees. Then they fell upon the Aborigines. An Englishman exploring the coast of Maine in the year 1605 captured and killed five Indians, and the bad relationship began. His name was George Weymouth, and this is the story of what happened to his present-day namesake. Uh, that is, uh, yeah, look at this. An Indian arrowhead. Hello there! What? Oh! Oh, hello! Yeah. Heard you'd arrived at White Pines. Uh, my name's Pingree. Colonel Caleb Pingree. How do you do, Colonel? George Weymouth. And you don't mind me butting in this way? If you do, say so, and I'll finish my walk up the beach. Oh, certainly not. I was just about to walk back to the inn. It's growing dark, and I'm chilled. Ah, yeah. oh, that's a cold-looking ocean. Ooh, forbidding. Well... Come along. We'll have a cup of tea in front of the fire in the lodge. That sounds inviting. Oh, uh, look here. Just before you hailed me, look what I found. This is an Indian arrowhead among the rocks. Well, that's unusual. It is a design on it. Here, let me rub off more of the moss. It's heavily encrusted. Must have been here for hundreds of years. Good. Drums. I beg your pardon? Drums. 
Indian drums. Hear them? Drums? What are you talking about? I don't hear anything. Uh, here, any idea what this design means, Colonel? Huh. Well, they're gone. They're gone. What? You didn't hear the Indian drums? No. When you rubbed the arrowhead, I distinctly heard drums. When you handed it to me, the drums stopped. Yes, well, let's not worry about them. Yeah, take a look at that design, Colonel. Hmm. A diamond figure enclosing another diamond figure. Oh, that is very unusual. It means medicine man. Why unusual? Because a tribe's medicine man hardly ever went into battle. He was called a shaman and had great authority because of his special guardian functions. That's why he became known to us as a medicine man. Well, you've made a remarkable discovery. Here you are. It's quite beautiful, isn't it? Good heavens. Well, what is it? Quite. The drums. And look! Look out there, about a hundred yards offshore. See it? See what? I see white caps as far as I can see, nothing more. And drums? You're hearing things, girl. Look there! Follow where I'm pointing! See that inverted funnel of water? It's like a shroud. Don't you see it? I really don't. May I have the arrowhead? Yes, of course. Well, the drums have stopped. And that funnel of water is gone. <laughs> You're a romantic, Colonel. Yes. Do you know what I'd do with that arrowhead if I were you? I'd throw it in the ocean. I certainly won't do that. You said it was unusual. My young daughter will treasure it as a wonderful souvenir. You're not pulling my leg, are you, Colonel? I assure you, I am not. What did you say your name was? Weymouth? Yes. George Weymouth. I'm an assistant professor of zoology. Weymouth? Yes, yes, yes. That could explain it. Explain what? Do you know anything about the history of your surname? No, not too much. There have been Weymouths here since the Revolutionary War. General Tad Weymouth. The name goes further back than that, Professor. I think I'd better tell you about it. <laughs> nonsense out of your mind, Boggs. What nonsense? I saw them, and I heard the drums. Yeah. I'll mention it to Colonel Pingree. Maybe he can explain it. <laughs> You're two of a kind, you and that old daydreamer. Don't know how you stand listening to his same old stories over and over again. You'd think he had the second sight. Well, some folks do, Meg. Uh-huh. And well, then ask him when he comes in from his walk where the Faradays are. Should have been here by now. It's after six. Well, got lost, most likely. It's easy to make the wrong turn off at Bath and end up at Booth Bay Harbor. Well, I gave her very careful instructions. Seemed a nice young woman. They're staying a week. Well, we can use the money. Summer wasn't so bad, Fox. And after they leave, they'll be just us and the cats. Yeah. I'll miss Colonel Pingree. <laughs> Don't see why. With that second sight, the two of you got, you can keep tabs on each other all winter. Drums. Uh, I tell you, Meg, as sure as I'm standing here, I heard them, and I saw what I saw. Five Indian braves dancing around a boiling pot and dipping their arrows into it? Yeah, that's what I saw on that side road, coming back to Phippsburg from Poppin Beach. The drums were rolling, and there they were... Right in the middle of the road, heads down and dancing in a circle. Oh, lucky you didn't run them over. Well, I'd best be getting to the kitchen. The colonel and that professor ought to be back soon from the beach. Uh, maybe you'd better build up the fire and offer them some tea when they come in. Uh, what's that professor's name? Weymouth? Why? Hmm. 
Weymouth. Seems to me Oh, I... Boggs, now oh, what? Never mind, I'll speak to the colonel. Well, you keep your ears open for the telephone. If the Faradays did get lost, they'll be calling in. It's almost dark now. And it's hard to find the place. Ah, ah, ah. Oh, oh, it feels good in here, girl. <clears throat> well, the fall will feel better. I won't change my shoes. My sneakers got wet. Hmm. Or shall I order hot tea? Uh, yes, thank you. I'd like a cup good and hot. Uh, uh, evening, Boggs. Evening, Colonel. Ah, that's a grand fire. Yeah, yeah. Mag thought you might like a cup of hot tea. Yeah, the old good wife is absolutely right. Two cups. Professor Weymouth would like some, too. Sure thing. Hey, sit down. I'd like to ask you a question, Boggs. Sure. I got one for you, too. Oh? Well, let me have yours first. You know the side road from Poppin Beach back to Phippsburg, about four miles away? Yes. And I told Mag about what I saw, but there's no talking to her. She just laughs at me and declares I might be a, a little loose in the top story. <laughs> well, I know that your good wife feels the same way about me. Oh, she means no offense, Colonel. No, of course not, of course not. I understand that. Well... After I picked up the lobsters and the clams in Poppin Beach, I drove the old truck back toward Phippsburg. Mm -hmm. Now, about a mile from where I turned off to the White Pines, I heard drums, Indian drums. And I saw, clear as I'm seeing you, five Indians dancing round a boiling pot and dipping their arrows into the stuff, whatever it was. You see. Well, what do you make of that? Well, I heard Indian drums, too, Bugs. I knew I was right. Where did you hear him, Colonel? On the beach, about a half an hour ago. But I saw something else. About a hundred yards offshore, I saw an inverted water spout. Looked like a limp sheet held up by two fingers. A headless ghost. What did it do? Well, when Weymouth handed me the arrowhead, the drum stopped. And the dancing ghost vanished. Arrowhead? Weymouth found an arrowhead among the rocks down by the beach. An arrowhead amongst the rocks? Well, it must have been there for centuries. More than three. I'd say it dates from around 1605. Now, how the deuce do you know that? Weymouth. You're from an old down Easter family. Does the name mean anything to you? Yeah, but just barely. Well, I've been thinking about it ever since Weymouth picked up that arrowhead. It had belonged to a medicine man because it had a design on it, a figure of a diamond within a diamond, probably from the Etchemin tribe. Back in 1605, an Englishman named George Weymouth explored the coast of Maine. For no reason I've ever been able to learn, he brutally murdered five Indians. The chief of the tribe attacked Weymouth's sloop, killed several of his soldiers, and then they were overwhelmed. Yep, it comes back to me now. Yeah. The English killed the medicine man, wrapped him in a sheet, and dropped him into the ocean. And now he's returned. He's returned, and he's called up those five murdered Indians to witness his revenge. You told Professor Weymouth about the curse? I intend to. But he's a professor of zoology, a man of science. He'd laugh at me. Uh, how long is he staying with you? Till the end of the week. Two more days. Hmm. I'll have to tell him to leave tonight. Uh, let me handle him. If he'll give me the medicine man's arrowhead, uh, he won't be threatened, and neither will White Pines. Evening, Colonel. Here's the... Oh, there he is. Here comes the professor. Evening, professor. Hot tea. Just what I need, Miss Boggs. I got chilled down there at the beach. Evening, Miss Boggs. Evening. Uh, thanks for the talk, Colonel. Oh, hey. you two been yarning about those Indian drums and them five dancing Indian oh, braids. Oh, they're, they're, they're real enough, Meg. Now, don't tell me, Colonel, that you still think you heard drums and saw an apparition offshore? Uh, your name is, is Weymouth. 
Over 300 years ago, your ancestor, George Weymouth, cruelly murdered five Indian braves and killed the medicine man of their tribe and buried him at sea. If when you picked up that arrowhead, you triggered the guardian spirits of those Indians and they have been awakened. Indeed. To what purpose? Revenge, Professor Weymouth. <laughs> I... Don't believe it, Colonel. With all due respect to folklore. I didn't expect you to believe it. If Colonel Pingree and the innkeeper Boggs swear that they heard those celestial Indian drums and saw those apparitions, why should we disbelieve them? They are otherwise normal men. Psychic phenomena is not nonsense despite the disbelief of Professor Weymouth, whose name links him with a brutal crime committed over 300 years ago. I'll be back shortly with Act Two. It might be that some down-easters have retained imaginations more lively than our own because our 23rd state, Maine, has a rugged climate, and its people never forget it. In the sparsely settled wilderness, it would be easier to see ghosts of Indians from long ago in the forests, in front of a blazing hearth. Professor Weymouth might scoff at folklore, and so does Mag, the innkeeper's wife, but not Boggs, the innkeeper. He and Colonel Pingree know what they heard and saw. Boggs, what was that talk about an arrowhead? Weymouth found it. That's when the trouble began. Oh, Indian drums, dancing Indians, a ghost on the water. Oh, you and the Colonel, you're some pair. Seven o'clock, still no Faraday's? Yeah, lost, probably. Well, you'd think they'd telephone. Well, I'll serve the Colonel and Professor Weymouth and put the other steamers and lobsters in the icebox. I think I'll go outside and look around a little. Now, you be very careful. Don't want some Indian to scalp you. <laughs> Couldn't run White Pines alone. Now, one of these days, Mag, you'll believe. I'll be back in half an hour or so. Keep an eye out for the Faraday's. Yep, yep, yep. We can eat any time Mag is ready to serve, Boggs. Coming right up, Colonel. Good. Oh, you look concerned, my friend. Nope. Just annoyed. Young couple named Faraday was supposed to arrive at six. I haven't heard a word from him. Well, it's easy enough to get lost on these back roads. Well, I'm going out to look around. We just got that one light out front and they could drive right by. Uh, had any luck, Colonel? I'm still not convinced, Boggs. The arrowhead is mine. I'm reluctant to give it up. It means trouble, Professor. Uh, so you say. But I'm a man of science. Folklore is charming, but I don't believe in it. We know that myths were created to explain certain practices and beliefs. But when reason is applied, they disintegrate. As much as I'd like to believe your story about the Indian drums and the apparition on the sea, I can't. Well, then, Professor, I'll have uh, to... No, no, Boggs, not so fast. Take your stroll and leave this to me. But I... I don't know, please. And I'll say good night to both of you. Good night. Mm. Oh, I offended him. I'm sorry. No, don't worry about it, Weymouth. Hopefully you'll be away from here without incident in a few days. Hopefully? I can understand a simple innkeeper being superstitious, but I can't understand it about you, Colonel. An educated man, well-spoken. Well, well, all I wish you'd accept is that Boggs and I are certain that the Arrowhead is dangerous to you. It's in your own interest to send it to York to be placed with the other Indian relics. Well, perhaps. Come up to my room and we'll take a look at it. Agreed. You're making a wise decision, Weymouth. 
Maybe we'd better turn around, Ben. I'm sure I took the right road out of Bath. We drove through Winnegans and Arasick. We should have telephoned from Arasick to tell them we'd be late. Well, let's keep going. According to the map, Phippsburg ought to be, well, only a few miles from here. You'd never know it. It's like being in a wilderness. I haven't seen a sign for miles. And it's pitch black. <laughs> Scared. Well, it is kind of spooky. Well, there's nothing here to harm you. Let's drive on. If we get to Phippsburg, we'll telephone White Pines. Maybe they'll hold dinner for us. It's after 7, Ben. We ought to be there by 7.30. <sighs> Unless we're on the way to Booth Bay Harbor. I have the arrowhead in my bureau drawer. I'll... Regret giving it up, Colonel? Well, you'll regret it more if you keep it. Ah, here it is. Deadly looking, isn't it? But quite beautiful. Uh, well, good heavens. What's that? A regular gale. And the sky is clear and the water calm. And there's fog all over the windows. Oh, look down that accursed arrowhead and stand back, we must. Look out. It smashed out one of the windows. We must come here. Look! Look racing toward the beach. I... I can't believe it. Did you see it? Yes. Yes. A white sheet flying over the ground. And twirling as it goes. Now it's at the shore. It's going out to sea. Pingree, what is it? Did you see it? Did you see it, Colonel? Hey, the wind is broken. What happened? Did it try to get in? Weymouth had the arrowhead in his hand when a tremendous gale arose. Then fog covered the window. I saw the fog. Yes. When I yelled, look out. But it weren't fog. It was that medicine man who'd come out of the sea. Well, that's what I saw from the shore late this afternoon, Boggs. What about you, Professor Weymouth? I, uh... I saw it, too. You believe now? I... Don't know what to believe. But you saw it with your own eyes, Weymouth. You saw the apparition, the ghost of that Indian medicine man, who was killed and buried at sea hundreds of years ago. Now are you going to give the arrowhead to the colonel? I admit what I saw, but I still can't believe it. My training and my mind refuse to accept the idea of an avenging ghost. What I saw... Might have been an illusion. Ah. That busted window ain't no illusion, Professor. Well, that might be explained in some way other than the fantastic notion that a ghost, which is weightless, could have broken that window. Now, what's all the excitement about? Box. The window. The ghost of the Indian medicine man paid Professor Weymouth a visit. What? Now, that's just crazy. You mean something that weighs less than a sheet of cheesecloth broke that window? And there's Kim. Professor? I don't honestly know, Mrs. Boggs. <laughs> now you were honest enough and you admitted seeing it, Weymouth. That's true. I did see something like a shroud, a winding sheet, trying to break through the window. A great wind preceded its appearance. Then the wind died down and the thing twirling like a top, flew back to the beach and out to sea. And you saw it? Well, it may have been an illusion, but yes, yes, I did see something. I'll pay for the window, of course, and I... I think I'll check out tomorrow, if you don't mind. Professor, you mean you're scared? Say I'm prudent. It was that ancestor of yours, George Weymouth. He was cruel to those Indians, and they want to avenge themselves against the person who bears that name. I'll give you the arrowhead in the morning, Colonel, and head back home. About ten more minutes, Fran. I'm glad we telephoned. She was so nice, Mrs. Box. She'll have the steamers ready and then the lobster. Perfect. I could eat for hours. Ben. Ben, slow down. Ben, stop. What? What is it? You sound terrified. Look up there ahead. You see them? Huh? Don't you see them? Who, who's them? You, you mean you don't see them? I don't even know what you're talking about, Fran. The Indians. 
What? Indians. Five of them. They're dancing around a big pot. And listen, drums. Indian drums. Hey, come on, you're pulling my leg. Indians dancing around a pot. I don't see a thing as far as the headlights carry. You all right, Fran? Of course I'm all right. You mean you really can't see them? They're dipping their arrows into the pot as they dance around it. Toledo, you must have flipped. I assure you, honey, there's nothing in the road. Nothing. There is, there is. I tell you, I see them. Hunger can make a person see things sometimes. I'm hungry, but I'm not starving to death. Darn it, Ben, I see them. Are you telling me I've come off the spool? Well, what do you want me to do? Shoo them away? I don't know what we should do. Well, I do. You close your eyes. I'm driving on. Indians or no Indians, I want to get to White Pines. Faraday's ought to be long any minute. Yep. Now what's fretting you? Weymouth. Won't listen to reason. I'm glad he's leaving in the morning. If he wasn't, I'd tell him to get. Just because he won't do what you and the colonel want him to? There's a curse on the man. An old Indian curse. What if that thing had gotten into the room and killed him? We'd never have another guest here, summer or fall. Oh, now get that sour expression off your face. It's almost 7.30. You stay here at the desk and wait for the Faradays. And be pleasant. I'm about ready to serve them steamers. Oh, that's them, Boggs. Hmm. Evening. Oh, there, uh, Mr. Boggs. Yep. Glad you made it. Evening, ma'am. Good evening. Have trouble with the road? Well, no, the directions were fine. We just weren't sure we were on the right one. But it, it worked out. What a fine inn you have here, Mr. Box. Oh, it's lovely. Look at that lodge room, Ben, with logs blazing away in the fireplace. Fran, why don't we go in and have a drink in front of the fire? I can bring in our bags later. Never mind the bags. I'll fetch them. If you'll give me your keys, I'll pack your car off the road. My wife will get you a drink, and you can have dinner any time. Steamers and lobster. Hope you like them. Perfect. <laughs> Nothing better. All over your scare, darling? Oh, Ben. Something go wrong on the way down? Well, it's, it's too silly to mention, Mr. Boggs. Oh. Well, I'm not a pride man myself. My wife saw five Indians dancing around a pot and dipping arrows into it. Hunger pains, I told her. Did you know? Silly, wasn't it? Depends. You'd better sign the register. And I'll have her come out and fix you some drinks. We'd better go down to dinner, Weymouth. Right. It's after 7.30. Hmm. Still got your appetite? Oh, yes, yes. I'm recovered now. Hmm. Quite an experience for you to tell about back home. A phenomenon. I can't quite yet encompass what happened. Well, accept it. Give me the arrowhead and tell your story on a wintry night to that little girl of yours. Of course, it's not a story, not fiction, because it really happened. It was strange. I know what I heard and saw, but there must be a rational explanation for what happened. Including the breaking of the window? Even including that. It must have been some freak kind of pressure. I have nothing to fear from mere ectoplasm. Well, maybe you don't have anything more to fear. But don't count on it. Professor Weymouth, even as you and I, is a rational man. He accepts only what he can touch or see. His mind rejects the possibility of ghosts. But is there anyone who doesn't know of a haunted house? Haunted by what? A specter? Yes, indeed, Professor Weymouth. For all your education, you cannot prove they don't exist. I'll be back shortly with Act Three. The White Pine.
Mines Inn is located a few miles from Phippsburg on the rocky coast of Maine. The coast is beautiful, but forbidding. As the British found out during the Revolutionary War, when 6,000 men of Maine fought them determinedly, Maine remembers those days of hardship and remembers her even earlier history. The first settlement in 1620 on the Saco River, the Abnaki and Etchemin Indians of the Algonquian family. And who is to say that the spirits of those dead do not still inhabit those huge forests of white pine, fir, spruce, and birch? Excellent dinner, Mag. Excellent. Oh, thank you, Colonel. Oh, very good. Best steamers and lobster I ever had. Yeah. Not to forget the Indian pudding. <laughs> well, that's real enough. Nothing ghostly about that, Professor Weymouth. You want coffee here or in the lodge room? Well, let's have it in front of the fireplace, Mag, if you please. And introduce yourselves to that nice young couple they're finishing up. Name's Faraday. Yeah, I'll do that. Faraday seem as content as we are. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening. I'm uh, Ben Faraday. This is my wife, Fran. How do you do? I'm George Weymouth, and this is Colonel Caleb Pingree. Oh, pleased to meet you, sir. Yeah. Colonel, will you join us? Well, yeah, thank you. <laughs> well, I'm glad you arrived. Boggs and his wife had begun to worry about you. Did you lose your way? <laughs> well, we thought we had, but we were on the right road all along. And then the sun dropped out of sight, and it was so dark, I just crept along. Oh, we had an unexpected adventure. Then they wouldn't be interested. Well, certainly we would, Mrs. Faraday. Up here, anything unusual is welcome. It gives us something to talk about. Uh, just seeing new faces is a treat. Especially yours, Mrs. Faraday. Why, thank you. Uh, uh, where are you from, by the way? Uh, Lewiston. You? Uh, Brunswick. I teach zoology. The colonel here just enjoys life. Uh -huh. I suspect he's got a chest of old gold in his attic. And he's a mine of folklore about the Indians who used to inhabit these forests. <laughs> well, that's not quite true about the chest of gold. But Indian legends are my hobby. And we've just experienced another one. What? Well, it's true enough. Even Professor Weymouth has to admit what he saw. You saw something, Professor? I think so. When? Late this afternoon. Well, why are you looking so startled? Mrs. Faraday? Excuse me? You, uh, experienced an Indian legend? Four cups, cream, sugar, I'll leave the pot. No, oh, thank you, Mag. Are you all right, young lady? You're kind of peaked. Oh, Indian legend. So that's it, Colonel. Got another listener to those Indian legends of yours. No, oh, my dear Meg, I, I've now, said nothing. Now, don't let the Colonel pull your leg, Mr. Faraday. He and my husband, Boggs, sees things where they ain't. If they ought to give me the creeps listen to the two of them. Say what they want to. There's no such thing as ghosts. What about the broken window, Meg? Well, that's just a freak swirl of wind. Hmm. And the twirling shroud that scudded out to sea. Well, I didn't see it. Now, I'll thank you not to go scaring these young folks. You are not going to believe this, Mrs. Bards. Go on, Fran, tell them. Well, not far from here, when I thought we were lost, Ben stopped the car. And the headlights cut a tunnel of light far down the road and... And then I saw them. The people see things when they're hungry. Oh, maybe I was imagining things, but I'd swear I really saw them. Five Indians dancing around a pot of, or cauldron and dipping their arrows into it. You have no doubt about what you saw, Mrs. Faraday? I saw them as plain as I see you. Well, Professor, I was inclined to disbelieve you and Boggs, Colonel, but this story of Mrs. Faraday's cannot be discounted. You saw the Indians. Did you hear drums? Yes, distinctly. What? What's this all about? I... Revenge. Revenge, Mr. Faraday. What? Re revenge for what? You'd better tell them, Pingree. Uh, you excuse me. I need some fresh air. I'll see you later, Colonel. He looks terribly worried, Ben. Yeah. 
Because he's the intended victim of an Indian's revenge. Fox? Come in here with me. I was going to turn down the Professor Weymouth's bed when... Well, look. The pillar's been rung in half. Chairs overturned. It's that thing from the ocean. I know you don't believe in such things, Mag. Well, I don't want to. But this... Either the professor went crazy or... Well, how do you account for all this damage? First to the window. Now the room wrecked. And the pillow twisted in two. Like wringing a person's neck until he was dead. The Indian medicine man. Somehow he got back in here and thought he had Weymouth by the neck when what he had was the pillar. A powerful wrench. The pillar's twisted in half, feathers all over. I'm telling him to leave White Pines tonight. You think we'd better call the police in Phippsburg? Oh, they don't believe in apparitions any more than you do, Mag. Well, I'm not so sure now that I don't. Because I've never seen anything like this. Where is the professor? When the colonel began to tell the Faradays the story, the professor went out for some fresh air. And I'll find him and tell him to pack up and leave. Oh, Mr. Box. I'd like to have a word with you, Professor. Enjoy your stroll, Weymouth. I just stood outside and breathed deeply and looked at the sky. Mag went upstairs to turn down your bed. The room was a shambles. Chairs overturned, the bed all rumpled, and the pillar rung in half. What? I haven't been near the room since dinner time. The ghost of that Indian medicine man's been there. If you'd been stretched out on that bed, you'd be dead. That pillow was twisted in two. Feathers all over the place. Good Lord. I'm sorry to have to say this, Professor, but I want you to pack and leave. Tonight. I don't blame you. I'll pay for all the damage. I'm deeply sorry. Bring me the arrowhead, Weymouth. That's the source of your trouble. Until you've disposed of the medicine man's arrowhead, you won't have peace. And you may, in fact, die. Have your doubts about specters, but give me that fatal arrowhead. I'm convinced, Colonel. I'll be right back. Well, even Mag's convinced now, Colonel. <laughs> I'd imagine so. The professor's a doomed man. Not if he gets rid of the arrowhead. Think the Faradays have gotten scared off? No, no. They went to bed about a half an hour ago. Mrs. Faraday has the sight, Boggs, like you and me. When I told her what happened, she believed me. Even her husband began to be convinced. Oh, they'll stay. But you're quite right in telling Weymouth to leave. Tonight. <laughs> Stop fussing and come to bed. I'm not fussing. I'm just thinking about what the colonel told us about George Weymouth and how he murdered those five Indians way back in 1600-something. Yeah, but it's just crazy to think that some old medicine man is out to murder the professor. He didn't kill those Indians. Why is he to blame? Just because he has the same name, that's all. You believe that? Yes, I... Ben. Oh, my goodness. What is it? Look out there. On the water, see it? Yeah. Something's rising from the water offshore. It's a water spout. No, no, it's not. It's upside down. It, it looks like a sheet, and, and it's turning round and round. And it's floating this way towards shore. W what is it? It's that thing the colonel told us he saw. The ghost of the medicine man who was buried at sea. It, it, it's coming towards the inn. Ben, I'm afraid. I'll, I'll get by. No, don't leave me, Ben. The shore and it's coming up the hill. And listen to the wind. It's coming toward us. No, no, it's heading for the rooms to our right. That's where Professor Weymouth is staying. It's after him, Ben. Ah! It broke the window. The whole place is shaking. Come, come on, friend. Let's get out of here. Help! 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 Help!
Colonel, Mr. Boggs. Open the door, Boggs. We have only seconds. Don't go in there, Ben. I have to. Help me, someone. Good Lord, it's at his throat. Help me, Boggs. Faraday. It's, it's like canvas. Come on. Pull it away from his throat. I, I picked up the arrowhead thing. Bring it down. Yes, it's, it's dragging me toward the window. No. It's twisting down his throat. No. Around the middle of here, he'll, he'll be dragged through the window. Meg, Meg, find that arrowhead and throw it out the window. Because of the arrow. Throw it out the window. Throw it, Meg. He's he's fainted. Here's some water. Notice the wind's died down, and the thing that had him by the throat. It's in a heap on the floor. Uh, canvas. Look. When I touched it just now, it, it crumpled in my hand. It's like dust. <coughs> oh, my... My throat. Oh, thank you. Oh, you... You had a close call, Weymouth. You're lucky to be alive. Thank God all of you were close by. Or it would have killed me. I... I'm very grateful. Can you tell us what happened? I can. I was looking out the window when I saw the apparition come out of the sea and drift this way. Then a great wind came up and the thing kind of embraced the house. It was when the window broke that the professor began to cry out. It floated in like a, a small upside-down cyclone. I tried to stay out of its way, but it began to wrap itself around me. It was horrible. What in heaven's name was it? What could it be? You know, Amos, it was the ghost of the Indian medicine man come back to avenge the murder of those five Indian braves. It was your forebear who killed them, and the spirit of the medicine man has never forgotten. When you picked up that arrowhead, you aroused his spirit. Only by giving up that arrowhead could you break the fatal connection. Well, where... Where is the arrowhead now? I threw it out the window, Professor. Oh. And something else. When it hit the rocks below, there was a burst of flame... And then nothing. I... I believe it. I believe all of it, Colonel. The five ghostly Indians. They did exist. Hmm. Lucky for you, Weymouth, that you've lived to tell the story. of the supernatural goes back to earliest man. As he roamed the earth, he was encompassed by many terrors. There was the terrible dark with its countless dangers. Legends about second sight are endless. To this day, the avenging specter of the Indian medicine man lives as fact in the mind of Professor Weymouth. I'll be back shortly. fascination of terror is as ancient as the human race. It is stronger than our intellect, stronger even than our fears. It goes to the core of our very being. The brutal, unnecessary killing of five Indians in 1605 by George Weymouth laid a curse on those who bore his surname. Perhaps there is a kind of real justice after all. Crimes of long ago, unavenged, can be avenged. Our cast included Robert Dryden, Court Benson, Guy Sorrell, Ann Petoniak, Suzanne Grossman, and Jay Gregory. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. Why did you allow her to leave so early? 
You and I have to talk. Well, whatever we say would be beyond her. Yes, if she's group three. Turn? How could Turn be an inspector? I suspect Turn because she's too perfect. To absolutely group three. Well, suppose she is an inspector. What have you and I ever said to each other that's reportable? I am head of repair. You are admiral of the fleet. And we are about to be disenfranchised. Why? Corral cannot qualify for group one. He will fail the examination. But you took him to repair yourself. He was judged in perfect balance. Oh, yes. Because he was examined by a single practitioner. And I was present. Do you think he's out of balance? Oh, I know it. He's one of those. I refuse to believe that. You refuse to accept it. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Mystery Theater. Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. They say there do be girls in Galway that are the fairest in the world. Of course, there are other things in Galway, all Ireland for that matter, that you don't find anywhere else. Clericones and banshees, the little folk, and of course the leprechaun himself. Blarney and the Blarney Stone itself. So many things that are hard to credit that the only way is to make a trip there for yourselves as we are now going to do. Ah! Oh, mother of heaven, he's at it again, Mary. Uncle Terrence? Who else? Rattling his portrait against the chimney stones and wailing like the banshee he is. Oh, well, Sean, you know what he's after. Eh? Turn the picture face to the wall and give the poor man the chance to dress himself in privacy. Eh, all right, Mary. Oh, but... But where would he want to be off to today? There's no wake or wedding or holy day to celebrate. But if he's taken advantage of the leprechaun's promise, there's something special in the wind. Now, you being the man, take a wee peep there and see if he's gone. <laughs> he's gone, the canvas is bare as a turnip. Ah, then mark my word, Sean Daly, we're in for some excitement in Clenford. I wonder what will be this time. Our mystery drama, The Wakeful Ghost, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Paul Hecht. finished his last year of med school and found himself with a thousand dollars left of his inheritance and two weeks before he began his internship. He was weary from the long struggle for his medical degree because in spite of scholarships, he had to work outside to raise money for the six years of study. Both his parents were dead. So far as he knew, he was alone in the world. But his background was Irish, and he had some vague memory that an aunt and uncle were living still in the old country. So he decided to spend the two weeks on a vacation, which was to change his whole life. Nobody's going to believe this, but it's exactly what happened to me in Ireland. 
After roaming around a few days in Dublin, I took a train for Ballinasloe in Galway, to the west. The only clue I had to my uncle and aunt was an old postcard with that postmark and their names, Sean and Mary Daly, which is sort of equivalent to John and Mary Smith. I didn't have much hope of finding them, but it was a joy just to have nothing to do with my last three days playing detective. No one was more surprised than I when a ruddy-faced little gentleman walked up to me at the station. Sure, now, I couldn't be mistaken, but just for the politeness of the thing and observing the formalities as to well, but you wouldn't be Brian Macken from America. Uh, well, y- yes, that, that's exactly who I would be. And now you may be wondering who I am. Uh, well, yes, I am. I am indeed. <laughs> sure. I'm your great-uncle Terence on your mother's side, once or twice removed, for I was born on the wrong side of the blanket, they say. <laughs> oh, I, I, I don't know myself nor care, for sure. In my own opinion, I was a changeling, which accounts for my close associations with with the... Uh, well, that, that's of no matter for the moment. Terence Kruskin is the name. Terence Kinsera Clonmay Kruskin. But your Uncle Terence will serve. Tis the way most people know me. Well, I, 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 I'm still puzzled. Um, how did you know me? I have a little cart and a pony waiting. Oh. And if we want to get to your aunt and uncle's before dark, I'm thinking we'd best get along... And I tell you all on the way. Uh, I, I, I don't mean to be rude, sir, but I still would like to know how you knew I was coming here today. I only made up my mind on the spur of the moment this morning. Ah, no, that's where you're wrong, do you see? What do you mean? Well, while we're riding along, would you like a little dash of potheen to warm the cockles of your heart? Is that the Irish whiskey you make out of bog water that's about 180 proof? Uh-huh, the same. Uh, no, thanks. No, that's the stuff I had last night in Dublin that knocked me out like a Mickey. I'm still not over it. <laughs> well, now then, to answer your question. Yeah. How I knew to expect you. Uh-huh. Do you remember the little chap in the green bowler you met at the snug last night? Oh, yeah, I remember him. He, he introduced me to this nectar. Well, now, McDrush is a friend of mine. You know, that's not what he said last night. That he wasn't a friend? Uh, no, I mean that that wasn't his name. Oh, he probably called himself Michael Mahan or some such. Yeah, that's right. Sure, that's what he uses as, as a cover when he's out and about the town. <laughs> what is he, a, a secret agent, a IRA or something? Not him. He's all peace and goodwill. He's a leprechaun. A leprechaun? That's right. Oh, 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 God, come on, Uncle Terence. Here, stop pulling my leg. Michael Mahan was no leprechaun. Did he have a little green bowler? Well, I don't know if you could call it green. It, it was all Green. Old. And did he have pointy little ears just under his hat rim at the top, like? Well, as a matter of fact, medically, I was interested because the auricular cartilage was strangely shaped. The, the what was what? At the top of his ears. Ah, there, 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 there. You see, you see? There's your answer. Enough to convince an American. Anyway, your friend the leprechaun sent me a message in a way that we have. And that's well, this how I... must be the greatest put-on of all time. You're not going to tell me you're a leprechaun, too. Oh, no, 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 no. I, I'm more of a banshee, you might call me, but with special privileges. Oh, yes, quite special. Uh, but that can wait. Oh, Mariner. Oh, oh. oh, is this where my aunt and uncle live? It is. Sean and Mary Daly? That's who they are. Are they expecting me? Lord bless you, no, but you'll be welcome, son, as welcome as the flowers in May. <laughs> Here, take your bags and, and jump on down. Aren't you coming in with me to introduce me? Well, sure, you're a nice, well-mannered lad, and you'll manage by yourself. But it's time enough to put Maureen and the cat and myself away till any of us is needed. God hold you in his pocket till we meet again. We are going to, aren't we? Oh, yes, indeed. I don't know how to be arranged, but I have plans for you and the future of more than one. At the moment he was calling his back to me, the twilight was upon us. It must have been some trick of the rising evening mist, but I swear, before he reached the corner of the building, Uncle Terence, the old-fashioned cart, and Maureen, who pulled it, seemed to disappear in the gathering gloom. 
Good evening to you, young gentleman. Uh, excuse me. Uh, are you by any chance Mrs. Sean Daly? I am that. Uh, uh, did you have a brother who emigrated to America called Thomas Mackin? I did. And you're from America? Yeah. <gasps> you couldn't be. <laughs> it's just Brian That's you right. are. Brian Mackin, whose mother was Margaret Denise. That's me. Hi, Aunt Mary. Oh, Brian. Oh. Oh, me darling boy, me darling boy. Oh, forget me. Come in. Come in. <laughs> Sean, Sean, will you look who's here? It's Tommy's son and Margaret's. This is your Uncle Sean. Well, well it is a pleasure to meet you. Do, oh, sit down, sit down. Sean, take the boy's bag. Yes. yes. How did you ever find us? Oh. It's been years since we lost track. Sean and me had to move so sudden like, and our letters seemed to go astray. Now tell me about Tom and Margaret. Well, uh, uh, mother and dad both died suddenly oh. within a month of each other. I, well, I, I've been so busy burying myself in schoolwork, I didn't... Uh, well, I, I let everything else oh, go. Oh, you poor darling. Oh, if I'd known. Oh, you must tell us yeah. all about uh, it. Can I get you a wee nip to settle you? Oh, no, 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 thanks. I'm learning to be careful of Irish nips. Well, then I'll get you something to eat. Now, you'll stay the night with us in a few days? Sure, I, I, I've got till the weekend before I have to catch my plane home. Oh. Anyway, <laughs> I'll, I'll wait to have dinner with all of you. Aunt Mary, Uncle Sean, and Uncle Terence. Uh, Uncle who? Uncle Terence. Uh, he met me at the station, brought me here. I'd never have found you without him. He just went to put the horse and cart away. Hmm. A little mare with one black eye and one white? Yeah, that's Maureen. And did you expect to meet him at the station? No, no. He absolutely floored me. I mean, the only reason I came to Ballinasloe was because I found an old card from you to Mother with a postmark. Uh, I was just taking a wild stab in the dark that someone might know about you or where you live. I wanted to... Well, I, I mean, as far as I know, you are my only living relative. Oh, we are, darling, we are. Well, I didn't know about Uncle Terence, and, well... And what, Brian? You can be free with us. Well, I, I, I don't know what to say. He talked about uh, leprechauns and banshees, you know, that sort of thing. Oh, I might have thought he was a little, uh, uh, I guess you'd say, touched, except for... Well, I shouldn't talk this way. I, I loved him. He was he was fun and amusing, and full of a wonderful zest for life, but sort of scary, too. Is he the same at home here? Oh, he can be all of those, though we don't see much of it anymore. Uncle Terence is a great problem oh, for us. Oh, well, I'm sorry. Nothing about it, but... to do with you. you know, I, I hope you won't tell him some of the things I just said or, or, or intimated. Well, when he comes in for dinner, I mean. Yeah, yeah, he, he, uh... He won't be here for dinner. Oh, oh! I thought he lived here. Well, uh, so he does in a, in a sort of way. I think it's time that we told the boy the truth, Sean, as best we can. Ah, uh, yes. Well, you, uh, you had a good long look at Uncle Terence. He, uh, he wouldn't forget it. Oh no, no, never. Look behind the picture and make sure. Yes. Yes, he's back again. Now, come here. You see this portrait, Brian? Now, would that, uh, would that be Uncle Terrence? Oh, yeah, yeah. That's him. That's him to the life. You're not exactly. The gentleman you are looking at has been dead these 35 years. What? The but... only problem is that, uh, he won't stay decently in his grave. Mackin has come all the way to Ireland to find a real uncle and aunt, and in addition, a quite unreal uncle, a man who appears to be able to rise from the grave full-bodied by the mere device of having his portrait turned to the wall. No wonder Brian is convinced that it's all illusionary, a pipe dream programmed by that potent potteen, and yet, this is only the beginning. I'll be back shortly with Act Two. Back again to our world of fantasy 
and a young American trapped in a web of superstition, illusion, or perhaps just the spell the Emerald Island can weave so easily about any visitor to its shores. Still, whatever doubts and fears he may have taken to bed with him, they are all dispelled by a glorious sunrise that wakes him up with cock crow. My window faced to the east, with the sun streaming in and striking shafts of golden light from a blue river a few miles away. I climbed out of the host of warm blankets and quilt that covered my bed. The room was cold enough for me to seek the sun's warmth directly. And it was there, at the window, I first saw Sheila. She was not a small girl. She was tall and sturdy. But she walked as though each footfall was no heavier than a feather landing on the ground. She had long brown hair and purple eyes. With a wide mouth that, well, once I saw it break in a smile, made me make up my mind this was going to be my gal. Since she was approaching the house carrying a basket, I don't suppose I ever dressed faster in my life to get down in time not to miss meeting her. Good morning, Brian. And did you sleep well? Oh, yes. The best sleep I've had since I can remember. Ah, uh, sure. It was a short enough one, and you so tired. Well, that cock was crawling, and... Ah, that old rooster. He's no fake. <laughs> Small use he is to hens anymore, his best days being over. Never a chick in the last two years. There's not over four or five layers we have left. So, Sheila here and me, we have a bargain. <laughs> oh, you'll not have met Sheila O'Shaughnessy from the next farm over. Sheila, this is my nephew, all the way from the United States of America. It's a pleasure to make your acquaintance, Mr... Uh, uh, Matt Mackin. Uh, uh, Brian Mackin. Oh, it's a good West Country name. Mr. Mackin. Yeah, well, my grandfather came from here. Uh, from Galway, I mean. <laughs> they say he was quite a bully boy. Aye. Well, those days are past, praise be. Still, the way things are, we were better off with a shillelagh than a gun. Oh, well, I, I couldn't agree with you more... Anyone who plans to be a doctor... Is that what uh, you're away to be? Well, I well, I already am. I, I mean, I've graduated and had my license. Now I have to intern and be a hospital resident for a few years till I start out on my own. Oh, that's grand. I have a great admiration for doctors. No, no, then this will have to hold or the bread will burn up on us. And I want you to get it home with a little heat left in it. <laughs> this is Mrs. Daly's bargain with me. I bring her a basket of eggs... And she bakes the most delicious bread this side of heaven. <laughs> ah, here, no, here's the basket. Keep the towel tucked in good and tight, man. Never fear. Uh, that's that's a heavy basket. Uh, why don't I carry it for you to your house? I was going to give you your breakfast. Yeah, well, uh, it'll wait. I always like a little exercise before I eat. Ah, well, you'll be after getting that, all right. It's a good mile and a half to Sheila's place. Oh. And a road like a switchback all the way. Oh, the basket is nothing. It's light as a feather. No, I, I really would like a walk if, if, if you don't object. I don't object. I have a curious turn of mind. And I'd like to hear all about America. Oh, what I'd really like you to be able to do is to show it to you. But <clears throat> why don't you show me Ireland first? There. Yeah. Was that Sheila O'Shaughnessy then? The same. Oh, now, damn it. Well, well, why why didn't she wait long enough for me to get down and, and get my little morning pack on the cheek, huh? <laughs> sure, she has little interest in an old gaffer like you. <laughs> but you should have seen her reaction to Brian and his to her. Well, well, will you look at the two of them? She's over shoulder high to him. Oh, what a fine couple they'd make. Uh, don't I know it. And don't I know just as well I should never have let the boy go off with even a pinch of hope in his heart. No, and she can't ever be for him. And is it really true that in Chicago they have a building that's 96 whole stories high in the air? Oh, yeah, that's true enough. It's so damn high that half the time the people on the top floors can't tell what to wear when they go out. Well, how is that? Well, you see, it's air-conditioned. And when the cloud cover is low, they can't see down to the street, so they don't know if it's raining or snowing or cold or hot or what. <laughs> <laughs> Will you just imagine that now? Living above the clouds. 
could be a sort of fairyland. Well, nothing like the one you live in here. Right on the ground. Oh, sure. Air oh. is lovely. But there are other lovely places in the world I'd want to see. Hey, you know a lot about America anyway. Well, I watch the telly, you know. And I read a lot. And I... Oh, here. It's winded you are. I'll slow down a bit. Oh, this is damn hills. Up and down like a roller coaster. That's what Mrs. Daly meant by a switchback. I'm surprised to find myself so out of condition. Will you be staying with the Dalys for a while? On one condition. What's that? That you'll take another walk with me? Tomorrow's Saturday. We, we could take a picnic lunch along and uh, climb that mountain over there. Oh, I'm afraid I couldn't do that. You have another date? No, it's not that. It's... Oh, you see, my dad's dead. and It's just my mother and me, and, and she's half crippled with rheumatism. Oh. I couldn't be leaving her all alone all that time. And, and then... There's the farm chores to be well, done. I could, I could come over and, and help you get those out of the way. Ah, uh, Dr. Mackin. Uh, Brian. Well, it's a bit soon in all, but if you want, Brian. Oh, it's just no good. It's not the way it should be. You, you don't want to go with me? Is that it, Sheila? Sheila. I do want to, Brian, I do. Oh, well, then Come. It'd be my only chance now. I'll meet you. Here, by this bridge we're about to cross. And before dawn tomorrow, so we'll not be seen. We'll spend a whole long, lovely day together. With no one the wiser. But, but can I tell Uncle Sean and Aunt Mary? Oh, don't tell anyone. It's our secret. But the picnic... I'll take care of that. Now you leave me here. Till tomorrow at, say... 4.30. Well, whatever you say. Sheila. I know. So do I. God help the both of us. She was gone in a second with that light loping stride that covered ground almost as fast as a man running. I watched her as long as I could away down that dusty, twisting, hilly road appearing and disappearing till at last she was out of sight but not out of mind never out of mind Sheila just her name was a song of love I walked back on air but fortunately as it turned out as I came back in the house the first thing my eye fell on was the portrait of Uncle Terence. And for the moment, Sheila was out of my mind. Oh, no, 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 thanks. I, I Really, I couldn't eat another thing. Now, the only thing I'm hungry for now is information. About Sheila, is that what you mean? Uh, Sheila? Uh, no, no. I, I'd rather find out about her directly. Uh, Brian, I... Uh, about Sheila... Maybe I ought to tell you something. Uh, no, Uncle, I'd, I'd, I'd rather for the moment stick to Uncle Terrence. Hmm? Now, you said he's been dead for nearly 35 years. Oh, yeah, that's two years almost to the day before that portrait was painted. He died in 1940. Now, are you sure of that? Oh, sure, I know it well. I was just a slip of a girl not married to Sean yet. Hmm. But it was the biggest week this part of Galway has ever seen. Ah, it is a pity he couldn't have enjoyed it for himself. He always was the life and soul of them with his stories and all. Ah, yes, he does dearly love a wake, just as much as a wedding. Mm -hmm. I did, uh, Sean. Did what? Uh, did love a wake. But now, look, I saw him last night. I talked to him. He brought me here. Now, now, lad, you'll have to remember, you had a wee drop taken. And fourteen can scramble a man's brain. I can't believe that the dr How did Uncle Terence die? A hero at Dunkirk. Dunkirk? Ah, he was in the First World War, you know, in the Navy. And nothing would do but he has to be in the last big one, too. But a man 60 years old, they wouldn't take him. No. So he joined up with the Home Guard. 
when the retreat at Dunkirk came with his Navy experience, he was taking a boat back and forth the whole three days. And when he saw that it would be his last trip, he found one of the fighting boys to take his ship back and gave up his own place to stay behind with a machine gun. The last boat out just ahead of the Jerry's brought him back. Uh... Oh, they say he had more lead in him than salt in a full salt cellar. But his finger was still wrapped around the trigger of his gun. It was a sad wake, that, mm. Uncle Terence's. Mm. The only sad one I'd ever been to. Although none of them are the same without him to keep the jokes flying. <laughs> Even Michael Mahan had naught but sorrow in him. Him who always had a twinkle in his eye. I remember him just standing in front of the portrait there. Just standing. Not even drinking from his glass. <clears throat> and do you remember what he said? It was this, it was this. He says, a, a brass of a boy, Terence, me buckle. And you should have lived a hundred years. Well, don't you worry. We'll see you do. I always wondered what he meant by that. Well, now, look, don't you see? If he was McDrewish, I mean, if Mahan was a real leprechaun... Now, touch, boy. Don't let our Irish fancies run off with you. Sure, all he meant was he wouldn't be soon forgotten. Well, now, I, uh, I have to be off to work, and Mary has things to do, and, uh, and Brian. Yeah. Don't dwell on Uncle Terence. Uh, find some other thoughts to fill your head. Yes, I... I have. I have. <laughs> That's the great fog to the north. Don't ever go near there, Brian. Why not, Sheila? Once the peat catches you, you'll never get free. And they say it'll swallow a man in less than a minute. To the southwest are the rest of the Schleivachti Mountains, the ones we're in now. And away down there, to the southeast, is the River Shannon. <gasps> What's the matter? Are you cold? How could I be cold with your arm about me? Bold. <laughs> That's what I am. Bold. Because you love me. And how could you be bashful with a man who loves you now, tomorrow, and forever? <laughs> I, I just can't believe my luck. Don't. Don't what? Ah, oh, Brian Boyne. Don't say anything else. It's all been madness from the start. Love from the start. For us, the same thing. I should never have allowed you to. But I wanted. I loved. And sure, God can't punish me too deep for just one day of all I've dreamed. Kiss me. We've got to go. It's twilight already. Oh, just a little longer. And what about tomorrow? We have no tomorrows. Just kiss me. <sighs> Goodbye, my love. Goodbye, Brian. Goodbye. Again, she was gone from me on the wind, gliding and leaping down the mountain, picnic basket in hand, as sure-footed and graceful as a mountain goat. Sheila! Sheila! Wait! She didn't stop to look back, and I plunged down after her, recklessly and clumsily as a boar. I hadn't gone 50 yards before I caught my foot on some trailing route, falling heavily and knocking myself stone cold for a moment. By the time I came to, she was gone from sight. And in the gathering darkness, limping heavily, it was all I could do to find my way back to the daily farm. <laughs> And there you are. Sure, we thought you might be lost in the dark. Yeah, I'm lost in the dark, all right, Aunt Mary. Now, look, I, I don't know if it's another of your Irish fantasies or what. Oh, where have you been all day, lad? Oh, and you're hurt. Yeah. Sean, uh, come in here. Oh, well, I'm, I'm coming, Mary. Wait, wait, you sound as though someone put the fear of God in you. What, yes. What's happened at all? It's Brian, he's hurt. What? And more than physically, I'm thinking... Were you with Sheila O'Shaughnessy this day? Yes, I was. And I love her. And I know she loves me. Oh. But she's told me goodbye. Why? 
I mean, am I crazy? Is she just another figment of my imagination? Oh, you see, Sean, I told you we should have told the boy the truth. Yeah, well, well, better late than never. Uh, Sheila is engaged to be married to Malachi Malloy. Well, is that all? Huh? Well, then all she has to do is break no, it. No, no, she has a marriage contract. Well, surely that has no real legal standing. Today, no. Except, uh, well, you see, a few years ago, uh, Sheila's father had a heart attack. He got into financial difficulties, and the only way out was through Malloy, the loan shark. He lent him the money in exchange for his daughter when she became 21. Well, sure, Joe thought he could have things straightened out before then, but... But he suddenly had a second attack and died. Yeah, well, I'll pay the money back. Have you got it? Well, no, not right now, but as soon as... Oh, I... no good for Malachi Malloy. Besides, you make so much as one move at Sheila, and in this county, he'd have his woolly boys throw you in a sack and bury you in the peat bog. And the, uh, the wedding is day after tomorrow. Now, 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 look, just wait a minute. I mean, this is crazy. This is the 20th century. I'm an American citizen. I'm... Must be something I can do. Ah! What the devil was that? Oh, it's Uncle Terence. He what? wants out again. The ah! Lord knows what he'll stir up this time. But there's no way to stop the man. So, here we are back again about where we started. Where are we? But what can Uncle Terence do or undo, even supposing that's what he's after? Still, why couldn't it be? Since he's now well established as a denizen of the afterworld, I'll return shortly with Act Three. was W.S. Gilbert, probably the finest lyricist of all time, who wrote of John Wellington Wells that he was a dealer in magic and spells, in blessings and curses, and ever-filled purses, in prophecies, witches, and knells. I mention him only because it brings us back to our story of magic, fantasy, and, so far, pleasant sorcery. But... Will it remain that way as Uncle Terence's picture rocks on the wall? And once again, we hear the eldritch scream of the banshee wail. I'll turn the picture to the wall. But if he's going to appear, it will only be to the one who turns the picture. I think this time we'd better let it be Brian. Look, I'm not going to ask any questions anymore. Just leave me alone. I'll, I'll turn the picture. But Brian... Come away, Mary. We're out of this entirely. All right, Uncle Terrence, or whoever you are, I am about to turn the picture. And all I say is, you get me, Sheila... Or show me how to get her. And I don't, I don't care what the price is, short of my immortal soul, and I'll pay that gladly. Uh, here you go. Ah, who wants your immortal soul? Where are you? Turn around. You have eyes, haven't you? Sitting right here in the fireplace, Nook. Oh. Uh, what are you? Fact or fiction? Oh, why now, in a manner of speaking, I'd say somewhere in between. Well, does it make any sense to talk to you? Ah, the sense in the word. Even suppose I believed, uh, if you're a banshee. Now, what's the matter with a banshee? Well, it's evil, isn't it? Ah, the abysmal ignorance of the word. A banshee, young man, is a domestic spirit devoted to the care of its own particular family. Oh, well, are you going to help Sheila and me? Oh, sure, I'm going to do my best, but I'm not infallible. We'll have to be quick and nimble as the devil on this one. Well, why can't I just go to this Malachi Malloy and straighten it out man oh, to man? Oh, 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 oh. To begin with, did you ever see him? No. Oh, he's formidable, lad. No doubt of that. The man is a giant, and he's made of steel. Well, look, whose side are you on? Mine or his? Easy, lad, easy. Am I not the Banshee, and aren't you one of the family? Besides, he's a black Irisher, if there ever was one. But you've got to take thought on this. If you're to have the chance I brought you here for in the first place. You brought me here? Well, sure, you didn't think as an American you'd have enough sense to get here and pick the right Irish girl for yourself. Now, 
Let me go on back up to my frame and get everything shipshape and squared away. I'll see you on the morrow. And, psst, watch your step. Uncle Sean and Mary were off to bed by the time our conference was through. I was grateful. I didn't want to talk about Sheila or her intended husband any more that night. I hoped to sleep, but I tossed and turned till morning and then made the mistake of stepping outside the house for a breath of air. Coming down the road towards me was a great mountain of a man, all covered with black hair wherever his clothes didn't conceal it. The one thing his clothes could not conceal were the bulging muscles that strained at every seam. He was a good five inches taller than I was and 30 pounds heavier. And Would you be the American, Brian Mackins? Uh, yeah, yeah, that, that, that's my name. I'm Malachi Malloy. Well, I kind of guessed that. I'm of the understanding that you took my intended bride up the mountain yesterday. Well, she was kind enough to take me up for a picnic and show me the countryside. A picnic, was it? And the grass stains all over her dress? I should have brought a whip. But instead, I'm going to beat you with my bare hands. Malachi, Malachi, don't. Now, you stay out of this, Sheila. What's going on, Brian? No, this is just, just a little something between me and Mr. Malloy. Oh, oh the Lord be praised. Keep them apart and kill him. Oh. Don't touch him, Malachi. Now, you stay back, woman, or I'll kill him. So put your hands up, Mackin. If God always defends the right, he was out for breakfast that morning. Now, I'm not exactly... <laughs> Patsy and I, I usually can take care of myself in a, in a fight. But this was a willy pad against a Marciano. He just made hamburger of me until he stopped and turned with me lying at his feet. Have you learned a lesson as, as well as him, Sheila girl? If you haven't, I'll, I'll beat him to death. I'll make sure he never rises again. Oh, in sweet Mary's name, leave him be, Malachi. I'll marry no one but you if you'll just leave him be. All right, so be it. Now get out of this country tonight, Martin. Or I'll wring your neck like a chicken's. <laughs> Let me in. Quick, now, I'm fading in the daylight. Uncle Terrence, it's a picture. Now, watch, Uncle. Let, let, let me in there. And close those curtains before I disappear entirely. There, now, sure, that's better, 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 that is. What are you? You're just a portrait. And how could you get to the second floor window? Just the warning. The only trouble I ever found with a girl is they talk too much. The answer to it all is, I'm a banshee, and I look out for my own. Brian is one of them. Well, how is he? Was he sore hurt? Oh, a few bruises, and maybe he lost a tooth or cracked a rib. But what's that to a broken heart? You should know. Am I right? If you mean the way I feel. I was getting ready to tie a sack of potatoes around my neck, throw myself in the Shannon. Well, now, that'd be a whole lot of help. Now, I have a better idea. How would you like to meet Brian at Tronmelly's Gate on the way into the Great Bog tonight at midnight? I can't. I can't do it. I owe my father his debts. And besides, Malachi would kill him. Ah, all right, all right. Spare me all the melodramatics. What I mean is, how would you like to convince that hickory-headed, lame brain Malachi that's what you plan to do? Why? Now, what is a banshee for? Will you let me take care of the arrangements from then on? I will, Uncle Terence. I will. And uh, if I'm successful, will you let me give you away when you marry Brian? How could a banshee do that? Oh, you let me handle that, too. Just say yes. Yes. Oh, yes. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> Is that the banshee himself? Is it the leprechaun? God save you, McGrush. God save you, Terence Griffith. 
Come here, Brian. Get us a firefly there so we can see what we're at. There, now. That's better. Do you see what Malachi did to the lad? Oh, what do you want, right, Brian? Yeah, well, I, I, I took a good beating, but now I'll live. It's, uh, it's nice to see you again, Mr. Maha. Yeah, he said, no, no, no. No, we all know what to do. Yeah, I, I just show myself in the moonlight with you in that cape and hood, and, and, and then... And then McGush will dematerialize you back to the farm. Right. And Malachi will have no one to chase but me, <laughs> thinking I'm here. I'll tell you all the rest later. <laughs> you, uh, you have the shoes, McGush. Uh, just the one. You know, we leprechauns never make but one magic shoe. Well, 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 no matter. I can hop like a toad long enough until he's well in the bog. <laughs> psst, psst. No, tis midnight. Here he comes. Send Brian home, Rush. And give me the shoe. And off we go. Sheila. Sheila, I warn you. Wait for me. Eh. Uh. So you tried to slip away with your light of love, eh? But you won't get away from me so easy. Eh? Where, where are you leading me? Well, put in the bog. I'm caught. I, I'm sinking. Sheila! Sheila, help me. I'm, I'm sinking in the bog. Now come back. Come back. Come back! Ah! Ah, now there's a darling girl. You wouldn't let me go down to a dark, murky death. You that knows every path in the... Well, that's not you. It's a... That can't be. The bogles have a halt on me. It's Terence Christine. And who's that wee man beside you? Oh, little friend. One of the wee green men. Here we are, your nemesis or your saviors. Oh. And which would you want us to be? Oh, Lord alive. Save me. I'm up to my waist already. That's no problem. Uh, a little piece of paper. Uh, and since it's hard to read in the moonlight, I'll give you the gist, uh, as they say. I, Malachi Malloy, hereby uh, legally and completely accept the fact that all debts or claims against Thomas O'Shaughnessy uh, are revoked and considered null and void. This is blackmail. So was what you did to my friend. And the bog is even blacker, and you're sinking even deeper. All right, all right, I'll sign, I'll sign. Well, that, that, there's a wee bit more. What, what? I also cancelled the marriage contract between myself and Sheila O'Shaughnessy, yes. and in consequence of my breach of promise, yes. I award her the sum of 2,000 pounds well, to see her and her mother started off well, in a new country. Yes. In exchange, mm. I would accept the farm, mm. no mortgage to me, and etc., etc., etc. For God's oh, sake, nice stop talking! I'm up to my chest already. I'll sign, I'll sign anything. But would you live up to it? Now, there's the reason. Oh, please! You, you, you wouldn't have any idea now of, of attacking young Brian again. No, no! <laughs> should, uh, Should we trust him, do you think, McGrush? Sure. He's an Irish, but after all, I get one in trouble enough, and you never have to worry. Goodbye, happy future. Don't forget to send pictures of a wagon. Goodbye. Goodbye. Sorry, I have to leave. I have to get back for my job. Oh, we're sorry too, but we'll take care of Mother O'Shaughnessy till you're married and have a place to stay. Well, Mary, all's well that ends well, but who'd have thought it? You said they made a wonderful couple. <laughs> I'll never understand how Malachi suddenly got so generous. I'll never understand why, but I can guess how. What do you mean? Take a look. We're going to have to get a new picture to hang over the fireplace. Oh, now, what's it doing turn to the wall again? What's he up to now? <laughs> it isn't turn to the wall. Huh? It's just a blank canvas. So what do you mean? Have a look for yourself. Holy mother, it's blank on both sides. Where's Uncle Terence? I have a feeling he's off to America. He always did want to see the United States. <laughs> We can leave it up to Sheila and Brian to worry about him now. Well, you can believe it or not.
not. But to the best of my knowledge, that's the way it happened. And if there was a lot of magic in it, there's just as much in love. The exact quote doesn't spring to mind for the moment, but the burden of it is that no matter what happens, love will find a way. I'll be back shortly. Brian and Sheila were married a month later in the States. Everyone who was there agreed they were as handsome a couple as you could ask for. But the real hit of the celebration was a shortish, ruddy-faced little gentleman with an Irish accent to go with his Irish face and his Irish wit. It was sad that he died so soon after the wedding, but it was hard to cry for him, remembering all the laughs he brought with him. Our cast included Paul Hecht, Virginia Payne, Jada Rowland, Leon Janney, and Ian Martin. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time... Pleasant dreams. the southern tier and northern Pennsylvania. We're your AM stereo station, 24 hours a day. 1410 WELM Elmira, a Robert Funtner Group station. Growing pre-election tensions in South Africa and USA arriving in Colombia. With Mutual PM, I'm Carrie Moran in Los Angeles. With South Africa's whites-only national elections just two days away, there was another anti-apartheid protest in Cape Town, this time resulting in the arrests of Anglican Archbishop Desmond Tutu and other activists. Reporter Chris Gibbons was asked if Tutu will be charged with any crime. The official response to that question is that the police are still investigating, but in practice the answer is no. The South African government in the days after the coming election will be looking to prove to the outside world that its new leader, Mr. de Klerk, is reform-minded. Archbishop Tutu on trial is not likely to help him get that message across. Today's incident was the latest in a series of pre-election protests that have become increasingly oppressive despite acting President F.W. de Klerk's call today for an end to racial separation in South Africa. Saturday Night Theatre. Down your cow. What the hell? Oh, damn fool. Hey, you! Look, look out! Get off the runway! You... Look out! You'll be killed! You'll be killed! God, I went right through him. I went right through him. He just stood there and I went straight through him. I shall never forget Wainwright telling us about the ghost. The poor man refused to believe he hadn't killed someone. After all, he'd seen the figure quite clearly standing on the runway. And then after he'd run back to find him, there was nothing. No sign of a body. Only bloodstains. Everywhere. I think I was the only person in Montrose camp who understood a little of Wainwright's bewilderment... Because the previous night, I too had seen the ghost. It seems very strange to be writing all this now. After all, 27 years have elapsed since I first saw the ghost. 
But the events of the last few days have made me realize that I have to try to explain why it has again returned to haunt us. The Montrose Ghost by Martin Jenkins Based upon a short story of the same title by Harold Balfour, Lord Balfour of Inchrye With John Pullen and Rosalind Shanks The Montrose Ghost The date today is July the 5th, 1942 But this extraordinary story begins one morning in the spring of 1915. After six hectic months over the other side of the German line, I'd been posted to the Royal Flying Corps Station in Montrose, Scotland, as a flying instructor. My nerves were in a bad way, and Montrose seemed an ideal spot to relax. See who it is, Flight. So, it's Mr. Adams, sir. What does he want? I'd like a private word, please, sir. Well, if it's personal, you should really speak to Major Holt, the station commander. I know, sir. Very well, you better come in, but only for a couple of minutes. Thank you, sir. Hang on outside, would you, Flight? Right, sir. Now, Adam, what is it? It's my wife, sir. I didn't even know you were married. We were married just after Hogmanay on the 4th of January. Well, belated congratulations. Now, what can I do to help? I'd like to ask for permission to live outside the camp, sir. Mm, I see. Well, to be quite honest, I'm not certain what the regulations are. I believe that married members of the flying staff are allowed outside. Ah, yes, but they're permanent staff. Now, I shall have to refer your request direct to Major Holt. Do you think he'll be understanding, sir? Well, I think uh, if you can live out, he'll give his permission. Thank you, sir. Where's your wife living now? With her parents. Is she from Montrose? We both are, sir. And you feel you'd like a little privacy? Since we've been married, we've only had one week when we've been completely alone. The rest of the time, I've either been at ground school or we've had to stay with her family. Right. I'll have a word with Major Holt this morning and let you know what he says after classes. Thank you very much, sir. By the way, how are you getting on with the training? Things improving a bit? I hope so, sir. Yes, so do I. The flight sergeant was telling me earlier this morning that he hopes to get you all airborne this week if the weather improves. I think I'll enjoy the actual flying, sir. Everybody always does. You just make sure you know exactly what you're doing. We don't want you crashing before you've had your fair crack at the hunt. No, sir. Right. Send flight sergeant Wood in, will you? Yes, sir. And thank you, sir. The captain wants you, flight. Very good, Mr. Adam. You wanted me, sir? Hmm. Shut the door, Frank. Sir. Did you know Adam was married? Yes, sir. Pretty girl. Not long out of nappies. Do you think it would be a good idea if Adam was to live outside camp? Well, he needs some incentive. At the moment, he's the worst of the bunch, and that's not saying much. Well, I think it might be just what he needs. What he needs, sir, begging your pardon, is a firm kick up the backside. Perhaps what he really needs is to be told that he's no damn good. That wartime flying is not some fun and games exercise like hunting, shooting and fishing. How the hell are we supposed to tell men like Adam that they'll probably be shot down within two weeks of arriving in France? We don't, sir. We teach them how to survive. Can you seriously imagine Adam or Jackson or Campbell Smith lasting more than a week in the squadron? You've said yourself, sir, they've got to learn, then have a lot of luck. After all, we were probably just as bad when we started. Yes. Look, sir, it's none of my business, I know that, but why don't you have a night out this evening? Quite a few of the men are going into town to celebrate the possibility of our getting airborne tomorrow. I appreciate the thought flight, and I may well take you up on it. Now, I think I'd better pop along and have a word with Major Holt about young Adam. You hold the fort here. Sir? After two nights of quite heavy drinking in the mess, I decided to take the flight sergeant's advice and have a night on the town. When I arrived at the Stag Hotel... I had no notion of the horrifying events that were to start that night. Hello, Adam. Oh, good evening, sir. Uh, This is my wife, Sylvia. I'm very pleased to meet you, Captain. Rupert has told me a great deal about you. And it's a pleasure to meet you, Mrs. Adam, I assure you. I've hardly met any of Rupert's colleagues. 
he keeps you all very secret. <laughs> well, we have been very busy. In fact, this is my first visit into Montrose since I arrived. Can I get you a drink, sir? Well, I was just about to go. But I'd like a small whiskey, please, with water. Sylvia? The same, please, darling. If you'll excuse me, sir. Yes, of course. So you are training Rupert to fly, Captain. I think he's a very lucky man. I don't do the actual training, Mrs. Adam. Your husband has simply been posted to my flight. Oh. oh his instruction is in the hands of Flight Sergeant Wood. Oh, and I've heard a lot about him, too. Uh -huh. Rupert seems positively terrified of him. Oh, flight sergeants are a very maligned race. <laughs> oh, Wood's an excellent man. Before the war, he used to be flying at Hendon. Your husband really is in very good hands. But you are a flyer yourself. Yes. Well, the whole camp seems to be here tonight. And Rupert has spent the whole evening avoiding them. I think he's worried they might all descend on us. Oh, I can understand how he feels. I think he's the only married man in his group. Here we are. One large whiskey and water. Uh, one small one for you, darling. Aren't you having anything? I uh, didn't really fancy one just at the minute. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Honestly, you are so funny. Do you have to keep being so formal? Why can't you simply call each other Rupert and... Oh, I'm sorry, Captain, I don't know your first name. Desmond. There you are, Rupert and Desmond. Or is it not allowed? I certainly have no objection. Then you must call me Sylvia. The only thing I do insist is that we drop the Christian names back at the camp. On all occasions. Of course, sir. Uh, Desmond. Desmond. <laughs> Now, I want to know all about your flying career, Desmond. Oh, it's not very outstanding. You're just being modest. Rupert tells me you were awarded the Military Cross. Yes, I was. You must be terribly proud. It's not all that remarkable. What did you have to do? Stay alive. That's what I keep trying to teach them. How to stay alive. How many planes did you actually shoot down? Oh, two or three, I think. Really? And is that why you got the MC? Partially. Did you feel excited? Excited? What do you mean, when I was awarded the MC? No. When you were up there, face to face with a German. Most of it is luck. After all, you only have a 50-50 chance. Then you must be very brave. No more than the Germans I shot down. You see, Mrs. Adam, it really is luck. Except in a few cases when you score a direct hit from behind. And then the other poor devil doesn't stand a chance. You just sit and watch him struggling to get out. Will you join us for dinner? N no, no, I, I really... Please? <laughs> here. Rupert hasn't told you, has he? What? Anything? No, I don't think so. He wants so desperately to be a pilot. Yes, I know. But he's not very good, is he? Average. As good as you were at this stage. Sylvia, that's hard. As good as Camberley Smith. But tell me, Desmond, I I'm want to know. I'm not allowed to Tell talk. me. Major Holt has given him a fortnight, and then he must take his solo. Has he been all right so far? Well, that's difficult to say. He hasn't done any solo flights yet. But he told me he'd done over eight hours solo. Isn't that true? Do you mean he hasn't even been up once on his own? I see. Isn't it stupid, but I didn't think he'd lied to me. I expect he meant to tell you the truth. No. How old are you, Desmond? Nearly 22. Why? So is Rupert. Yes, I know. His birthday is January the 4th, the day we were married. He lied to me then. Oh, oh, not openly, but he implied things. Sylvia, don't you think I should go? I won't get all tearful, I promise you. It's not that, is it? Desmond, do you know what it's like living in a town where everybody knows your business? I'm afraid I was born in Croydon. We all kept very much to ourselves. People would say, so, you're marrying the Adam boy, are you? Then they'd smirk, not openly, but they knew I could see all right. 
I don't even think my father really approved. Look, I, I think you're upset. I'm but... not upset, Desmond. For God's sake, don't talk to me like a child. I'm sorry. That's just what Rupert says. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Till I'm sick of it. If only he'd stop apologising. Sylvia, listen to me for a second. I've known that things weren't exactly 100% between you and Rupert. But I thought Rupert was worried about his flying. If there are other things and you think it could help Rupert, then I'll listen. I've become fond of you both and I want Rupert to succeed so that you can be happy. Does that make sense? Did you know Rupert's jealous of you? In God's name, why? The times we've danced together. The evening we went out before he came home. Oh, hundreds of little things. But Rupert idolises you. From a distance. I don't understand. Neither do I. To Rupert, I'm some kind of child to be loved at arm's length. When we were engaged, Rupert made a great point of saying that he had already had some kind of experience. He was most anxious that I should believe him. He even told me the days it happened. But you see, it was all lies. And now, when Rupert sees us together... He sits and watches us. But then when he and I are alone, nothing. Nothing at all. Then perhaps you're imagining he's jealous. If he was, wouldn't he say something? Is that what you'd do? Yes. Why? Because you're a very beautiful and attractive woman. I don't believe Rupert would raise a finger to me even if I went to bed with another man. That's a terrible thing to say. Is it? When I've been married for five months and he has never once... I don't believe you. You see, we both love each other. But Rupert cannot consummate our marriage. And since I met you, things have been even worse. Why? Why? I told you that Rupert was jealous. Well, so am I. At night, I have longed for you to take Rupert's place. But you still love Rupert. Oh, yes. I've tried to convince myself that in time he would grow more confident, but he hasn't. I need to know that I am capable of loving completely. But you must believe that one day... He one will... day? This year, next year, sometime. I don't think I could bear it if it never happened. No. So you see, Desmond, you don't even have to go to all the trouble of seducing me. I'm a very easy conquest. Happy? Very. And you? Yes. What's the matter? Hmm? You've been lying there staring into space. Rupert's coming out of hospital tomorrow. Yes, I know. Are you glad? Yes. You do realize that during the last three weeks I've fallen in love with you? I'm sorry. And now I don't want to lose you. But Rupert need never know. We can still see each other. No. I feel guilty enough as it is. I've betrayed Rupert. I've slept with you and... I hate the idea of you being with him. But he is my husband. Sylvia, can't you leave him? Please. No. But you still want us to keep meeting? We've had three wonderful weeks. Beautiful weeks. I don't want those to finish. You want to keep seeing me so that I can make up for Rupert's sexual inadequacies? Does that make you feel guilty too? Oh, it makes me feel sick. 
So what am I supposed to do? Love you from a distance, wait for you to phone me? Knowing that one day I shall be sent back overseas? I can't leave Rupert. Why not? You know why. Without me, Rupert would have nothing. He needs me. Did I mean anything to you? That's not fair. It damn well is. I don't love you, if that's what you mean. Then why the hell did you make me think you did? I enjoy being in bed with you. And from what I've heard, most men would be only too pleased to have a regular affair. Yes. Well, not me. But you've been with women before. You told me. Not like this. Now you're behaving exactly like Rupert. You're upset because you can't have your own way. The only thing I want is you. Well, I'm not free. Oh. Kiss me. I'm going. Desmond, don't. I mean it. But, but it's early. Yes. You're serious. Sylvia, you say you belong with Rupert. But that means I mustn't see you. Don't you understand that I could end up destroying Rupert? That is why we must agree never to be alone together. So you're doing this for Rupert? For the past few weeks, I've tried to forget Rupert. I knew, of course, that he would get better, but I hope... What? I hoped you'd fall in love with me. But you knew that was impossible. I know now. Look at me. Tell me to my face that you will never try to see me alone again. Very well. Promise? I promise. Now, please go. It's for the best. If you say so. Perhaps Rupert will be different. Goodbye, Desmond. Goodbye. We kept our word. Rupert returned from the hospital. The three of us still met in public. But he didn't seem to have any inkling that anything had passed between us. Sylvia was possessive, motherly. She lavished affection on him. After four weeks of convalescence, Rupert resumed his training. But there was no improvement. Major Holt again issued an ultimatum. I know he's been ill. I know you think he'll improve, but the point is when? Give him another fortnight. And then what? Another month? He, he just needs confidence. Desmond, we are not running a kindergarten. We're supposed to be training young pilots. Well, yesterday he did quite well. The flight was relatively pleased, and that's encouraging in itself. Very well. He can have two more days, and then he goes solo. And if I don't... He think... flies solo, or he's out. And if I don't think he's ready? Then send him straight to me. I see. Thank you, sir. Desmond. Yes, sir. It may be kinder to Adam in the end. <laughs> to let him know he's a complete failure? To save his life. After all, he is married. Yes, sir. Don't let this become too much of a personal challenge, Desmond. Would you like me to transfer Adam to another group? No, sir. Thank you. Two days, then. I want a full report. Naturally, sir. For those two days, Wood and I devoted all our energies to getting Rupert into the right frame of mind. Looking back, we were quite encouraged. He seemed to have a new kind of determination. His concentration was better. And above all, he actually managed one dual flight without making a single major mistake. The night before his solo, I was drinking in the officer's mess when I was called to the telephone. Hello, Captain Little. Desmond, I must see you. Sylvia, you shouldn't telephone me here. Can you come immediately? Is Rupert there? He's gone to his mother's. We agree. I not... have to see you. But I... Desmond, please don't argue. Just come. Why? I'll see you in half an hour. Bye. Thank you for coming, Desmond. What is all this? Do you want a drink? Sylvia, we agreed not to see each other. I meant what I said. But you're here. You sounded very upset. I'm pregnant. Are you sure? Confirmed this morning. And I suppose it couldn't possibly be Rupert's? No. 
Would you consider having it removed? It's alive now, Desmond. That would be murder. Then you have to tell Rupert. Get a divorce and later we can get married. I've told you I can't leave him. Things haven't improved? No. We had another failure last night. Rupert left this morning saying we must both learn to face the situation. He even suggested I might want a divorce on the grounds of his incapacity. Funny sort of annulment. I get a divorce because I'm still a virgin and seven months later I produce a baby. Sylvia, he can't make love to you. You're pregnant. He'll know it's not his child. Either you leave him or you stay. It's your decision. And if I can't decide... You must. It's not that simple. You either stay or you leave. And you want me to leave? Yes. I was sick this morning. Rupert was very concerned. He wanted me to see Dr. Fielding. Did you? I told you he confirmed it. Would he say anything to Rupert? He might. I asked him not to. He seemed to find that very amusing. Keeping the happy event a secret for a little bit longer. Leave, Rupert. Come with me. Please, Sylvia. Rupert would find a new life for himself. Especially after he's taken his first solo tomorrow. Tomorrow? Didn't he tell you? Will he be all right? If he keeps his head. And if not? Then we wouldn't allow him to fly. Would he crash? He might. Then he would never know. No. Look after him, Desmond. Passing that test means everything to him. If he fails, I don't know what he'd do. It's not that important. Isn't it? I think it's important to all of us. I I'll tell you tomorrow what I've decided. After Rupert has taken his solo. I'll phone you. Tell you what happened. I'll be waiting. Right. We'll find some way around it. Trust me. Yes, Desmond. I trust you. What the hell did you think you were doing? I'm sorry, sir. Sorry? How many times have we told you to watch your speed on the turn? I seem to get muddled. The arrest was quite reasonable, sir. If you'd stalled, you'd be dead now. I did manage to pull out of it. That's true, sir. He's you dead. shouldn't have got into it in the first place. I think perhaps I should give Mr. Adam one more spin. Take him through the whole thing once more. I'd be grateful, Flight. No. You go up straight away. Solo. But, sir... Now, Adam. If I might suggest, sir... Mr. It could Adam be... will take off in five minutes, Flight Sergeant. Yes, sir. See, everything's ready. Sir? Desmond, for God's sake, I'm not ready. If you don't go so low now, Major Holt will have you out of the court. It has to be today. Listen, Rupert. You're perfectly capable of flying that aircraft. You know you are. Ten minutes round and you'll have done it. I can't. You have no choice. And if I refuse? You have to fly that plane. Please, Desmond! For heaven's sake, aren't you man enough? No. No, if that's what you want me to say, no, I don't think I am. Just ten minutes. Keep your head, remember what you've been told, and you'll be perfectly all right. Believe me, Rupert. You'll do it? It can't be my decision, can it? Very well. I am ordering you to take your first solo flight now. Sylvia will be very proud of me if I succeed. Yes. Flight! Mr. Adam is ready now. Very good, sir. Now remember, keep a clear head and plenty of speed and you'll be fine. Stupid, isn't it? I've always wanted to be a pilot. But like so many other things... I never thought it would happen. Ready, sir. Just coming. I want you to pass, Rupert. And I know you can. Right, then. Off you go. Contact. Contact. See you when I get down, sir. Yes, of course.
So far, so good. Takeoff was quite smooth. He's holding steady. 400 feet. Good regulation height. Now the first turn. Round he comes. Whoops, a little bit slow. It's all right, though. He managed to put on some bank, all right. Is that young Adam? Yes, sir. I thought I'd better take a look. Of course, sir. He's just completed one length of the airfield, sir. He seems to be doing all right. I think he knows what has to be done. Although I did have to order him into the plane. Good God, what the hell? The silly young fool's letting that nose up again. Get him to watch his speed. Watch your speed. Your speed. It's getting worse. He'll stall. Rupert, for God's sake, get that nose down. Poor bastard. Why do they bother? Take control, will you, Flight Sergeant? Sir? He didn't feel a thing. He couldn't have. Not in that. I've seen three enemy planes disintegrate, but always from the air. What you need is a stiff drink. No, sir. Thank you. Rupert Adam was in my command. My duty is to be with him. You can't do anything. It's my duty. I shall want a full report, Desmond, first thing tomorrow. Did you know he actually wanted to be a pilot? Now, sir, if you'll excuse me. Hospitals are all the same. They smell of disinfectant. Rupert was cleaned up. What was left of him. And they allowed me to go in. His face was terribly lacerated. I remember standing by him, talking to him. Asking him what I should do. But he was so still. A stillness that hurt me. Back at the camp, Major Holt told me that his wife had broken the news to Sylvia. After we had agreed on a time for the court of inquiry, he suggested that, as I was a friend of Rupert's, I should go and tell Sylvia what had happened. Yes? It's me. Sylvia, I'm... I'm sorry. They say you could hear the sound of the crash over a mile from the camp. The smoke was very black. I saw that quite distinctly. He didn't feel any pain. Mrs. Holt told me he would have died instantly. Yes. What happened? He stalled completely and... Why? Why? Why was Rupert flying at all? You knew he was too frightened. Oh, I didn't think I should really talk about that. Why? Well, because there'll have to be questions asked later. No. Now. He took his solo because I ordered him to. Then you sent him to his death. If Rupert hadn't flown this morning, he would have had to leave the corps. You sent Rupert to his death. You killed him. Sylvia, that is nonsense. Dangerous nonsense. Dangerous? For who? If Rupert was ever to prove to himself that he could fly, then I had to order him into that plane. It was for his own good. His own good? Desmond, Rupert is dead. Because of his own negligence. The inquiry will confirm that. Don't you think your distinguished inquiry might be interested to hear that you are the father of my child and not Rupert? They could put two and two together. He crashed because of sheer careless flying. After you had ordered him into the plane. Why, Desmond, why? Did you think this could solve our little problem? Sylvia, that is a terrible accusation. But is it true? If you hadn't known I was pregnant, would you still have ordered Rupert to his death this morning? For God's sake! Would you? What exists between us had no bearing at all on my actions. Desmond, I don't believe you. 
You killed Rupert this morning. You deliberately sent him to his death, knowing that he would crash. That's not true. I swear to you, it's not true. You killed him so you could marry me. You saw that by getting rid of Rupert, you could have everything you wanted. He stalled and... You murdered Rupert in cold blood. Shut up! It is true, isn't it? Isn't it? I don't know. I don't know. Rupert was weak. You'd made love to me. I carry your child. Rupert would never have passed to be a pilot. You knew that. What could be easier? Please, Sylvia, be quiet. And if I refuse? Will you order me or kill me? Oh, everything you say is untrue. Well, do you think I could hurt you that much when I love you? Yes. What will happen to the child now? Do you mean Rupert's unborn son? But he's our child, yours and mine. No, Desmond, he's Rupert's son, Rupert's and mine. Oh, you can't... But doesn't it solve everything? You kill Rupert. Now, no one need ever know. Everyone will think that Rupert left a son. From today, he'll be an Adam. I shall bring him up here. So, you see, Desmond, you need never have anything more to do with us. You made me promise I should never see you again. Now, I agree. But nothing that you've said is true. Perhaps Rupert knows the truth. But he's dead. His son is alive. And that is all that will matter to me for the rest of my life. Sylvia. Please go. That night, I was very drunk. They had to carry me to my quarters. I was undressed and put to bed. It was when I woke up that I first saw Rupert's ghost. Ooh, my head. Oh God, what time is it? <gasps> what the devil do you want? Who are you? Oh, my God. Blood. Blood all over. I saw you. What do you want? Rupert, is Sylvia telling the truth? Did I kill you deliberately? God, what am I saying? Did you know he was my son? Rupert, listen to me. Rupert! He stood there. Here. Right beside the foot of the bed. Desmond, listen, you were very drunk. He was badly cut. The blood was running down his clothes onto the floor. You see there? Blood stains. It's blood, all right. And here's my handkerchief. You can see. I tried to wipe it up before I came to you. But the whole thing's preposterous. It was Rupert Adam, I swear it. But dash it, old man, Adam is dead. Yes. What the hell do we do? Nothing. Nothing? Is anyone going to believe I saw a ghost? Do you believe it? Oh, Desmond, how can I say? Ghosts, the supernatural, I, I just don't know. Then leave it. In a way, I'm sorry I panicked and involved you. I'm not sure that's what Rupert intended. Yes, well, come and see me first thing and... Oh, let me have that handkerchief. Yes, of course. My God, there's nothing on it. Are you sure? Well, you must have two. That's the handkerchief. But that's not possible. I saw that blood not two minutes ago. Look, sir. On the floor. The blood stains have gone as well. Just a few seconds more and I'll be down, you old cow. What the hell? Oh, damn fool. Hey, you! Look, look out! Get off the runway! You... Look out! You'll be killed! You'll be killed! God, I went right through him. I went right through him. He just stood there and I went straight through him. 
sorry, sir. Begging your pardon. Yes, what I... is it, Flight Sergeant? It's Mr. Wainwright, sir. He's well, he's in a bad state of shock. I think I've killed someone, sir. Killed? I'd just touched down on the runway and suddenly I saw him standing right in front of me. I tried to yell at him to get out of the way. I shouted and shouted. But he just stood there. Just before I hit him, I saw that he was absolutely drenched in blood. Well, after I'd pulled up, I ran back to the spot and there was no one there. Nothing at all. No sign except... Yes? Bloodstains. There, there were quite clear bloodstains. Where was this? About ten yards from where young Mr. Adam crashed. Well, that's the whole point. Just before I hit him, I saw his face. Yes? It was Adam, sir. The man on the runway was Adam. The devil am I supposed to tell Wing HQ? Excuse me, sir. Well, is there a body? No, sir. And the blood that Wainwright says he saw, well... Well, there's nothing there, no. My God. And I thought an officer's life was fairly uncomplicated. Why should Rupert want to return and terrify Wainwright? You tell me. I know why he wants me. Why? I sent him to his death. Desmond, that's nonsense. I ordered you to get him into the air on his own. In that case, we're both guilty. Excuse me, sir, but there are some pretty wild rumours starting to fly around. Shouldn't we take some sort of action? What do you advise? Stop all flying until we can clear this up. So you believe what Captain Little is saying? I don't disbelieve it, sir. Very well. I shall tell the adjutant to call a mass meeting of the entire camp in three hours' time. That's all, Flight Sergeant. Sir. Well, Desmond, I think we should pray that this, whatever it is, doesn't appear again. Prayer had never been a particularly strong point of mine. But I remember I tried. I felt an increasing sense of guilt that I was responsible for Rupert's reappearance. Why had he come? What was he trying to say? Even today, I cannot be too certain if I ever understood exactly what he intended. But when I awoke the next night and saw him again, I thought at the time he'd made it clear enough. You're quite sure about this, Desmond? I have put a formal application to you in writing. May I ask why? I believe the sooner I leave the camp, clear out of Montrose altogether, the quicker things will get back to normal. You can have my room sealed and locked for all time. In other words, if you go, the ghost will disappear. I don't believe he'll reappear. Not once I've gone. When is the court of inquiry? Tomorrow. As soon as it's over, I think I should leave. Very well. I just hope you're right. In the meantime, may I suggest we set up an intensive day of courses... Take the men's minds off the whole business? Yes, of course. Do you know, Desmond, just five minutes ago, the Padre phoned requesting permission to hold a special service of exorcism. It might help. I refused. I told the Padre it would only add fuel to the fire. He wasn't too pleased, threatened me with a higher authority. Damn it, Desmond, if I had agreed, it would have been tantamount to admitting the whole thing was official. You did see the bloodstains. Look, I'm not saying I don't believe you, but, well, I have to consider morale. If this thing really takes hold, there's no knowing where it'll end. Then the sooner I'm gone, the better. And if it doesn't stop, then? The Padre will hold his exorcism service, the army bigwigs will take over, and it'll be out of your hands. I'll make sure all your papers are in order and you can be away directly the inquiry is over. I'd like to return straight to the front. Desmond... That's what I want, sir. Uh, you haven't got some stupid idea of getting yourself shot down by the first Hun you see. It'd be a waste of a damn fine aircraft. <laughs> you won't get rid of me that easily. Well, that seems to be that. Will you tell Mrs. Adam yourself? May I leave that to you, sir? Oh, wouldn't she like to see you? After all, you were very friendly with the Adams. She's probably too upset for visitors. Poor girl. I suppose she'd be all right at the funeral. They can be very distressing. If that's all, sir. I'm sorry it had to end this way, Desmond. I wish you could have stayed. If you want this camp to return to normal, then I have to go. There's no other way. I was right. The camp did return to normal. I left straight after the inquiry recorded a verdict of accidental death while flying solo. And Rupert's ghost was never seen again. At least, not in Montrose. 
I was then certain Rupert had wanted me to leave Montrose. He had haunted the camp to force me to leave. Perhaps without me, Sylvia and the child would be his. In 1940, following a spell as air officer commanding the Battle of Britain Station at Tangmere, I was promoted to Air Vice Marshal and given command of Number 32 Group here at Benson in Oxfordshire. When I arrived here, all memories of Montrose had faded. Twenty-seven years had passed. However, one event, one conversation was to bring the appalling business flooding back into my memory. It was exactly two days ago that the whole story started again. July the 3rd, 1942. You wanted me, sir? Oh, shut the door, Anne. I want you to hurry up those photographs that were taken yesterday. White Hall have been ringing emergency bells. Right, sir. Anything to sign? Just these. Oh. Oh, is that all? Well, there is a personal matter. I meant to tell you last night, but you'd already gone to bed. And you want to know if I have ten minutes to spare now? Yes, please. Request granted, flight officer. I don't quite know where to begin. Sounds ominous. It's not. At least I hope not. I want to get married. Anne? We were engaged last engaged? night. Engaged? Yes. At half past ten, in the bus station at Oxford. Oh, very romantic. <laughs> I wanted you to be the first to know. Well, I'm very pleased. And I know your father and mother would have been as well. Oh, Dad, he would have played hell. He didn't approve of anyone getting married until they were at least 21. Which you are, in exactly one month. <laughs> Funny, it's been easy summoning up the courage to tell you. I think I should have been much more nervous of telling Daddy. Where did you meet this young man? Here, on the camp. Oh, you mean he's... He's a flight lieutenant in the PRU. Flies spits over Germany to get pictures. And I do know what PRU gets up to. At least I hope I do. That's the trouble of having a commanding officer as a godfather. He knows everything about everything. Not everything. How long have you known him? Three weeks, two days, and just over eight hours. And you're quite certain? Yes. When can I meet him? Tonight? I could ask him up to Air House before dinner. Fine. What's his name? Flight Lieutenant Adam. Adam? Yes. Do you know him? Huh? No, 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 I don't think so. Rupert was a bit nervous at the prospect of meeting you, but I told him... Desmond, what's the matter? It's nothing. Are you all right? Mm -hmm. Whatever's wrong? You're white as a sheet. Shall I get the M.O.? No, no, no. I, I, I shall be perfectly all right in a minute. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have bothered oh, you. No, no, nonsense. No, it's, it's a touch of giddiness. I, I get it occasionally when I'm tired. Look, forget about tonight. No, certainly not. Rupert can come over tomorrow. Tonight will be fine. I won't mind, honestly. And I'm perfectly all right. You bring him along tonight. Let me get the M.O. to have a quick look and at And stop you. pestering, for heaven's sake. Sorry. So am I. You're very like Daddy, really. Why? He used to get cross with me, too. <laughs> Am I forgiven? Dear Desmond. <sniffs> when Mummy and Daddy were killed, everything I loved had gone. Now I have you and Rupert. You will like him, won't you? That sounds very like an order. I know you will. Bring him along at 6.15. And now, Flight Officer Douglas, back to work. Yes, sir. Oh, by the way, where does... Rupert come from? Scotland somewhere, Montrose. His father was in the RFC, like you. But he was killed in some sort of accident. See you later. And, Desmond, thank you. Oh, my God. Nervous? I'd rather be somewhere else. He won't bite. And you have definitely told him? Yes. And he didn't mind? He was a bit surprised. In fact, he went quite pale. I thought you said he was pleased. He was stupid. I just chose a day when he was a bit off colour. Well, then shouldn't we skip tonight? He insisted on seeing you. 
He could hardly refuse after the glowing report I gave you. Happy? Yes. Is that all? Want me to prove it? Mm, hey, but not now. <laughs> Time we made an appearance. Hey, wait a minute. What the hell do I call him? Godfather-in-law to be? He's my AOC. Why not, sir? Oh, very original. Honestly, he's very sweet. Since my parents were killed, he's done everything for me. Just forget he's our AOC and simply remember you're my fiancé. That should break the ice. Now, come on. There you are. Come in, come in. Well, you must be Rupert. I've already heard a great deal about you. Very pleased to meet you, sir. <laughs> now, drinks. I, Anne, I know we'll have sherry. Rupert? Uh, the same, please, sir. Now, despite the war, I do have several good Scotch whiskies. I prefer sherry. Thank ah, you, sir. Yes. And pass round the biscuits. A uh, dinner will be later. You will both stay. Well, sir... We'd uh, love to. Good. Thought you might... So I've had everything set up for three. There, now. Two sherries. Oh, thank you, sir. I have told Rupert there's no need for him to stand to attention the whole time. I'm not. You haven't relaxed since we came in. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> well, look here, Rupert. I think we could be a little less formal, even within these hallowed walls. How about Desmond? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, right. Desmond. Ten out of ten for initiative. You didn't know you had such a fearsome reputation, did you? A good AOC knows everything. <laughs> now, Rupert, uh, tell me something about yourself. Well, sir, I'm Scots. Uh, I was born in a little town called Montrose. Do you know it? Yes, I do. As a matter of fact, I was stationed there once. Oh, really, sir? When? Oh, years ago. Anne tells me your father was killed. I'm sorry. In a flying accident. It happened before Rupert was born. He never even knew his father. I'm not sure which is worse. It's funny, he never really was my father. He was just a series of photographs. Someone my mother and grandmother used to talk about. So, in a sense, he was a complete stranger to me. Does your mother still live in Montrose? Oh, no, no, she's in London. We came south in 1938 after I got my A licence. Rupert's very anxious for you to meet her. Yes. Yes, of course. When could you, Desmond? Well, I... Actually, she's, um... She's coming up to Oxford tomorrow to meet Anne. Uh, would tomorrow evening be convenient? You've no other engagements. <laughs> That's one advantage of having a goddaughter as secretary. She knows everything I'm doing. <laughs> yes, of course it would be ideal. Would your mother care to come for dinner? I think she'd be delighted. Rupert will find out definitely and let me know. <laughs> and then you, no doubt, will tell me. <laughs> Do you know how your father was killed? Yes, he crashed from 400 feet. Uh, died instantly. Apparently, he'd been ill, and my mother always maintains he wasn't really fit. It was his first solo flight. Tell Desmond about the ghost. Ah, no, that's just superstition. Local tittle-tattle. Ghost? Aye, ah, stupid rumour. Well, apparently after my father was killed, local people claimed my father had been seen as a ghost by some of the men at the camp. If you go up to Montrose today, there'll be some old drunk who'll tell you about the ghosty. And what's odd, Rupert's mother will never talk about it. She flatly refuses to tell Rupert anything. You see, sir, I have exactly the same name as my father, and ever since I was a little lad, my mother's one ambition was for me to be a flyer. She used to take me up to the camp to watch the planes and tell me, one day you'll fly one of those. And now here I am. Thank heaven. Personally, I don't believe in the supernatural. <laughs> now, I think dinner should be just about ready. And uh, nip out and tell Edward he can serve. Oh, come on, Rupert. I'll show you through to the dining room. Oh, right, sir. Thank you. Right, Desmond. How many more times? Sometimes I despair of any normal home life ever again. I had dreaded meeting my son. Would he resemble me? Would either of them notice the similarity? I needn't have worried. Rupert had his mother's features. The same chestnut-coloured hair. The deep... Intense blue eyes. He talked so openly about his father, the father he had never known, the father he presumed to have died in an air crash. And now I had agreed, for Anne's sake, to meet Sylvia. But I knew it could be disastrous. Very early next morning, I ordered a car and was driven up to London, ostensibly on urgent business. In fact, I told the driver to take me to Eaton Square. 
I had obtained Sylvia's address from Rupert's file. Well, Desmond, I can't say I'm pleased to see you. I must apologize for contacting you suddenly out of the blue. It's been a long time. But I felt it was most important. You're older, greyer. You're still a very beautiful woman. I don't think you called to pay me compliments. What do you want, Desmond? Do you know which group Rupert is in? Of course, number 32 at Benson. And do you know who his AOC is? You? Yes. It was quite a shock to me as well, to be suddenly introduced to my own son. Rupert is my son. His father is dead. He is also my son. No, Desmond, I kept my promise. I swore that I would bring him up as Rupert's son. And I said I would never see you again. I had also intended to keep my word. But yesterday, my goddaughter, Anne, came to see me. She told me she wanted to get married. To Rupert. Anne is your goddaughter? Yes. Her mother was killed in an air raid, and then, last year, her father was lost at sea. I had no idea. She's like a daughter to me. So, you see, I wouldn't want her to be hurt. Does Rupert know you are Anne's godfather? Of course. I met them both last night for dinner. You didn't tell Rupert who you were. Sylvia, I'm not that stupid. It's quite obvious that we, we cannot agree to the marriage, for both their sakes. In God's name, why? You can ask me that. I want Rupert to have nothing to do with you. I told you that before he was born. Now you say your goddaughter wants to marry him. I could never allow that. Anne has no blood ties to I me. have told you what I want. Now, Desmond, I think you should go. I've no wish to prolong this discussion. Well, what will you tell Rupert? That is none of your business. Oh, but I think it is. If those two youngsters love each other, what possible right have you to prevent their marriage? I am Rupert's mother. He will listen to me. Well, well what are you trying to protect him from? Well, are you still going to allow something that happened all those years ago to ruin their future? I want to safeguard Rupert's future. And that means forbidding his marriage to Anne? If necessary, yes. What are you so frightened of? Myself. I'm frightened of what I know. I don't understand. Frightened of what can happen if you love someone too much. You mean Rupert? No, Desmond, I mean you. Me? All that time at Montrose, it was you I loved, you I wanted to be with. But you... I know I sent you away. Because you loved Rupert? Because I knew I had in some measure caused his death. After all, if he died, I could be free with you. Then that awful afternoon when they told me he'd been killed, and then later when you told me you'd been forced to order him into the air... It had all come true. We could be together. But I knew I should never be able to live with the belief that I had in some way made you order Rupert to fly that day. You should have told me. The only thing I could think of was the baby. He had to be protected. He must never know what I had done. Above all, he must be proud of his dead father. I resolved that I should never see you again. I hated myself so much that it was not difficult to hate you as well. And now you think I could harm Rupert again? We both could. But he's so unlike... So unlike Rupert. He's confident, proud... Just like his real father. You mean you have told him who I am? No, I wanted him to grow up like you. I wanted him to be a young Desmond Little. The only difference would be that he'd believe his father was called Rupert Adam. And you're proud of him? He's everything I could have wished. I don't want that spoilt, Desmond. And you think if he marries Anne, things will change? It would bring us together again. There is always the possibility that one or other of them would learn the truth. Then let us meet deliberately, but as perfect strangers. Let them see us together. Then once the wedding arrangements have been settled, we only need meet very infrequently. It frightens me. 
There's been so much unhappiness, I don't want either of them to suffer for what we did in the past. Well, they need never know. It's Rupert and Anne who are important now. You can't just end their engagement without any explanation. Well, have you thought how Rupert would feel if you did? You could end up losing him. Yes, I know. So you think we should all meet? Well, Rupert told me you were coming up to Oxford later today to meet Anne. I'll ask you all back to Air House for dinner. Nothing could be simpler. Desmond, you left Montrose against your will because I wanted you to. I shall come to Air House tomorrow knowing in my heart that it's wrong. It's not wrong. In no way can it but be wrong. But I shall come because you want me to. I only hope you don't end up hating me. I could never do that. That's what I believed once. That's what Anne and Rupert believe now. Do you still... Could you still love me? After all these years, what a wonderful, arrogant question. It could never be that simple, Desmond. When you walked through the door ten minutes ago, you were a stranger. Oh, perhaps it is possible to love a stranger who reminds you very strongly of someone you once knew. But the Desmond little I knew left me with a baby son. I loved him and I hated him. I loved him so much that I sacrificed my life for his child. And I hated him because he never allowed me any life of my own. It will take me time to accept the man you have become. Sylvia... Please don't ask me any more. I think we've both said enough for this afternoon. For the sake of Rupert, and because I understand a little bit how you feel for Anne, I shall come tonight. Uh, now, Desmond, I, I, I want to write some letters, so yeah, if you yes, will excuse yes, me. Yes, of course. I am looking forward to meeting Anne. Really. I am. All the way back to Benson, I was too amazed to think clearly. I had left Montrose because I thought Sylvia blamed me for Rupert's death. Now she had told me that she felt guilty herself. Suddenly I thought of Rupert Adams' ghost. And when I returned to Benson and found myself plunged into a terrifying personal dilemma, I knew that Rupert's ghost was still affecting our lives. He was, in fact, demanding some kind of sinister revenge... A revenge which I would ultimately have no chance of avoiding. Any messages? Captain Roberts and Wing Commander Buckle are waiting to see you. Oh. What is it, Jack? May we have a word in private, sir? Yes, of course. Go in my office. I won't be a second. Right, sir. And any news about this evening? Yes, Rupert just called. His mother will be delighted to come for dinner. Good. We'll see if you can rustle up some tea in about 20 minutes. I'm parched. Right. Oh, sit down, gentlemen. Well, Jack? Top secret coded signal from command. Air Ministry want us to lay on a special photo reconnaissance flight first thing tomorrow. Mm -hmm. What's the target? Intelligence have been receiving reports that the Germans are opening some kind of secret weapons factory here, just south of Rotterdam. And they want us to supply the photographs? Yes, and, uh, and a little more. Such as? After the pilot has taken his high-altitude shots, he's to fly down for a complete low-altitude coverage as well. Like hell they do. Buckle's quite right, sir. But that's virtually suicide. The poor bastard won't stand unearthly. Oh, they've thought of that, sir. He's also to break radio silence and give a full verbal description of everything he sees. But that'll make him an easy prey for every 109 and Fockable from the target to the coast. Must be damned important. Oh, is that all? The signal finishes by saying it's a direct cabinet order issued by the chief of the air staff's office. Doesn't exactly leave us much room to manoeuvre. Right, what steps have you taken so far? I've got Group Captain Banks preparing a first draft of operational orders. Good. Well, gentlemen, who do we send? Uh, the Wing Commander has prepared a short list, sir. First, sir, I think I should volunteer to go myself. You know that's not possible, Harry. I need you here. Then I have three names, sir. All flight lieutenants, all with adequate mission experience, all good men. I'm sorry, sir, but it does seem one hell of a risk. 
Are you going to tell them what's involved? It's no more risky than any photographic flight, that's all we say. Except we warn him to be extra careful. But he won't stand a chance. Easy on, Harry. Look, Harry, it's ours not to reason why. We've been ordered to undertake a particular mission. To air staff intelligence, it's important. They probably know the appalling risks just as well as we do. But they also know the vital value of anything we could get them by film and by word. Who are the three men? Blade, Sidney and Adam, sir. Blade, Sidney and... Adam, sir, Rupert Adam. And who do you recommend, Harry? Well, sir, Blades has the most experience, but he's fagged out after his last two missions. Also, he's married, sir, with two kids. So is Frank Sidney. In any case, he'd be my last choice. Why? Well, nothing too tangible. Has turned back once or twice. Ostensibly mechanical failure. Possible suggestion of LMF. We couldn't risk anyone on this, even with a suspicion of cowardice. You're absolutely sure. No, sir, but it's a strong doubt. What about Adam? Efficient, popular, good pilot, and he's single. So it's between Blades and Adam. Who do you recommend? With respect, sir, for something like this, I'd rather leave the final choice to you. Jack, make sure Banks has everything sewn up in a couple of hours. I want to go through the whole operation with you. Sir. And Wing Commander, will you inform Flight Lieutenant Adam that he's required to report for a special mission, codenamed Silent Panther, at 0800 hours tomorrow? Yes, sir. Perhaps if he pulls out every stop on the Merlin, he may be able to corkscrew upwards and outclimb the enemy. <sighs> That's possible. Mm, everything's possible, Harry. Don't write him off yet. No, sir. Sorry, sir. We must give Adam no inkling of the odds against him. Quite the opposite. He must believe he can succeed. And then, with luck, he might make it back. Right. That's all, gentlemen. Thank you. For fully five minutes after the men had left, I could hardly believe what had happened. On my direct order, another Rupert Adam was flying to almost certain death. Then I remembered Sylvia was expected for dinner. I would have to sit with her, with Rupert, with Anne. Was this Rupert's revenge? I dreaded our evening meeting. At first, it seemed to go quite smoothly. But suddenly, after the meal... Sylvia told the two youngsters she wanted to talk to me. Desmond, what is this mission Rupert is going on? It's routine. Anne seemed very worried, very uneasy. There's nothing to worry about. Rupert has to get some photographs of a top-secret enemy establishment. And that is routine? For us, yes. Rupert refuses to say anything at all. He's only obeying his orders. Whose orders? Yours? Indirectly, yes. Why is Rupert going? Why? Because he's the best man for the job. The best man? <laughs> Of all the men under your command, you had to choose Rupert. It was my duty. Sylvia, there really is nothing to concern yourself about. Just before we set out from my hotel, Anne confided in me that she was desperately worried. She'd heard two of your officers say the young bastard doesn't stand much chance. Then half an hour later she has a call from Rupert saying he's going on a secret mission. Well, she's put two and two together. Rupert had no right to say anything if to her. If anything happens to Rupert, I shall hold you personally responsible. Sylvia, the boy wants to go. I know that. He'd go if everything was against him. It's all in the line of duty. Isn't that what you say? Sylvia, you must believe I have no power to stop Rupert going. Has he any chance of returning? Of course. I love Rupert more than anything in the world. If he dies, I will turn Anne against you. You asked me this morning if I still loved you. I hate you, Desmond. You asked me as a stranger, but now you are not a stranger. You're the same man who came to see me after you sent my husband to his death. I hated you then. Now you're sending my son to his death. Again, I'm powerless to stop you because Rupert wouldn't listen to me. He's too proud, just like his father. Sylvia, if I could prevent this, Anne I would... Anne and I will make it our duty to hate you for the rest of our lives. I think I should be getting back, Mother. The Air Vice Marshal and I have finished. Well, good night, Rupert. I shall see you first thing in the morning. Try to sleep well. Oh, I shall, sir. No fears on that score. You'll see Mrs. Adam to the door, eh? Right. Good night, sir. And thank you for a lovely evening. You and I will be seeing a great deal more of each other, Anne. I certainly hope so. Oh, my God. Oh, 
Damn. The lights have gone. Must be a fuse. Now, where the... Is... Is that you, Rupert? Yes. I half expected I might see you. For God's sake, tell me what you want. Is that it? I see. Is that what you want? I am right. It is what you want me to do. Desmond, are you all right? Hmm? What? You were talking to yourself. Oh, the, the light's fused. They're perfectly all right now. Everything went black. You're tired. Are you worried about tomorrow? I was. Is it going to be dangerous for Rupert? It could be. Where's he going? It's a secret mission. We're both wrong to talk about it. But Desmond, I've been sick with worry all day, ever since I heard Jack Roberts say Rupert hadn't much chance. Listen, Anne. You're the only person in the world who matters to me. Have I ever lied to you before? No. Then go to bed and don't worry. Rupert will do whatever is necessary, and whatever his orders are, he'll obey them, and we'll be proud of him. All right? I don't understand you tonight. Don't try. Go to bed. Sleep. And in the morning, pray that Rupert's mission will be successful. Now I must write some letters. In fact, I have one long letter. Off you go now. See you in the morning. Night, Desmond. I pray you will be happy, darling Anne. Oh, good morning, sir. Ah, all ready? Yes, sir, I think so. Good. You're early. No, I just wanted to check everything. You've eaten? Yes, sir. And I'm glad I've seen you. I wanted to have a quick word. Unfortunately, I have to go up to Scotland in about 45 minutes. Oh. Last minute emergency. Group Captain Roberts will be in command here. Oh, fine. You're to take no unnecessary risks, Rupert. We don't want any heroics. I'll take care. Get your high altitude coverage, and then make one swoop for your verbal report. At the first sign of trouble, out. Don't worry, sir. I will. The Hudson will be stationed halfway across to pick up your RT. Right. Oh, Anne and I look forward to hearing all about it this evening. The signal officer says we can expect some action in a couple of minutes, sir. Right. Board C just reporting. They expect Silent Panther to break silence in about 90 seconds. They say there could be interference. Weather poor, low cloud. Switch on the amplifier, Harry. Right, sir. Hudson in position, sir. Escort. Group 12 in position, sir. Come on, come on. Harry. Sir. Harry, did you know young Adam and Anne Douglas were virtually engaged? Engaged? Yes. Who told you? She did, just now. Poor kid. Does she know what about all this? Apparently she overheard us talking yesterday. She's in a bad state. I just left her in floods of tears. Why the hell couldn't AOC have stayed with her? Damn it all, he must have known. I'm sure he would have, if it had been at all possible. If I'd known, I'd never have recommended him. That's nonsense, Harry, and you know it. We all agreed Adam was the best man for the job. Oh, no, no, two hours. Board seat report signal imminent, sir. That's him, sir. Can't you improve the signal? I'm trying, sir. Come on, lad. Cut the nut ring. And go by target. Port complex covers about six acres. Not much activity. Worms. Let me flag all round. Several large transports parked on the perimeter. All flag. Still in active. Nothing much so far. We should start climbing up now. This could be what we need. Hello? Hello? Shed doors open. Rockets. Repeat. Rockets. Scores of the beggars. Packed inside. Tell the PM they're like giant cigars. Flag picket device. Try to get no altitude photographs. Intelligence were right there at once. Stand above 109s. Climbing. 
Emergency boost. This one, man. I'm watching. Get. Engine on fire. Don't make it. Come on, everybody. You've got all the jam. I've had it. Come on, son. Time? Oh, nine oh four, sir. Signal Bomber Command. We want that bloody place blasted off the face of the Earth. Board C coming through, sir. Well? They report all contact lost with Silent Panther. Repeat, contact lost. Pilot presumed shot down. Full verbal description being immediately relayed to CAS Hudson and uh, Group 12 returning to base. End of signal, sir. Why the hell did he do that last low-level swoop? If he'd climbed out as soon as he saw the rockets, he'd have been okay. What he could have told us would have been invaluable. How do we tell Anne Douglas? We should leave it to AOC. When's he due back? He left a message saying he'd be back late morning. Ask her to come to my office in five minutes, Harry. Right. What the hell do I say to her? My God, poor kid. Come. Ah, come in, Anne. Sit down. He's dead, isn't he? His plane has been shot down, but there's always a chance he may have bailed out. Why did he go? You said Anne, he didn't please. have a chance. Why? Why couldn't Desmond have sent someone else? He had to send the best man for the job. You know that. <laughs> Oh, Jack, I knew what was going to happen. I knew. <laughs> Let's get you home. No. No, I don't want to go home. I want to stay here. It'd be better. Besides, I've just phoned Rupert's mother. She's coming straight up from Oxford. Did you tell her? No. I just said I felt she should come here. That's all. Nothing else. I don't think you she should. She is Rupert's mother. I'm sorry. It's not your fault. It's nobody's fault, Anne. No? I'll warn the gate that Mrs. Adams coming. Did Desmond know Rupert would be killed? Anne, I can't answer that. You know I can't. We all knew the risks involved. We all agreed who should be sent. There was no alternative. No alternative. When is AOC due to return? He should be back when Mrs. Adam arrives. Good. Well, if you're sure you're all right on your own... I won't do anything stupid. Right. Then you stay here till Mrs. Adam arrives, and then we'll go to the AOC's office. You're sure I'm you're... all right, really. I'm sorry, Anne. Very sorry. He was a fine young man. And you helped to kill him. Goodbye, Anne. I thought it best if you waited in here, Mrs. Adam. We're expecting the Air Vice Marshal back at any minute. Thank you. Everyone here is very proud of your son. Please, Captain, I should rather we simply accepted the fact that my son is dead. It will save us all further embarrassment. Mrs. Adam, I know how distressed you must be, but Rupert did manage to obtain vital information. Are you trying to tell me that my son died honourably? Yes, I am. I see. Well, Captain, I find it hard to distinguish between dying honourably and murder. Anne has told me that Rupert stood no chance of returning alive. Is that true? Is it, Jack? Mrs. Adam, you can't expect me to answer a question like that. Your son was simply doing his duty. On whose orders? He was selected because Who I... Who issued the direct order to my son? The AOC, naturally. And I shall ask him if Rupert was murdered. Mrs. Adam, I really murdered, do think you Murdered, Captain. Sent to his death. Oh, I know how proud and honourable you all are. I know how you'll pin a medal on him and then expect Anne and me to spend the rest of our lives honouring his memory whilst you forget all about him. Well, I'm not going to let that happen. Not again. This time, Desmond Little is going to answer... For 
My God! Hello. You're not... You're not dead. Dead? For heaven's sake, what is all this? Mum, what are you doing here? Rupert. Rupert, we thought you were dead. They all said you were dead. Who said? We heard it. Every word. Look, just a minute. Will someone please explain what the hell's going on? Anne? How did you do it? Do what? Sir, what is all this? Less than an hour ago, we heard Silent Panther shot down in flames. Bordsy reported half an hour later. No survivor. Silent Panther? How did you get away? But I don't understand. Silent Panther was cancelled. Cancelled like hell it was. You mean... Oh, my God. You thought I was dead. You thought I'd been shot down. Well, no wonder you looked as if you'd seen a ghost. But if you weren't in Silent Panther, who was? Well, AOC told me quite distinctly it had been cancelled, scrubbed at the last minute. When was this? Oh, about uh, 15 minutes before takeoff. Yes, I, I just had my final briefing with Flight Lieutenant Buckle. I was on my way to the apron when AOC stopped me and said it was all off. Then if you haven't been in Silent Panther, where have you been? To Rosyth. What? Rosyth? Yes. Um, he said SNO Rosyth wanted some aerial photos and would I buzz off and get them? In fact, he'd been going himself, but when Silent Panther was scratched, he asked me to go instead. And that's where you've been? Yes. What code did you use? Beta minus. I see. Look, sir, what does this all mean? Beta minus was AOC's code signal for his emergency trip to Scotland. What plane did you fly? The standby spit. He said as Silent Panther had been cancelled, we should... And you took off at 7.48 in Beta Minus? Yes. Oh, then... Who was in Silent Panther? It was Desmond, wasn't it? There's no other explanation. But it doesn't make sense. I mean, why should he want... Why should he want to risk his life on a hopeless mission? Why did you, Rupert? It wasn't hopeless. There was always a 50-50 chance. No, Rupert, there was very little at all. They didn't tell you that. Yes, uh... Well, even so, it had to be done. We had to find out if there was a rocket base there. And if there was, then it had to be destroyed. I knew that. I knew the risks. Does it matter why? He must have had his reasons. Yes, he did. Perhaps he felt it was right for him to go. Right? He was the AOC. Exactly. But it doesn't make sense. I think it does. He acted out of a sense of duty and personal honour. He knew what he had to do. Maybe, but why? He would have had his reasons. There's a letter here on his desk. It's for you, Mrs. Adam. Uh, thank you. Well, if you would excuse me, there's quite a lot of telephoning I have to do. Oh, of course. Rupert, take Anne for a drink. But yes. Uh, please, do as I ask. You'll join us in a minute. Uh, yes. You're safe now, Rupert, and that's all that matters. Your happiness and Anne's. Now, off you go. Come on, Anne. I expect you could use a drink. As I don't know who will be reading this, I am addressing it to you, Sylvia. And you will have to decide whether Anne and Rupert should be told the truth. I, I had to, to write this. Because it is necessary for me to try to get everything clear in my own mind before I finally carry out Rupert's last instructions. So here goes. I shall never forget Wainwright telling us about the ghost of Rupert Adam. The poor man refused to believe he hadn't killed someone. So when I saw Rupert's ghost again tonight... I knew he wanted me to fly Silent Panther tomorrow. In any case, I'm not even sure that I hadn't already decided that is what I should do. I still don't know exactly why Rupert returned. Did he want revenge? My death for his? Did he want to save our son's life? Did he want to prevent me seeing you again? Perhaps it was a combination of all these... Well, Sylvia, that's it. When you read this, I shall be dead. And you will have to decide what to say to Rupert and Anne. Will you tell them the truth, 
or not? Will you tell Rupert I am his real father? There have already been too many lies, Desmond. But what else can I do? I shall tell them you simply wanted them both to be happy. Perhaps now Rupert's spirit can leave us in peace. I pray, Desmond, for all our sakes, that he will. In The Montrose Ghost, the cast was as follows. Desmond Little, John Pullen. Sylvia, Rosalind Shanks. Lieutenant Adam, Christopher Neem. Flight Sergeant Wood, Douglas Blackwell. Major Holt, Patrick Barr. Rupert, Christopher Bidmead. Flight Officer Anne Douglas, Jane Knowles. Group Captain Roberts, David Graham. Wing Commander Buckle, David Neal, and Lieutenant Wainwright and Signals Officer, Sean Probert. The Montrose Ghost was written by Martin Jenkins and based upon a short story of the same title by Harold Balfour, Lord Balfour of Inchry. The play was produced and directed by Jerry Jones. The dragon departed in a huff. The giant decided to mend his ways, and the prince and the princess lived happily ever after. Oh, Mommy, that was a lovely story. <laughs> I thought it was silly. Well, yes. you're silly, Cyril. Silly head, silly eye, silly nose, silly toes. I'm not silly. I'm not. I'm not. <laughs> now, now, children, that'll do. Now, off you go to bed quickly. Oh. Aunt Eva's coming in to see me at any moment. I want you both in bed before she comes. Now, off you go. Good night, Mommy. <laughs> You will come and tuck us in as soon as Aunt Eva's gone, won't you? Yes, of course I will, Anna. You promise? <laughs> yes, I promise. Now off you go. Good night, Mummy. Shoo, shoo. Well now, Lucy dear, it's high time we had a serious little talk. Oh, Eva, must we? Yes, we must, Lucy. It's no good you're trying to put things off any longer. You must think about your future, dear. But I haven't put things off. I've already sold the house. Well, that was essential, if I may say so, my dear. Something had to be done to pay off poor dear Edwin's debts. But the question is, what are you going to do now? There are the children to consider. Oh, dear. Lucy, we all realise that poor dear Edwin's death was a bitter blow. But it's more than three months now since he passed over, and life must go on. Oh, but I... Oh, goodness. Are you all right, dear? You look a little pale. Perhaps a nice glass of my tonic. Poor little Lucy. Oh, why I'm won't sure she leave me alone? Sure oh, what am I to do? I sometimes feel I didn't just marry Edwin, but his whole family. Poor little Lucy. I know. It's so simple. Why didn't I think of it before? I'll leave Winchester tomorrow without telling anyone. Why, of course, it's the only solution. Yes, miss. Where to, please? To the sea, please. Uh... The sea, miss? Yes, please. Um, Whitcliffe, miss? Yes, thank you. To Whitcliffe, that sounds just the place. Now, let me see. It was a house you required, wasn't it? Well, uh, Well, I... now, what have we on our books at present? Let's have a look, shall we? Now then, Willow Cottage, secluded house, four bedrooms, three reception, rent £150 a year, yes, beau sejour. Three bedrooms, kitchen, bathroom, large garden, two reception, all mod cons. Gull Cottage. Three beds, two reception, small garden, ideally situated, furnished. £25 a year. No, that won't do. £25 a year for a furnished cottage? 
Oh, that's absurd. That's only ten shillings a week. You're quite right. It is absurd. And furnished. It sounds ideal. Yes. Now, uh, I think that either Willow Cottage or Beau Sejour might suit you. I'll just get the keys and we'll... Uh... I should like to see Gull Cottage, Mr. Coon. Uh, that wouldn't suit you at all, I'm afraid. We'll go to Beau Sejour first. But I want to see Gull Cottage. It sounds interesting. Although I can't help thinking that there must be something very wrong with it to be on offer at that rent. Is it... The drains or something? No, it isn't the drains. The the owner lives in South America and he is anxious to let it and get it off his hands, but it's uh, it's very isolated and not at all suitable. I see. Well, we'll go to Gull Cottage first and if I don't like it, we'll look at the others. Very well. Well, pretty dingy, isn't it? This is the uh, drawing room. Hmm, I see... It's beautifully proportioned. Goodness, what an extraordinary portrait. Hmm? Over the mantelpiece. <laughs> it's a very bad painting. Those strawberry-coloured cheeks and that ridiculous, wiry hair. Uh, that's <laughs> the uh, late owner of the property, Captain Daniel Gregg. I say, what a very nice view from this window. The eyes are good, though. Oh! What's the matter? Oh, oh, you know, I almost thought that it winked at me. Oh, must oh. have been a trick of the light or something. <laughs> Well, now, the uh, the kitchen is, is just next door. Oh, if, uh, right. Right, come along. Yes, as you see, the kitchen also is uh, very dirty. Oh, but surely somebody's been here, and very recently. That table is fairly clean, and... Yes, this newspaper's only a week old. Uh... Uh, yes. Well, you see, the, the charwoman comes in, uh, came in to do a bit of cleaning, and... But you've uh, she... just said how dirty the place is. Uh, yes. Well, you see, she was, um, <clears throat> she, she was called away in a hurry to um, a sick friend or something. Anyway, she did return the key in the post, and I'm I... I'm beginning to think that you're right. There is something very odd about this house. Yes, well then, uh, shall we be getting on? No point in seeing any more. Oh, but I think I'll just look upstairs now that I'm here. Oh, very well. This way. Thank you. And that's all there is to see. This is the last of the bedrooms. Needs redecorating, you see. Dirt everywhere. <laughs> I told you it wouldn't suit you. But it does suit me. It's exactly the house I want. But I still think there's something very funny about it. And I mean to find out what it is. Good Lord! What is it? That enormous brass telescope. Now, who would want a telescope that size in a bedroom? The late Captain Gregg. Oh, of course, of course. But it's odd. The whole house is filthy, and yet this telescope is gleaming. How extraordinary. <laughs> <laughs> quick, come along. Come along. We must get out of here at once. Don't stand there. Run, quick. Come on. Oh, that's better. I'm, I'm sorry I shouted at you. I'm afraid I panicked. I thought there was something funny about the place. And I must say about your whole attitude this morning. That house is haunted, isn't it? I... Uh, yes. Are you all right? You're awfully pale. No, I, I'm all right, thank you. It's, it's that damned house. You know, the longest any tenant has ever stayed is 24 hours. I've written, I've cabled the owner, but he'll do nothing to help me. Really, if I weren't a married man with a family, I, I really think I'd set fire to that house one dark night. It's getting on my nerves. I dream about it at nights. Blast Captain Daniel Gregg. Why, well, is he haunted? Was he murdered there? Uh, no, he committed suicide. Poor man, he must have been very unhappy. Did that laugh sound unhappy? No, I must say it didn't. But if he wasn't unhappy, why did he commit suicide? To give as much trouble as possible to other people. Well, it's very selfish of him. It's so inconsistent. After all, if he wanted to be dead, why didn't he stay dead? Exactly. Surely there's something that can be done. How does one lay a ghost? I haven't the slightest idea. Anyway, I should just forget all about it if I were you. It's, it's not your problem. Oh, but it is. I think it's a beautiful cottage and I intend to live in it. You what? I intend to take it. But you can't. I... Well, I couldn't take the responsibility. A woman all alone there at night. <laughs> no. Why don't you let me have Gull Cottage on approval for one night? Oh, I know it's irregular. But, but I... But then it's not a very normal house, is it? Don't you see, I could sleep there for one night and find out if there really is anything there that might frighten my children. 
I might even run Captain Greg to earth. What? <coughs> if he really does haunt the place, I mean. Really, Mr. Coo, you should be ashamed of yourself. A grown man to believe in apparitions, ghosts and all that nonsense. All sorts of things make noises in houses, you should know that. Pipes gurgle, stairs creak, furniture creaks. Uh, you can't explain that laugh by creaking furniture. It may have been the wind roaring down the chimney. Anyway, I'm not going to give up Gull Cottage so feebly. If you will forgive my saying so, you are without doubt the most obstinate woman that I've ever met. But you will let me stay there the night? Well, only on one condition. That you get a friend, some reliable woman, to spend the night there with you. Thank you. I know just the person. My cook, Martha. She comes from Pimlico. There isn't a thing in the world that she's afraid of. So, unless you hear to the contrary, we shall take up residence for one night, the day after tomorrow. Well, it's all very nice, I dare say, Mum, but it could do with a lick of paint. Mm. Mind you don't go taking it on a repairing lease, though. My brother Bert, he took a pub on a repairing lease. First thing he knew, he was flooded out. He had to put on a new roof. I remember that, Martha, thank you. Goodness, what a lot of parcels you seem to have brought. I've been wondering what's in them all the way here. Well, Mum, there's uh, me apron and carbolic and, and a scrubbing brush and three duster <laughs> and a broom head and... We're only here for one night. Well, that's as may be, Mum, but we may as well be clean. And this place needs a doing and no mistake. <sighs> well... Hot water, that's what we need. Hot water and plenty of it. I'll just fill my bucket and get started. I, I suppose the water is laid on, Mum. Oh, yes, I rang Mr Coombe. He promised to make sure that the water and the gas were both on. Poor man, I've given him a lot to do, I'm afraid. Oh, well, they do say hard work never killed anybody, and I suppose it'll hurt him. Uh, here, Mum, uh, this gas don't work. Oh, but it should. Mr. Coombe assured me that... Well, well, come on. See for yourself, Mum. Oh, dear. Well, that's that. No hot water. you better get a Beatrice sent up, Mum. We've got to have hot water. A Beatrice? Yeah, one of them small stoves. And, and mind you'll need a tin of paraffin to fill it. <laughs> oh, Martha, I'm so glad you came. What would I do without you? He calls me his own great darling. He says that I'm his pet. I fill each plate within his soul, that ain't no cod, you bet. He asks me if I love him, I says what I oh, not half. I likes you just for your whiskers, cause they tickles me and makes me laugh. Hey, God. Well, I must say, Martha, you've certainly been busy. This kitchen looks almost habitable now. <sighs> You know, it's a nice little house, this one, Mum. I almost wish I was coming to look after well, you. I yeah. wish you were. The way things are, Martha, I shan't be able to afford any help, I'm afraid. Oh, how you'll manage, I just don't know. Why, Mum, I don't believe you've ever even boiled an egg in your life. Oh, I don't know, Martha. I'm not quite useless, you know. I've aired the beds, made them up and tidied up the bedroom. Oh, no offence, Mum. I was thinking about the cooking and all. Still, cooking's easy if you don't lose your head. <laughs> If you don't mind me saying so, Mum, you look a bit tired. Oh, yes, I am a bit. I know what. I'm finished down here. Suppose you was to go back upstairs and get a bit of shut-eye while I pop some nice bacon and eggs in the pan and get the supper ready. Yes, thank you. I think I will. It's going to be an easy house to run, don't you think, Martha? Oh, I never saw an easier, Mum. Everything's so ship-shape and handy. Ship-shape? I've never heard you use that word before. <laughs> it's the ozone, I dare say, Mum. Makes you think nautical. I wonder what he was like. Who, oh, Mum? Uh, Captain Gregg, the late owner. From his portrait, he doesn't look at all the sort of man who would take his own life. Now, now, Mum, you don't want to go start thinking morbid. If you do, the next thing we know, you'll be seeing things and imagining things. Or hearing things. Exactly. But, of course, I don't really believe in ghosts. Well, they always turn out to be the wind in the chimney or branches tapping on the window. Or bats in the belfry. Hmm. <laughs> well, now, Mum, you pop along upstairs and have 40 winks. I'll call you when supper's ready. Yes. All right. That's it. Off you go. <sighs> Mum? Oh, who's there? I... Oh. Sorry if I startled you, Mum. I crept up quite light, thinking you might still be asleep. It's, uh, it's nine o'clock, Mum. Supper's nearly ready. Nine o'clock already? You should have woken me. You're all right, Mum. You look a bit 
queer? Oh, it's nothing. It's just that I'd had the most extraordinary dream. I dreamt that Captain Greg was in this room. There, I told you you'd be imagining things. I did. But it was so vivid. I can almost see him now. He was taller than I'd imagined from the painting. He wasn't wearing his uniform. No, that's right. He was wearing a black suit. He came very close to where I was sitting and looked down at me. He smiled, I think. I think you need your supper. That's what I think. For a few seconds, he just stood there looking at me. Then he turned away and opened the window. The window? Martha, you didn't open it, did you? No, I didn't, Mum. You must have done that before you went to sleep. No, I didn't. In fact, I'm positive that I shut the window. Yes, I remember now. I did open it to air the room, and then when I came up here, I shut it again. That's right. The catch was stiff, and I squeezed my finger. Martha, if you didn't open it, and I remember closing it... Come along, Mum. You're getting morbid again. Oh, it's my own fault. I shouldn't have let you do so much. I'm as strong as an ox myself. I forget other people in Sabifi. I'm strong, too. It's just that because I'm small, I'm considered weak. I am strong. Well, you were quite right, Martha. I do feel better. That was quite delicious. Goodness, I'm tired, and here I've been sleeping all the afternoon, or most of it, while you've been working. Now, off you go, up to bed, Martha. I'll bring you up a nice hot water bottle. Oh, but I... No, I insist. It'll do me good to look after you for a change. Now, off you go. Well, I must say, I'm ready for my bed. Well, all right, then. Good night, Mum. Good night, Martha, and thank you. Oh, bother, there's no paraffin. Of course, it's been burning all day. Oh, dear, what a nuisance. I know, I'll try the gas. Perhaps it's come on. After all, we haven't tried it since this morning. Oh, dear. Why won't you light? Why, why? Because I don't choose that it should. <gasps> Who's there? I don't approve of gas. I hate the stuff. Blast it. Who's there? Who is it? Where are you? It's only me, Greg. Greg? Not Captain Greg? The ghost? I see you're being selfish and hateful and unreasonable. I'm nothing of the kind. Yes, you are. If you wanted to live in this house, why didn't you live in it instead of killing yourself like a great coward and ruining things for everyone? I did not kill myself, damn it. I went to sleep in front of that wretched gas fire in my bedroom. I must have kicked the gas with my foot in my sleep. It was a stormy night, with a wind blowing half a gale from south southwest, right into my windows, and the rain ruining the curtains. So I shut the windows as any sensible man would, and the damn fools came in the morning and found me dead and brought it in as suicide, because my confounded charwoman said I always lived and slept with my windows open, no matter what the weather. How the devil should she know? I never slept with her. Well, at least that proves that I'm not imagining all this. I could never have thought of that. Of course you couldn't. You're a nice-minded woman. Too nice-minded. Only half alive, in fact. I am not. I'm far more alive than you are. And I wish you'd go away and leave me alone. I want to fill my hot water bottle and go to sleep. Well, go to sleep. I'm not stopping you. Even though you have put all that frippery on my good bed. It's not frippery. It's the best linen. I couldn't sleep in anything but linen, so I brought my own. If you had taken the trouble to look in my linen press, you would have found it full of the finest Irish linen. As for only being able to sleep in linen sheets... I've never heard such balladash. You slept well enough in my old armchair before supper. Oh, so it was you that opened the window and nearly froze me to death. The fresh air was good for you. And it merely made your nose a little red. It didn't. <laughs> What's the joke? It seems too ridiculous that I should be arguing with a ghost over a red nose. Before supper, I was terrified of you. We are always afraid of the unknown. I was never more afraid... Then once, when I took my ship into an unknown harbour without a pilot, I was more frightened then than that time when a sea cook tried to carve me up for Christmas dinner. You must have had a very exciting life. Why did you retire? I was getting old, by human standards. Short in sight and wind, slower in thought and movement. 
You have to be master of yourself before you can be master of the sea. And with a ship, there are too many lives at stake. So I went into dry dock of my own account and took my seafaring second hand through my telescope. Most of the ships of the world come up the channel out there. If you were going to stay, I'd, uh, I'd show them to you. But I am going to stay. No one stays in this house. I don't intend that they should. And you'd be surprised how easy it is to frighten people away. Lily-livered landlubbers. Ha. Did you open that window upstairs to frighten me away? No. I opened it because I didn't want another accident with that damn gas in my house. What you don't seem to understand is that this is no longer your house. It belongs to someone in South America. And that's another thing. Letting that little runt have my good house and money just because he's my next of kin. Damn it, I was going to make a will leaving Gull Cottage as a rest home for old sea captains. Well, it's too late now. And surely it's better for the house to be lived in and looked after than that it should degenerate into the pigsty it has become. I don't want anyone living in my house but men and sailors at that. But I want to live in it. It's in the right position for the children to go to school and the right rent for me to afford, and I'm going to live in you it. You are not going to live in it, madam. I'll not have my bedroom turned into a scented boudoir filled with frippery and folderols. You're mean, mean and dog in the mangerish and altogether horrible. Stop that crying. Damn it, madam, don't cry, I say. If there's one thing I can't stand, it's a woman crying. Well... Light your damn gas and, and fill your blasted hot water bottle. I don't care. Only for God's sake, stop snivelling. I'm not snivelling. I'm just crying a little. Because I'm tired and very unhappy and have nowhere to live. Nonsense. There are thousands of empty houses in England merely waiting to be lived in. Oh, that sort of sentimental twaddle won't work with me. Look here, if I promise not to turn your bedroom into a scented boudoir, couldn't we come on trial for six months? Six months? Why, once you settle in for six days, I never get you out. Please. Please. Oh, oh, all right. Look, ring your brats, if you like, and, uh, and we'll, we'll try for a summer. And you'll go right away and leave us alone? No, I will not go away. Why should I? Because I couldn't possibly bring the children here if you stay. Well, quite apart from the fear they might feel of being haunted, think of the bad language they'd learn and the bad morals. Damn it, my language is most controlled, madam. And as for my morals, I can assure you that no woman has ever been the worse for knowing me. I've lived a man's life, and I'm not ashamed of it. But I've always tried to tell the truth and shame the devil. All the same, I should find you too difficult to explain to Cyril and Anna. Then don't tell them anything, and I shall keep out of their way. Oh, dear. I wonder. All the same, it is a lovely little cottage. I shall never find another house to suit me so well. Did you build it yourself? Yes, I did. That was very clever of you. My husband studied architecture for years, but he never made such a nice little house as this. Though I believe he was very good at post offices. What do you wear all that black crepe and stuff for when you really didn't care a straw for your husband? Oh, I did. I did. You needn't waste your time lying to me. In the state I'm in now, thoughts and words come out together, like the bass and treble of a piano piece. No, my dear, you were fond of your late husband, but you didn't love him. Oh, look, look out. That, that water's hot enough. Oh. Uh, can't you see the steam coming out of the spout? Oh. If you have it too hot, you, you'll scald yourself. Uh, besides, you are wasting gas. Uh, damn it, madam, you must be practical. Yes, I suppose I must. And you ought to have a funnel. Get a funnel tomorrow. Yes, I will. Well, I don't know if it's the right thing to do to wish a ghost good night, but... If it is, I wish you a very good one. Stop a minute. There's something I want to say. Well, what is it? I have thought of a solution to all our problems. I like you. And you're quite right. The house would be better for being lived in. So you shall come and live in it. And if you promise to leave my bedroom as it is, I'll promise never to go into any other room in the house. 
So your children need never know anything about me. Mm. Well, that's your problem solved. Now for mine. You will buy the house. But I haven't any money. You will buy the house with my money. I've got some gold hidden on the premises that no one knows about. You will take that and buy the house from my blasted next of kin, and you will make a will, leaving it as a home for old sea captains. Impossible. In the first place, it would be stealing if I took the money. And in the second, if you are keeping the best bedroom in the house, where should I sleep? In the best bedroom. But, uh... In heaven's name, why not? God bless my soul, madam. I haven't got a body, and after 12 years of having no body, I've no fleshly desires. Damn it. Surely you've read the scriptures. In heaven there is neither marrying nor giving in marriage. The trouble is that you are not in heaven. It's too difficult to explain now when you're only half awake. And indeed, I may never be able to explain it in earthly words. But for the present, you must take my word for when I say I wouldn't dream of hurting a hair of your head. So, that's all settled. And we'll see about the money in the morning. Good night. But it isn't settled. Wait, wait. Good night. But, oh, but... Uh, oh, dear. What am I going to do? I don't care. I still feel like a thief, buying the cottage with that money from the cellar. It's not right. And what about your next of kin? Never mind about him. He's the last person I've left a place to. Anyway, he's got his money. And now you're nicely settled in. What more could you want? Oh, I don't know. And what about you always hanging about? Why are you still here? Why haunt when there isn't any reason for haunting? I said I'd stay here until my house was a home for seamen and I'm a man of my word. And you're not so much as a ship's boy. Oh, dear. I sometimes think I must be imagining all this. Now, how can one argue with a ghost? Perhaps I ought to see a psychoanalyst. Bosh! Don't you believe in psychoanalysts? It's a new science and they're only experimenting. And unfortunately, they can only experiment with people. Neurotic guinea pigs and rabbits being unable to unburden their subconscious in language intelligible to men. It's rather out of my province. I thought you would know everything about everything in your present state. Tell me about it. What is the next world really like? No, it's, uh, it's too difficult. It's as if I was being asked to explain navigation to a child sailing a duck in its bath. Uh, talking of children, what do you think of my two? Anna's a pet. I'm not so sure about Cyril, though. Oh. And by the way, I have a bone to pick with you. Why did you get rid of my good suite of furniture? I paid good money for that suite. I'm sure you did. But my father paid better for the chairs I've put in its place. And I got two pounds ten shillings for yours at a second-hand dealer's, which, by the way, paid for the new mantelpiece. Robbery. Nothing but robbery. And who wanted a new mantelpiece, anyway? I brought that bit of marble from Italy. And what have you done with it? Made it into a rockery in the back garden. A rockery. Oh, my God. I believe you'd root up your own father's tombstone and use that for a, a rockery. I certainly should if it were made of black marble carved with gargoyles. Notre Dame is covered with gargoyles. Perhaps, but I shan't have to sit and warm my feet under Notre Dame. And... I don't see why you had to bring my portrait up here. You ought to be pleased I didn't put it in the attic. It's a very good portrait. It's a frightful portrait. Why? What's wrong with it? Well, the hands are terrible. They weren't my hands. I took the fellow who painted it out to South America, and he made that portrait instead of paying me his passage money. Of course, I couldn't always be sitting for him and wasting my time, so he just painted bits of anyone who came along. <laughs> But, you know, chuck the thing away or put in your precious rockery. And that's another thing. My monkey puzzle tree. I planted that with my own hands. Why? Because, damn it, I've always wanted a monkey puzzle tree in my front garden. But why? It's not useful. Certainly not ornamental. Think how much prettier a bed of roses will look. Ah! And 
And you must admit that the whole house is looking nicer now and is much better for being lived in. Well, oh, perhaps. Perhaps. Oh, once this bind with it gets everywhere. <sighs> Children, Cyril, Anna, come along. It's time for lunch. Come on, Anna, at once. <sighs> I told her, Mother. I told Anna. Yes, Cyril, dear, I heard you. Did the postman come? Yes, dear, he did. Hello, Mommy. I've had such a lovely game on the beach, and I've bought you some shells. Oh, thank you, girl. Oh, I'm hungry. What's for lunch? Salad and cream cheese and brown bread and butter. Scrumptious. I've got a letter. Who's it from? I think it's from Aunt Eva. Oh, golly, what does she want? Aren't you going to open it? No, not now. Let's go indoors and eat. I'll open it later. Come along, both of you. You're looking glum tonight. What's the matter? Something wrong with the children? Oh, you startled me. No, it's this letter from my sister-in-law, Eva. She's coming to stay. Right, and put her off. Oh, you don't know, Eva. If she says she's coming, she's coming. She's arriving tomorrow by the 5.45. You see, she hasn't left me time to write and put her off. You should have sent a telegram and said you had smallpox. That would be useless. She'd come and nurse me. Nothing would put Eva off once she's made up her mind. Oh, dear, she'll ruin everything. We've been so happy here these past few months. Leave her to me, my dear. Leave her to me. No. You must promise me you'll never speak to her. You must promise me. I'll do no such thing. Oh, dear. What am I to do? You do nothing. <laughs> you leave the doing to me. Of course, what you ought to do, Lucy, is get a few hens. You've plenty of room and you could sell the eggs. But I don't know anything about hens, Eva. Well, you could learn, my dear, you could learn. It seems to me, Lucy, you've rather let yourself go since you've been living here. You never go out. You don't belong to any societies, not even the Mother's Union. Of course, it's only right that you should observe a period of mourning for dear Edwin, but... Really, Lucy, there is a happy medium, even as far as mourning is concerned. My dear, if you go on like this, people will begin to think you odd, and then the children will suffer. Believe me, I know, there's no greater handicap for a child than coming from an odd home. Uh, but I... No, my dear, you must get out and about. It doesn't help the children if you cut yourself off from other people. No, I suppose it doesn't. I didn't think. Mm. Poor Lucy. Thinking never was one of your strong points, was it? And another thing. Why on earth do you have that ridiculous great telescope in your bedroom? I, um, uh, I like to look at the stars. You never looked at the stars in Whitchester, dear. I should leave that sort of thing to astrologers. Well, you may go very odd indeed. And uh, Lucy, dear... Do you really think it quite nice to have such a large portrait of a strange man in your bedroom? Wouldn't it be better to have an enlargement made of that excellent cabinet photograph of dear Edwin? Yes, I suppose it would. There, 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 my dear. You must pull yourself together. You must buck up. Edwin wouldn't like to see you giving way like this now, would he? I see that my place is here for the present. Now, um, now, don't thank me. I've always known my duty and never shirked it. But if you don't mind, my dear, I'll have my divan moved out of the dining room and into Anna's room. I never did like the idea of sleeping where one eats. Yes, I suppose you're right. But, Mummy, she snores and she makes the room smell of toothpaste and, and cold cream and she asks me arithmetic problems when I'm dressing. Oh, it isn't fair, Mummy. Why did she have to come? We were so happy without her. Oh, dear. Well, I must say, we've had a splendid walk this morning, haven't we, Cyril? Oh, yes, Aunt Eva. And what a lot of specimens Cyril has. Oh, yes. Come along, Anna, and I'll show you what we found. Come oh, on. very well. Ah, oh, he's so keen. I do like keenness. That's where you fail, Lucy. You're not keen. I am about my own things, but I prefer growing things to taking life. Taking life? <laughs> you talk as if we were murderers. Well, aren't you? Lucy, whatever has come over you? You were never like this in Whitchester. 
shocking to say to your own sister-in-law. Oh, just because Cyril and I collect a few flowers and insects and butterflies. Oh, I can see I must start you on some knitting. Knitting is wonderful for the nerves. And I think you should have a tonic. You aren't yourself. I wrote to Helen yesterday about you. Dear little Lucy is not at all herself, I said, and I shall stay until she is. I can't bear it. I can't bear it. And as for you, Captain Greg, you're no help at all. You said I was to leave Eva to you and you haven't been near me for a week. If you remember our last conversation, you implored me not to come near you till that woman had gone away. You said you'd do no such thing. Perverse little creature, aren't you? Well, if you'll ask me nicely, perhaps I might help after all. What will you do? Never you mind. That's my business. Well, you must tell me. You must. Lucy? Lucy, dear, are you all right? Blast. And here she is. <laughs> uh, uh, yes, come in, won't you, Eva? I thought I heard you cry out, Lucy. What's the matter? Did you? You, you must have been having a nightmare. No, I wasn't asleep. But I distinctly heard you. You cried out. You must tell me. Oh, it must have been your imagination. Voices. You know, like Joan of Arc. My dear child, what an idea. I assure you that my imagination is completely under control. Voices, indeed. <sighs> really, Lucy, I'm getting quite worried about you. You must get away from here. Go on a cruise. A cruise? Yes. Lots of people go on them and have fun. You enjoy it so. Well, oh, then. It's all right. Don't worry. She can't hear me. She's spiritually deaf. She's only tuned into herself. Now, listen here. Don't you be bullied to go on any blasted cruise. I won't. Oh, my dear Lucy, how could you possibly tell whether you'd enjoy it or not until you've been on it? Well, I'm only trying to help you, dear. It's very good of you, Eva, but I don't need any help. That's the ticket. I am perfectly well and happy here. All I want is to be left alone to live my life as I wish and not as other people think best for themselves. And put that in your pipe and smoke it, madam. Really, Lucy, I can't think what's happened to you lately. You used to be such a sweet little thing. Lady Smythe always used to say to me, I'm so fond of your sister-in-law. She's such a sweet little thing. Well, I doubt you should say that now. Who cares what Lady Smythe thinks? Go on, Lucy, tell her that. I really don't mind very much what Lady Smythe think thinks about me. I... Don't mind what anyone says about me, because most gossip is only the evil in people's own minds coming to the surface. Are you accusing me of having an evil mind? Isn't that typical of any woman reducing everything to the personal? Well, Lucy? Uh, she's beginning to bore me. Let's get rid of because her. Because if you are, dear, you have only to say so plainly. After all I've done... Oh! Oh, what a draught! Oh, oh, where can it be coming from? Oh, I'm chilled to the bone. It's me, madam. I wish it was a cyclone. Oh, dear. I've seen nothing to laugh at, Lucy. I, I'm being frozen to death. I'm not laughing at you. What are you laughing at, then? Oh, it's just as I thought. Hysteria. I shall take you to see a doctor. First thing in the morning. Good night. <laughs> oh, that settled her. Oh, dear. Well, don't overdo it. I don't want her bedridden. And that's all the thanks I get for the trouble I've taken. But don't you worry, my dear. I'll have her out of here in the turn of a screw. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you must be mad to stay in this exposed house for the winter. Oh, oh I ache in every joint. I'm never ill at home. Oh, really, I think these are two of the most miserable weeks I've ever spent anywhere. Well, tomorrow I'm going home. Yes, home. And what's more, Lucy, you'll have to go down on your bended knees if you ever want me to visit you again. And if you all die of pneumonia this winter, don't blame me. But this house suits me very well. We're all very healthy here. Oh, well, wait. Just wait. In the meantime... I'll be making inquiries about inexpensive flats in Whitchester. Not for me. Yes, for you, when you come to your senses. I have come to them. Thoroughly selfish. That's what you've become, my dear. Why? Why am I selfish just because I'm living as I want to at last? Oh, 
Baldwiss lived just as you liked. No, I've lived as Edwin liked, and his mother liked, and as you liked. Now, at last, I'm going to be myself. In spite of your poor children's health and happiness? Because of it. I want them to grow up with a true sense of values. And we really are quite healthy here, and happy, when we are alone. I see. When you are alone. Well, I can take a hint better than most people. You want me to go, don't you? Well, don't deny it. You want to be rid of me. Your own husband's sister. Oh, you needn't deny it. I'm not denying it. Well. I'm sorry, but it's true. You can't live other people's lives for them. Go home and live your own life, Eva. Oh, don't worry. I'll go. I'll most certainly go. And by the first train in the morning. Oh, dear. I wish I didn't feel so unkind. Why do you feel unkind? Oh, it's you. Well, Eva means so well. Poor Eva. Now, Lucy, don't be sentimental. You didn't think poor Eva when she was here just now. I'm afraid Cyril will miss her. Oh, if she had stayed much longer, she'd have turned Cyril into a, a spoiled little prig and Anna into a revolutionary. Cyril is a rotten little prig by nature, but so far, thank God, he's not spoiled. Please remember that Cyril is my son. Oh, no, he's not. He's Edwin's son, not yours. Cyril bores you, and you know it. You may love him. Oh, mothers are peculiar, but you don't like him. Not as you like Anna. But look here. <laughs> You're looking worn out. It's that wretched Eva woman. If I were you, I would hop into bed, tuck yourself up now like a good girl. How can I tuck myself up? I'm not undressed yet. Well, get undressed. It won't worry me. I was thinking of myself. Will you please go away? There's no need for me to go. Clothes, all the lack of them, mean nothing to me. Well, are you st still there? Oh, dear. He's right. I am tired. Got pretty shoulders huh? and a damn fine figure. Oh, I thought you'd gone. You wear the wrong sort of clothes. No one would ever guess that you had such a figure under all that drapery. Oh, now, 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 there's no need to blush. Oh, hateful. Go away at once. Now, now, Lucy. Will you go? Damn it, no. But I'll turn what you would call my back. Oh, very well. I'm sorry I was cross. It's all this business with Eva, I suppose. Oh, Lucy, you are so little and so lovely. What you've missed, Lucy, by being born too late to travel the seven seas with me. And what I've missed, too. How old are you now? There's no old or young for us. There's just being. Only immortality and eternity and vision. Sounds frightening. Rather dull. Alas, I've, I've no words to make you understand. It's all the beauty and serenity and nobility you've ever experienced on Earth. It's all your grandest and most generous feelings and the finest sunsets and the greatest music. I don't see why you ever leave it if it's so lovely. Because I'm a pig-headed fool and I hate leaving things half done. But you haven't. You've cleared everything up. I've made a will leaving the house to your old sea captains. Don't you trust me? Not altogether. You are so young. Young? I'm 34. In years, perhaps. In experience, you're about 17. And you don't look much more when you're playing with Anna and that ridiculous dog of hers. Suppose you were to marry again. Oh, I wouldn't think of marrying again. Someone might think of marrying you, though. You really are very pretty. And you are also extremely susceptible. I'm not. How do you know? What men have you met? Since you were widowed? Mr. Coon. A codfish with a conscience. Dr. Hamer. Married to his profession with a wife and four children. The vicar and the curate. One a celibate and the other an adenoidal non-entity. Oh, don't be so critical. Were you so handsome? I may not have been handsome, but I could make my presence felt. Why, I could have twisted you around my little finger. You couldn't, and neither could anyone else. What do you bet? 
I don't bet. Well, I do. My greatest weakness was a good gamble. I'll lay your roses to a new monkey puzzle tree that you'd fall for the first attractive man who chose interest in you. Really? You ought to be ashamed of yourself. Damn it. Even a ghost must have his fun. And I give up a good deal of peace one way or another just to hang about down here keeping an eye on you and helping you out. I don't need any help, thank you. I can manage quite well alone, and I am to be trusted completely. And now, if you don't mind, I should very much like to go to sleep. I've got Eva to see off in the morning, and the children have to be sent to school, so I've quite enough to be going on with without your nonsense. Marry again, indeed. We'll see. We'll see. Tags? Tags? Oh, do come back. Tags! Come away! Oh, no. Tags? 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 Where are you? Tags? Hang on, I'm coming. Don't do anything. It's Tags, my dog. He's buried. No, 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 no. Not to oh. worry. I'll, I'll soon have him out. Oh. Now, it's Tags. coming. Stand oh. back. Oh. Oh. There we are. Oh, Jack. There we are, old chap. We'll soon be back to normal. Oh. I say, uh, are you all right? You look a bit pale. Oh, thank you. Yes, I'm all right. I'm, it was just the shock, knowing poor Tax was buried in there, not being able to help him. <laughs> it was a man's job, and I'm very glad that I was near enough to be the man. It was rather strange, really. I was on my way to my cottage down there, and something suddenly made me change my mind and come up here. <laughs> it was odd. Almost as if a voice spoke to me. A voice? I, I, I don't mean a human voice. No, I'm afraid you didn't. Afraid? Why afraid? Oh, you, you needn't be alarmed. I'm not one of those psychic people who hears voices. But I must confess, this did sound oddly like a man speaking. Go back to the top of the cliff, it said. It gave me quite a shock. Was that all the voice said? Yes. Well, odd, wasn't it? Now... Are you quite sure you're all right? Yes, thank you. Well, it looks as though there's going to be quite a shower. I know you'd, you'd better come down to my cottage and wait till it's over. Here comes the rain. Come on, we'd better make a dash for it. It's only down the slope. I... Come on, quickly. Oh. <laughs> there we are, safe and dry. All right? Yes, fine. I never knew there was a cottage here. No, it's well concealed. Sometimes I like privacy, even at the risk of primitiveness. The water has to be carried a mile every day, and I have to bathe in the sea, but it, it suits me at present. Well, now, I think a cup of tea might fill the bill. Oh, thank you. There. Won't be long. Oh, lovely. Do you do everything for yourself, yeah? Oh, a woman comes in every day to clear up. Otherwise, I manage very well. Have you been here long? About a week. I saw it advertised in a paper. It's so peaceful. <laughs> Most women would say it was so lonely. I love loneliness. Oh, have you tried it? Oh, yes. I'm alone most of the time while the children are at school. Children? Yes, two, a boy and a girl. I'm a widow. Oh. <laughs> you... You look too young to be a widow. Oh, there are many widows younger than I am. Oh, I, I don't refer to years as much as experience. You haven't even a married look. Is there one? Definitely. Like a well-set jelly. And don't I look well-set? You don't look set at all. That sounds very untidy and wobbly. <laughs> <laughs> You're very sweet. I don't think you should say things like that. I don't even know your name. My name is Miles Blaine, and you are very sweet. Don't be absurd. I don't think you should speak to me like that. After all, I don't even know your name. My name is Mrs Muir. Lucy Muir. It was strange how the rain came on, wasn't it? It was so fine when I left home. Oh, I ordered a rainstorm. The weather prophet is a friend of mine. Perhaps I ought to ask him to send a flood. Then you'll never leave me. <laughs> I think I'd better be going now. Oh, you can't go. It's much too wet. And besides, you haven't had your tea yet. No, I must go, really. You needn't be afraid of me, you know. I'm not. Then prove it by staying and drinking your tea. I'm so bored here. You'll save me from jumping over the cliff. If you're bored, why do you stay? God knows. 
I came here because I wanted peace and a chance to know myself. And the devil of it is, there seems so little to get to know, and I'm bored. What do you do when you're not here being bored? Oh, I, I live in London and... Well, I ride a bit and play golf and squash and bridge. Have you no profession? I was more or less trained as a barrister, but the, the law courts depress me. I gather that you don't have to work for a living. Uh, no. Well, then, why don't you work for someone else? If I could find someone worthwhile, I might. You could do so much good. How? Where? Well, you could go and work in the slums or go into Parliament. Or... You're laughing at me. I'm not. I swear I'm not. You're doing me a lot of good. I feel a better man already. There, I knew it. You are laughing at me. I thought you were serious and really wanted advice. You know, I've never met anyone quite like you before. Oh, I'm very ordinary. Oh, no, you're not, my dear. Well, I must go. It seems to me that we've been talking a great deal of nonsense. But thank you for saving my dog and for your hospitality. I meant what I said. You know, I've... I've never met anyone quite like you. You make me think of spring and primroses and a new beginning to life. Yes, that's it. A new beginning. Well, goodbye and thank you. Come on, Tags. Come on. Goodbye. And thanks again. New beginning. I wonder. Oh, through the night time, my lonely heart is singing sweeter songs of love than the brown bird ever knew. Sweeter songs of love than the brown bird ever knew. Would that the song of my heart could go a-winging, could go a-winging to you. lovely. <laughs> you know, you sing rather well, Miles. Thank you, sir, she said. <laughs> Happy? Mm, yes, very. I've never felt like this before, all these weeks, the meetings in the wood. Yes, Miles, I'm very happy. You know, Lucy, you've become rather special to me. In fact, so special that I... I never want you to go, and why should you? In my small cottage, there's plenty of room for you. Come home with me, Lucy, now, and stay with me always. You mean? I mean that I love you. Oh, Lucy, come home with me now, and never leave me. But there wouldn't be room for the children. I wasn't thinking of the children. Just the two of us. But... Uh, well, at, at first, that is. Later, perhaps, we, we could arrange something. Then, then we could all be together. You and I and dear little Cyril and Cynthia. Cyril and Anna. Yes, of course. But, Lucy, my dear, you must think of yourself sometimes. You shouldn't always be worrying about the children. Sometimes I think you care more for them than you do for me. But I do love you. You know I do. You are very young. I don't think you really know much about love. Oh, I do now. And loving you like this makes me love everything and everyone much more. I want us all to be happy. And the children wouldn't be happy if I deserted them. Lucy, Lucy. I, of course, I could leave them behind on our honeymoon. But I'd have to make arrangements for them to be properly looked after until we came home. Need you be so sentimental and so... Practical. I hate practical people. They take all the magic out of life. But Miles, I couldn't just abandon the children. You wouldn't want me to do that. Yes, I would. I want you to forget the existence of everyone but me. 
Lucy, if you really loved me, you'd come home with me now. But it's very obvious that you don't love me, so I'm wasting my time. Oh, Miles, I was so happy. Don't spoil everything. It's you who are spoiling things. Oh, you little silly. Don't you realize that no one else matters in the world but us two? What was that? Someone's there, watching us. <laughs> it's a rabbit, only a rabbit. I can hear it now, scuttling away to tell all the other rabbits that Mrs. Muir is behaving in a most depraved way in the green room. Oh, you are so absurd. <laughs> but it's getting late. I must be getting back. You'll be here tomorrow? Yes. Oh, God knows why I come. You're so hard-hearted. Hard-hearted? If you could just see my heart. What should I see? Perhaps I'll show you tomorrow. Lucy, Lucy, wake up. I must speak to you. Uh, what, what is it? It's me, Lucy, my dear. Oh, oh, I wondered where you'd got to. By the way, I owe you an apology. I am ridiculously susceptible and happier than I've ever been in my no, life. No, no. I believe you're jealous. Jealousy is a disease of the flesh. Oh, Lucy, Lucy, will you ever forgive me? Forgive you? Whatever for? I'm happier than I've oh, ever... Stop, stop. It was all my fault, don't you see? There he was that morning on the cliffs, and he seemed ideal for my purpose. But I never realized it would come to this. What do you mean? Lucy, the man is married. Miles? Married? I don't believe it. It's true. He has a wife and three children. But he told me he loved me today. He kissed you me. You must never see him again. Of course I shall see him. There must be some mistake. There's no mistake. I took a journey and saw his wife and three boys. Oh, Lucy, I'm sorry. I, I blame myself. I couldn't tell he was married till today when a letter came telling him that the baby was to be christened. Lucy, he's just a waster with enough money to indulge his fancies. You mean I'm just one of his fancies? I'm afraid so, my dear. Now you must never see him again. You must be strong, Lucy. I don't want to be strong. I just want to be with Miles. You're very quiet today, my love. Is something the matter? No, nothing. It's silly, really. It's only a dream I had. <laughs> Tell me. I dreamt about you. I dreamt you were already married. Miles? Miles? No. Tell me it's not true. It is true. You've lied to me all this time. No, 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 no. I told no lies. It's, it's no lie that I love you. If you really loved me, you would have told me the truth. Oh, but Lucy, you've made me feel a new man with a new life. Oh. Look, Lucy, I'll divorce Olivia. And then we can marry and go on being happy. She would always be there between us. Oh, don't be so Victorian, darling. After all, what is divorce nowadays? People get divorced every day. It isn't nearly as alarming as you seem to think. I'm thinking of your wife and how she would hate me. Oh, Olivia never hates anyone unless they're unkind to the children. She puts them first all the time. She even refused to come to Switzerland on holiday with me because of them. That's why I came down here... And met you. Oh, come on, Lucy. How can it be wrong if we make each other so happy? I don't know. I just don't know. I, I must have time to think. Will you come here tomorrow? <sighs> Say that you will. I must go. I must have time to think. Well, if you won't think of Olivia's children, Lucy, think of your own. Eva will look after them. That awful woman. What chance will they have with her? But must I always think of other people? Can't I have any happiness for myself? Would you really be happy in knowing that your children were unhappy? Knowing that his wife was unhappy, deserted? She doesn't understand him. Balder, Dash. The trouble is she understands him a damn sight too well. She's a thoroughly nice woman with a nice sense of humour... 
and a sense of honour. Yet she neglects him for the children. She wouldn't go to Switzerland on holiday with him. No, because she'd only just had the youngest baby. That's why she couldn't go. But that didn't stop Master Miles going off and enjoying himself with a red-headed wench of loose morals. But perhaps he hasn't told you about her. Miles wants to marry me. The sad thing about women is they believe so much of what a man tells them with his lips. I believe in Miles. He has never had a chance. Rubbish. I won't listen to you. I won't. I won't. I'm going to Miles. Tonight. Now. Lucy, come back. Don't be a fool, Lucy. Miles. Miles. Miles, I simply Lucy, had to... Lucy, what the hell? What's going on, Miles? Oh, you'd better come in, Lucy. Good evening. Yeah, well, when I got back to the cottage, I found my cousin had motored down from London. <laughs> really, Miles? Cousin? Why not sister? So much less suspicious, and after all, we do both have red hair. Oh, no, Lucy, don't go. I can explain. <laughs> Lucy, come back. Lucy! <laughs> Lucy! Nothing I can say would be adequate. All I ask you to do is try and forgive me, bloody fool that I am. I forgive you. I should probably have met him without your help, him or someone like him. No, no, if I hadn't sent him up the hill that morning, he would have left the following day. It was all my fault. I forgive you. But I can't forgive myself. I should have known better because interfering on us in other people's lives is one of the greatest sins, and I knew it. It was my own pride. I thought you needed a lesson, and I am the one that shall be taught. I am indeed a, a poor representative of either world, and I shall go away until I've learned greater wisdom. Shall I go away, Lucy? Shall I? <laughs> what is it, Miss Mayton? What's the matter? Take that damn dog off my bed. Oh, you startled me. So, you've come back after all this time. Yes, ten years to the day, and high time, too. It's not healthy to have a flea-ridden dog sleeping on your bed, on my bed. She's not flea-ridden. What a thing to say about my best oh, girl. Oh, my God. God, what sort of talk is that for a sensible woman? I thought you liked dogs. So I do. Proper dogs, not furry frogs like that. <laughs> what happened to Tags? He died, poor thing. Oh, oh, yes, so he did. I'm sorry. But really, it's an insult to call a thing like that a dog. Well, you obviously haven't changed much. Well, have you been learning a great deal in the other world? I'm not a very good pupil. I'm still too interested in mammon, as they say. Meaning me? Uh, meaning you and my house. I thought at any moment you might decide to leave it to those slum children you've been helping. You still don't trust me. Well, then. admit it, the idea did cross your mind. Yes, it did. It would seem a more natural will for me to make. And Cyril is growing up and may ask questions. He wants to go into the church. He's won a scholarship to theological college. I know, and Anna wants to be a ballet dancer. Well, she hasn't said so. No, but she soon will, now that she's left school. And then there will be ructions with Master Cyril. But why should there be? Cyril has never been the same since he won that scholarship and was taken up by the Bishop of Winchester. How do you know all this? Oh, I, I take an interest. Oh, yes, and I, I've seen Miles. Oh. He's now stout and bald, and his taste in women gets younger. They laugh at him, take what he'll give them, and turn him down. Then he runs back to his wife. She's a better wife than I should have been. She's in love with him, that's why. Were you ever in love? Of course, often. But I never went so far as to marry one of them. <clears throat> Cyril says that celibacy is a fine idea. <laughs> you wait. The bishop's daughter has other ideas. He never told me about a daughter. Then he always was secretive, so unlike Anna. 
Which makes me think you're wrong about her wanting to be a dancer. I'm sure she'd have told me before now. She will tell you, and then the trouble will begin. You mark my words. Mummy, Mummy, Madame Lezhinsky was at the concert and she says she'll take me. Mm. She'll take you, Hannah? Take you where? Into her dancing school in London. She's on holiday at the hotel here and she said she'd come and see me dance and I never thought she would. And there she was and she said she'll teach me. Oh, Mummy, I'm going to be a dancer. A dancer, a dancer. What's all this noise about, Mother? I'm going to be the most beautiful ballet dancer, Cyril. A dancer? Not on the stage. Well, of course on the stage. Why not? Mother, she can't. What will the bishop say? Oh, who cares what the bishop says? I do. Well, I don't. To the old bishop. <laughs> it may not have occurred to you, but if you go on the stage, it may ruin my career. And what about my career? Well, the church would appear to me to be more important than the stage, and more Christian. Mm, not your sort of church. Christianity has nothing to do with careers and gaiters and a mitre. Now, now, don't lose your tempers, both of you. We must all talk this over quietly. And but, Mother, oh, make us see that it's Keep quiet, both of you. We'll discuss this calmly. Now, Cyril, what are your objections to Anna becoming a dancer? The bishop doesn't approve of the stage. Oh. And if he hears that my sister is exhibiting herself practically naked... Oh, who <laughs> says I'm going to be practically naked? Please, Anna. If she must dance, why can't she become a dancing teacher and give lessons? to people we know. Really, if she insists on being so selfish, she'll ruin everything for me. And what about your being selfish? I've wanted to dance ever since I was a baby, and Cyril has wanted to be all sorts of things. And it's only since the bishop took him up that he's wanted to be a bishop. But there must be some solution. I know, I think I've got it. It's rather sad, really, but it might work. Anna, if you really do want to be a dancer, why not adopt a stage name? Oh, but Mummy, where mother. should I? If Anna changes her name, then there need be no further connection between us. Well, then, that's settled. Oh, Mummy, you mean that I can go to school in London? Well, we shall have to see, dear. I really should be going with her, you know. I don't like the idea of her being alone in London. Alone? You said you were going to arrange for it to stay with your old cook, Martha. Yes, I know, but all the same... Then stop worrying about it, then. Perhaps I'm being selfish, but... I don't like London. And anyway, I couldn't afford to keep up the cottage and live in London as well. Damn it, the, there's no question of your giving up the cottage, is there? Of course you must live in it. I'm not so sure. Oh, money is such a worry. Cyril needs money for books and clothes, and Anna will have to be provided for while she's at dancing school. My income is not that large. I may as well tell you I am thinking of letting Gull Cottage. What? Oh, only in the summer, of course, to paying guests. What? Strangers in my house? Never. I'll haunt them. You dare go bankrupt. Why can't your sister-in-law, Eva, help? I'd sooner die than ask her. Then you must make some money. But how? I'm no good at dressmaking or anything like that. Write a book. Oh, don't be absurd. I couldn't. But I can. Bless my soul. A bestseller. I'll dictate it, and you will write it down. Buy a typewriter and some paper first thing tomorrow. But what will it be about? Me. It shall be the story of my life. I shall call it Blood and Swash. We'll start tomorrow. <laughs> At that moment, I chanced to look up, and there, bearing down upon us, was the biggest wave that I have ever seen. Coolly and calmly, I turned to the mate and said, Suddenly, I found myself all alone. My officers had all taken shelter behind the wheelhouse. Riding up to the drunken cook, I shouted, Give me that axe, Forster, you bloody swine! And at the same time, I gripped hold of a large piece of... Smiling seductively, the young woman, and the beautiful young woman, came slowly towards me. Then suddenly... She undid the fastenings of her flimsy robe, revealing as she did so... Stop! I can't put things like that down. 
Anyway, I don't believe they ever happened. And I will not write the Marseille bit. That we will leave out. We will not. We will. Then I won't go on. This is my story, damn it. I see no need for it. Well, I do. This book is going to be a true record and will show the black side as well as the white. I don't believe such things happen. Well, they do happen and far worse. And they'll happen again to other young fellows in foreign ports unless they are war. Well, if you'd read something in a book, would that have stopped you going to this... Uh, uh... Brothel! Don't mince words. I might at least have been on my guard. I wouldn't have thought I was being asked home to tea by a nice French girl. Was that what you really thought? Well, um, yes. It was my first voyage, and I, I was only 16, and I'd spent all my life in a country village being brought up by a maiden aunt. Now, now where was I? Now, let me see. Ah, yes. Then suddenly, she undid the fastening of her flimsy robe. My dear mother, what are you doing at this time of night? You woke me up. Why, do you believe you're writing a book? Uh, yes, I, I am, as a matter of fact. My dear little mother, whatever for? May I see? Uh, no, I, I, I mean, it's not finished yet. And I'm doing it to make some money. Now, go back to bed or you'll catch cold. It's quite warm in here. And very comfortable. Dear little mother, working away so hard to make some money for me. And for Anna. Oh, of course, and for Anna. But, uh, mother, you mustn't count too much on getting this book published. I mean, so many women are writing books nowadays. Not like this book. You know, I've often thought of writing a book myself. Perhaps we could uh, collaborate. I could supply the masculine element in your story. There is quite enough masculine element in it as it is, thank you. I believe you're writing for Peg's own paper or something like that. <laughs> Not exactly. I say, Mother, this is a most comfortable chair. Could I have it in my room? It just suits me. Could I have it, Mother? Certainly not, damn you. Oh, keep quiet. Don't you dare say another word. But it was only a suggestion. I'm sorry. I didn't realise that you were so fond of the chair. Anyway, I don't think I quite deserve to be shouted at like that. I'm sorry. But if you don't want me here, I shall go. Good night. And you know, you should get to bed as well. Don't overdo it. It's not worth it. And if you get sick, who will look after me? I won't get sick. Good night, dear. Good night, dear mother. He didn't hear you. Cyril didn't hear you. No. I'm sorry I broke my word, but he's not a child any longer. And he aggravated me. Take my chair, indeed. But he didn't hear you, and he's going to be a clergyman, looking into other people's souls. At the moment, he's thinking rather more of his own body, seeing it in purple in a bishop's mitre. He is very young and very ignorant. But he's quite right about one thing. You must go to bed. Otherwise, this damn book will never get finished. This is the place. See there on the wall, Tackett and Sprawl Publishers. In you go. But shouldn't I have written for an interview? No, just walk in. A surprise attack is often the best. I'll get the office boy out of the way. You just walk right in. Oh, dear. The things you make me do. Come in. Ah, do sit down, Miss Gordon. Uh, our readers quite like silver threads, but I'm not so uh, sure... I am not Miss Gordon, Mr. Spool. Not Miss Gordon? Uh, no, I'm sorry. Well, then, who, not who are Gordon. you? I've bought a manuscript. Oh, dear, so many people bring me manuscripts. How did you get in, anyway? The boy was... Uh, the boy was um, called away, I believe, so I just walked in. You always just walk into places? No, but I wanted you to look at my manuscript. <laughs> Your first book, I suppose, and you simply had to write it. Yes. All about love, I suppose? Oh, no, it's not. Oh, dear. 
Perhaps I've made a mistake I should never have uh, Oh, do sit down. There's no need to look so nervous. I shan't eat you, and I suppose that since you're here, I may as well have a look at your book. Oh, but uh, to tell you the truth, it was a friend. Ah, a friend wrote the book. Yes. I see. Well, now, let me have a look. Uh, hmm. Yes. I see. <laughs> oh, I say. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Oh, well, really. <laughs> Excuse me, sir. Paul, we haven't any lunch today. Lunch? Lunch? Why, what's the time? Two o'clock, sir. Two o'clock? It can't be. It is. What? Are you still here? Of course. Well, sir. Uh, no, 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 no lunch. All right, sir. Of course. I, I'm sorry. I will, madam. This is remarkable. A most remarkable book. I must say, at first, I thought you were just being temperamental and that you'd really written it yourself. But, of course, you couldn't have. It's a man's book. And what a man! Where's he now? I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm sorry. I forgot you were here. But I really became quite absorbed in your book. Uh, which uh, doesn't mean, by the way, that we shall publish it. Uh, but... Uh, I should like to meet the author. I'm afraid that he wishes to remain anonymous. Nonsense. I'm sorry, but you can't meet him. He's... Uh... I see. I'm sorry. You have my deepest sympathy. Oh, but you don't understand. And I'm afraid I can't explain. Oh, then, of course, I mustn't ask any more questions. Well, now, in the uh, event of our publishing, with whom shall I communicate? Oh, couldn't I just come and see you? It would be difficult to make out cheques, uh, always supposing there were any cheques, to Mrs X. Couldn't you just pay me in notes? Uh, it would be highly irregular. Come, come, dear lady, you can trust me, you know. Your name uh, will be unknown to everyone but me, and your secret will be perfectly safe. I shall have to think it over. I'll come back in a week's time and let you know. He spoke as if he knew I had a secret. Did you hear him? I did. Oh, Lucy, you are so very young for all your years. What do you mean? Well, he obviously thought I was human and your lover. Oh, how could he? I'll never go back there, never. How disgusting. An old woman like me. Old woman be damned. I'll never speak to him again. Oh, yes, you will. Perhaps he won't publish the book anyway. Oh, he'll publish it all right, and it'll be a bestseller. You mark my words. <laughs> I have to acknowledge it. <laughs> you were right once again. A bestseller indeed. I told you so. First edition sold out. We're a success, Lucy, my dear. Oh, how well everything has worked out, thanks to you. Anna, a dancer at Sadler's Wells. Cyril through Theological College and engaged to the bishop's daughter. I told you that girl had designs. So you did. <laughs> and you know I'm rather looking forward to the wedding. I enjoy weddings. I don't. But I suppose I'd better go. Don't you dare. You try and stop me. And besides, I want to hear what all those clergymen think of my book. You don't suppose they've read it, do you? You'd be surprised, my dear. You'd be surprised. A terrible book. A truly terrible book. What book is that, Bishop? Uh, um, blood and Swash, Miss Muir. I really cannot imagine how any decent firm could bring themselves to publish it. I thought it rather good. Hmm? There are some wonderful descriptions in it, and the moral outlook seemed to me to be rather sound. Pagan, I should have called it. Oh, definitely, Cyril. I couldn't agree with you more. Celia, I had no idea that you had read this dreadful book. Who wrote it? Does anyone know? The author prefers to remain anonymous, and I'm not surprised. The book should be withdrawn from publication. In fact, I have written to the Times suggesting that it is. Yeah, I should have thought that a sure way to increase its sales. Hmm. I'm glad to see that at least one of our number has not read this book. Mrs Muir, I notice, has ventured no criticism. Uh, her mother never reads anything but home chats, though she did start to write a book once herself. What became of your great work, Mother? Don't tease your mother, Cyril, dear. Haven't we all tried to put ourselves on paper? Yes, yes, they say every man has one book in him. I wrote mine when I was ten. 
Black Ben's Booty, it was called. <laughs> <laughs> I must say, I should rather like to meet the author of Blood and Swash. As a matter of fact, a friend of mine has it on the best authority that the author is a cripple. He lives in Soho and has never been to sea in his life. I think I'm going to faint. Oh. How dared you? How dared you? I thought you promised not to come. But damn it, Lucy, calling me a cripple who's never been to sea. It was all too much. It was too much to bear after all that other bunk. And if you'd seen them all battening onto the less savoury bits of that Marseille chapter in their own rooms, oh, all but the bishop who hasn't read the book at all, blasted hypocrites. Will you please go away? I don't trust you and I don't like you. In fact, I dislike you very much indeed, behaving like a whirlwind. <laughs> I wish you could have seen all their faces. I haven't had such a good laugh for years. And the butler... He spilled port all down his shirt front. <laughs> but I'm, I'm, I'm sorry I, I put you to all the trouble of pretending to faint. Well, I had to do something. I was so embarrassed. All the same, it was a bit hard on poor Cyril having to lug you all the way up here. He was puffing like a grampus. Did I ever tell you of the weightlifter I once had as a passenger? I've heard all I want to hear about your past, thank you. And if you don't go away, I shall leave all the proceeds of the book and Gull Cottage to decayed gentlewomen. Damn it, I believe you would. All right, I'll go. I'll go. Mother, may we come in? Yes, please do. How are you feeling? Yeah, oh, I'm all right, thank you. But don't you think you'd better see a doctor? Cyril tells me he's never known you faint before. You gave us quite a fright. The bishop thinks it was an earth tremor. He's writing the Times about it. If you really are feeling better, may we have a little talk with you? Yes, of course, Celia. Now, please understand, we only want to do what's best for everyone. And we're going to put Gull Cottage in the hands of an agent right away. What? Cyril and I have made a little plan. We think it would be best if you were to come and live with us at Wichester. In the old home that Father built for us? <laughs> yes, it's been such a secret. Daddy heard that a curate was needed at St. Swithin's, you know, on the hill above your old home. And he asked me what I should like for a wedding present. On the day Cyril was appointed to St. Swithin's, we found that the house was for sale, and Daddy bought it for me. And now you are coming to live with us. Oh, but Cyril won't be a curate at St. Swithin's forever. I should say not. <laughs> but it will be lovely to feel that we have a settled home to come back to. With you in it. <laughs> Always ready to take the children whenever we have a, a little jaunt abroad. I see. Well, it's very sweet of you, dears, but it won't do. Young people should have a home of their own. But it will be our home. It's kind of you, but no. But we want you to come. I like Gull Cottage, and I shall stay there. Mummy? Mummy, where are you? In here, dear. In my room. Why, you lazy thing, lying in bed on a lovely morning like this. <laughs> I'm a little tired after the wedding. Oh, yes. I want to hear all about the wedding. I'll bet Celia looked like a dream in satin. And Cyril looked like an old crow. Thank goodness they didn't ask me. And what's all this about them wanting you to go and live with them? Oh, so you've heard about that? Yes, but you can't live with them. Besides, if you live with anyone, you'll live with Bill and me. Bill? Yes, Bill. His real name's Evelyn Peregrine Anthony Scaife. So we call him Bill. And the ghastly thing is, he's a baronet. Why ghastly? Oh, I don't want to be a lady. Oh, Mummy, if only you knew what a failure I feel. I see. You mean that Bill has asked you to marry him and settle down, and you feel it's a feeble end to your career as a dancer. Oh, Mummy, I knew you'd understand. But look here, you simply must come and live with us. No, darling, but I'm very glad for you and so thankful that you're going to settle down. But I have my own cottage, and I mean to live in it till the end of my days. With Captain Greg? What? Oh, I know all about him. The girls at school told me about his haunting this house and asked me if I ever saw him. And I used to invent stories and say I did. You never told me. Well, no, I didn't want to frighten you. And when I was 11... I fell in love with his picture and used to pretend that he talked to me. Pretend? Yes. You remember that night when you went to meet that man 
Anna. Oh, Mummy, I didn't spy on you. But you were so different that spring. And anyway, I was picking bluebells in the wood one day and saw him kiss you. And I went home at once and prayed that you wouldn't marry him. And then that night, when you went to him, I came into your bedroom and I felt Captain Greg was very near and telling me not to worry. <laughs> and I always thought Cyril the secretive one. Did you uh, ever hear Captain Greg's voice? <laughs> Good Lord, no. But I did feel he was my friend. Oh, I do so wish you weren't quite so alone, Mummy. I shall be quite all right. <gasps> well, then I have another idea. Old Martha wants to come and be my cook when I marry. But Bill has a cook married to his butler. Well, wouldn't it be far better if Martha came and cooked for you, and then I shouldn't worry about you? I think that's a very good idea. I really do. Thank you. You never told me how Anna felt about you. I don't tell you everything, Lucy. It wouldn't be fair. And she knew about Miles? Yes, she cried herself to sleep many nights over him. Why didn't you tell me? I thought I'd done enough interfering. <laughs> What's so funny? I just realised Cyril has gone off on his honeymoon on the proceeds of blood and swash. <laughs> so he has. <laughs> I should love to tell Anna about it. She'd laugh so. Please yourself, but if you do, you'll soon become headline news. Yes, you're probably right. In any case, I doubt whether she'd believe me. Still, it is funny. <laughs> Poor pompous Cyril. <laughs> <laughs> there you are, Mum. I've tidied up a bit for you. How do you feel today, my dear? Oh, I'm all right. I was thinking I might get up for a while later on. You do no such thing. After what the doctor said... Stay in bed and lots of rest, he said. Oh, Martha, don't fuss. That's what I'm here for, to fuss, to look after you. That's just what I'm going to do. Now, don't you go frowning. Still, I must say, life is funny. Who'd ever have thought that I'd end up living here after all, looking after you? Still, it's a nice little house. I always did say so. Yes, you did. All those years ago. It's funny how time flies. Still feel young, you know, Mum. <laughs> still don't know what I'll be when I grow up. <laughs> and to think, the children with kids of their own, Miss Anna a lady, and her husband in Parliament, and young Master Cyril a canon. They've done well, and no mistake. A credit to you. That's what oh, they are. Do stop chattering, Martha. Oh, uh, you sure you're all right? You didn't have much lunch. Let me get you a glass of milk. Oh, do go away. How can I rest if you keep interrupting me? Well, just a drop of milk, Go Mom. away. Now, don't get in a state, I'm not Mom. in a state. I just want to be left alone. Stop bossing me, for goodness sake. Sorry. I never intended bossing. Call her back. Call her back at once. Oh, no, not you as well. I won't. She's such an interfering old thing. All her back. You can't leave her oh, like that. Great bully. Oh, very well. Martha! Martha! Yes, ma'am? I'm sorry I was cross. I'm not too well. I'm very sorry. Ah, <laughs> oh, there, there. I understand. Uh, perhaps I'd better send for the doctor. No, no, don't bother. Martha... Thank you for everything. Now, don't you start a thank you in, please, Mum. I can't abide it. You just get some rest, and later on I'll bring you up some milk. Yes, Martha. I'm so tired. Of course, of course you are, Mum. You just rest. So, so tired. So tired. And now, Lucy, you will never be tired again. No, I never shall. How wonderful. But who's that lying in the bed? That little old lady. Who is she? Look again, my dear. But I don't feel like that. Old and tired and frail. It was only your earthly covering for which you've no more use. And now, my dear, we are together, as we were always meant to be. Yes. Come on, Lucy. 
follow me. I feel so strange and so happy. So happy. In The Ghost and Mrs. Muir by R.A. Dick, dramatised to radio by Barry Campbell, the part of Mrs. Muir was played by Gemma Jones and Captain Gregg by Brian Pringle. Miles Blaine by Philip Bond, Martha, Diana Bishop, Eva, Eva Stewart. Anna, Emily Richard, Cyril, Peter Settelen, Celia, Madeleine Kem, the Bishop, Alan Dudley. Mr. Spruill, Sean Arnold, and Mr. Coombe, Stephen Thorne. The producer was Jane Graham. Brian Pringle is now appearing in Billy at the Drury Lane Theatre, London. A brief look at tomorrow's weather. In most places it will be very mild again. Over Scotland, Northern Ireland and Northern England there will be showers. Wales and England except the north will be rather cloudy and there might be more general rain. After Big Ben, the news read by Brian Hudson. BBC Radio News at 10 o'clock. A bomb went off in Harrods store in London late this afternoon while thousands of people were doing their Christmas shopping, but no one was hurt. In Northern Ireland, an army observation post at Cross Maglen was under fire for an hour. The QE2 is strike-bound. The crew walked off just before the liner was due to take a 1,000 people on a cruise. Another group of hospital consultants is threatening industrial action in the new year.